This is Audible. Surviving the Evacuation, Book Six, Harvest, written by Frank Tell, narrated by Fiona Hardingham. Chapter One, Prelude, Suitcases, London, twenty-third of February. Derry, Corporal Derry, is that you? Derry looked up and saw a vaguely familiar man wearing a uniform as familiar as her own. Thompson, she asked, and the memory came back. That thing in the Sahara, eighteen months ago, right? And you made it to corporal too. Because of it, I think. Almost made it to sergeant. Then this happened. Thompson waved a hand, not at the other uniforms in the conference room of a hotel to the north of Whitehall, but as if to take in the chaos outside. Zombies. Can you believe it? He asked. Almost, Derry said. Did you hear the rumor that it was a terrorist attack? No, Thompson said. Where did you hear that? Yesterday I was on duty at a supermarket. I heard it from the color sergeant in charge of the detail. He got it from a major who used to work intelligence. He's a solid source. Right, Thompson said, clearly weighing up how reliable that made the information. What kind of terrorists? Fundamentalists sounded more like someone who wants to destroy the world just to prove they can," she said. "Oh," Thompson mulled that over and shrugged. "What does it matter, right? It's not like we're the ones going to track them down." He waved the piece of paper in his hand. "I'm off to an inland farm. What about you?" "The same," Derry said. She looked down at her own orders, somewhere near Dover, going by the postcode. Shame," Thompson said. "Mine's in Hampshire. It'll make a nice change from guarding supermarkets and petrol stations against looters." She gave her head a rueful shake. "A stint in the countryside will be like a holiday." "Sounds like you got the short straw. I've just come from the British Museum, and you won't guess why." "They," but he was cut short by a parade ground bark. "Attention!" Derry's feet snapped together as her eyes snapped to the door. A colonel had walked in. At least the man wore the uniform of a colonel. When she'd last seen him, eighteen months before, and on the same mission in which she'd met Corporal Thompson, he'd been dressed as a civilian and claimed to be the same. Behind him came a woman she recognized instantly, Jennifer Masterton, an opposition MP who'd been appointed Minister for the Interior in the Emergency Cabinet. Thank you, Colonel," Masterton said. "At ease, everyone, please. We don't have time for those formalities. For that reason, I'll keep this brief. Colonel Cannock has recommended all of you." She turned her nod at the man wearing the uniform of a colonel. He says that he has worked with you in the past, and that you are diligent, trustworthy, and loyal. Those are the qualities we need in these dangerous times. We face the very real possibility of the extinction of our country, our civilization, and indeed our species. To prevent this, we are establishing a series of fortified farms, redoubts, if you will, to ensure the nation does not starve now that the global food chain has collapsed. You must protect the farmers and train them to protect themselves. It should be obvious to everyone that there will be no more imports of oil. We will be relying on manpower and. Derry tuned out what Masterton was saying. Despite saying she'd keep it brief, the politician was using a lot of words to say what the soldier already knew. She was to prevent the farmers and the increasingly large number of workers from stealing any of the food they grew. Walls would be built to keep the zombies out, and it was Derry's responsibility to ensure any they saw were killed. It sounded like an easy billet. Certainly easier than acting as an executioner in the city. There are hard times ahead, Masterton said, drawing her speech to a close. But with hard work, we will have a future. Thank you. It was a weak ending to an odd speech, Derry thought, as the minister left the room. It was almost as if Masterton had wanted to remind the military that the politicians were still in charge.
Perhaps she had, or perhaps she wanted to remind these soldiers who were about to go out to farms, where the population would soon rise from dozens to hundreds, if not thousands, that she was one of those politicians in charge. That's it, Canuck drawled. You're dismissed. When are you going to Kent? Thompson asked. Because I'm not leaving until tomorrow morning. In an hour, Derry said. Well, there's a pub I know of near here. It's closed, of course, but the landlord will open up for us. Yeah, OK. I can spare time for a drink, Derry said. There's an exit round the back of the hotel. This way. They joined the group filing out of the door, but turned right when everyone else turned left. You find the ballroom, Thompson said. Then you take a left. How do you know? she asked. I asked the girl on the reception desk, Thompson said. I had a feeling this was going to be my last chance to get a decent pint for a long while. And what are they going to? He stopped talking because ahead they could hear voices. I'm surprised you didn't want to see her, a man said. Derry recognised it as that of the fake colonel, Canuck. I see enough of her as it is. Why was she here? Another man asked. Derry recognised that second voice, though she'd only previously heard it on the news. It was Sir Michael Quigley. To give a pep talk to the troops going to those farms you designated for the backup plan, Canuck said. Good God, why? Quigley asked. Who knows? I did offer to deal with her, but you insist... Yes, yes, she's my problem, not yours. Speaking of your problems, those contacts of yours... I forget the woman's name, the one your friend works for. You've made arrangements for them? It's all in hand, sir. And you've no difficulty with that? Quigley asked. It's not personal, sir. Just business, Canuck said. Always was. Good, good. The voices came through the open double doors of a ballroom. Opposite was a small meeting room. Derry pointed, and the two soldiers ducked inside. From the ballroom came the sound of footsteps, a chair being pulled from a stack, and then the rustling of paper. It's getting late, Canuck said. We need to get back to the facility. Not when there's a chance I'll meet Masterton on the way out, Quigley said. She's not meant to know I'm in the capital. Look, wouldn't it be easier if Canuck... Quigley said, a warning edge to his voice. I think you sometimes forget to whom you are speaking. Sir, better. There was a pause, then a dull knocking sound, as if knuckles were being wrapped against a hard surface. They look like suitcases, I suppose. Travelling cases for a musician, perhaps. That's as good as camouflage here in the hotel. And they're safe, are they? Canuck asked. What do you mean by safe? Quigley replied. Those cases, are they reinforced? I mean, if there was an explosion. Under those circumstances, Quigley interrupted, their contents would be the least of our problems. Just in case, Canuck said. Wouldn't it be best to have them moved? Where to? Lenham Hill? Caulfield Hall? Or do you want to move them to the fortress? If London gets a direct hit, it won't be the sole target. No, these will be of no use to us if we don't have a civilization to protect. We'll leave them here, but we should have more than one sentry on duty. When he comes back with my coffee, we'll go and see about doubling the guard. Derry met Thompson's gaze. He understood. They didn't want to be caught eavesdropping when the guard returned. She pointed outside and back along the corridor. They left the room, moving quietly, but as casually as they could, until they reached the junction. Then they sped up, both trying to get away from the politician, the fake colonel, and whatever was in the ballroom. They found themselves in the service side of the hotel, and after a few wrong turns at an emergency exit, the fresh air felt wonderful. "'You heard what he said?' Thompson asked. "'They're expecting London to get a direct hit.' "'Not just London.' Derry said. Having walled farms scattered across the countryside makes a lot more sense now. Yeah, but who'd attack us? Thompson asked. I don't know, Derry said. 
But where's this pub? I could really do with that drink. Chapter 2 Prologue The Crown Jewels The Story So Far 17th of September It's too heavy, Jay said. It's not, Chester grunted, as he raised the massive gold coronation mace of King George III above his head, staggered as he realised Jay was correct, then swore as an undead hand clawed through the air an inch from his nose. He brought the mace slamming down onto the zombie's ruined face. There was the now familiar crunch of bone, but it was accompanied by the brittle snap of breaking metal. Chester dropped the mace onto the twice-dead corpse. I told you it'd be too heavy, Jay yelled as he ducked under the second zombie's outflung arm, swinging the crowbar at its legs. Yeah, Chester said, throwing a quick glance towards Nilda's teenage son. The boy was stabbing the sharpened end of the crowbar at the creature's face. Chester decided Jay was in no more immediate danger than any of the fifty people who'd found sanctuary in the Tower of London seven months after the outbreak. Well, I had to try, he added. Designed for processions, not as a weapon, the mace was one of half a dozen that were part of the Crown Jewels exhibit. And it's not like we have any use for gold. He pulled the replica from his belt. This weapon was also a mace, though it had no history. It was a two-foot-long, two-inch-thick, machined rod of oak, topped with an eight-inch octagon of spiked metal. It had come from an exhibit demonstrating the weight of weaponry used during the Norman Conquest. Chester sized up the third and last of the zombies that had appeared on the path since the water collection crew had taken the lifeboat out onto the river. Great fissures had been torn in the desiccated skin around the zombies' eyes. Now filled with dirt, they gave the creature a mottled, almost camouflaged look. He punched the mace forward, but the zombie ducked and the metal smashed into its mouth rather than its forehead. Chips of brown teeth flew out as the unbalanced creature kept flailing its arms. The motion sent it toppling backwards, and its head hit the embankment wall with a resounding crack. Its arms went loose as it fell to the ground. Not seen that happen before, Chester murmured. Just to be certain, he swung the mace up and savagely down. He looked around, confirming that only three of the living dead had somehow managed to get onto the pathway that separated the Tower of London's outer wall from the River Thames. To the east, a path that was wider than most roads ended in a giant set of gates underneath Tower Bridge. To the west was a cafe and souvenir shop, with the gaps between blocked by iron railings and a wide, ornate gate. "'Can you see how they got in?' he asked. Jay shook his head. It was less than forty-eight hours since Chester and Nilda had arrived at the tower to find forty people inside, refugees from a small rooftop community based around an old radio station near Oxford Street. It was less than twenty-four since the two of them had rescued Jay, Tuck, and the others from the roof of the British Museum. Any hope Chester had of taking a day off had vanished the evening before when Hannah, the group's de facto leader by virtue of having outlived the others, had conducted a meeting that had laid out the harsh truth of the work ahead. "'You knew Hannah before, right?' Jay asked. "'Not really,' Chester said. "'I first met her the day after the evacuation. "'Well, so did McKinnery. "'She and I were walking through London, heading towards Westminster, "'when we heard the sound of the pigs coming from Hannah's city farm. "'Although, I will admit,' I thought they were cows. Really? Jay asked, amused. I'm a townie, Chester said defensively. I'm used to seeing animals sliced up, cooked, and on my plate. Anyway, McKinnery and I joined up with Hannah, Mathis, Dev, and the others that were there. A few days after that, we all heard the radio broadcast. There weren't many places it could be coming from, so we went looking and found it was being transmitted from Kirkman House. We moved there and took the animals with us. I left soon after they started building the walkways across the rooftops. I thought Hannah, McKinnery, and all the rest were dead. Otherwise I'd have come back to London long before now. Or would he? 
He wasn't sure. Instead of helping people get to Anglesey, Jay asked. If you'd done that, you wouldn't have rescued Mum. That wasn't me. That was a group going up to Svalbard to see if a NATO fuel dump was still there. They picked her up on the way back to Anglesey. I just happened to be on the island when she arrived. I was looking forward to a hot shower, a warm bed and a cold drink. Probably not in that order. He still was, but they wouldn't be found in the Tower of London. Our formal introduction came when she was trying to rip apart that guy who told her that you and Tuck were dead. Rob, wasn't it? Him. Yeah, Jay growled. She should have killed him. She did try, Chester said. But killing a person isn't like finishing off one of the undead. It isn't something to undertake lightly. It's... He stopped, remembering to whom he was talking. Look, did your mum tell you about me? About my past, I mean? She said you were a crook, and that you and McKinnery ran a gang. Kind of. I know McKinnery's odd, Jay said, and Tuck doesn't like her, but she helped keep everyone safe in Kirkman House. That's what I told Mum. If she did, then it was for her own reasons. She was, well, I say she was an underworld boss, but that'd make you think of the kind of movies where the bad guy was always the hero. It wasn't like that. We stole. We robbed. And yes, he'd killed. But Jay didn't need to know about that. We ruin lives, that's the truth of it. For me, it was the family profession. My father was an old school thief, and not a very good one. He spent as much time inside as he did out. Maybe because of that, when I was growing up, I spent most of my time with this other kid, Canuck. Now, he was the very definition of evil. I suppose it's no surprise he ended up working for Quigley. The Prime Minister, you mean? Jay asked. The man might have called himself that at the end, but he never earned that position. He was responsible for the outbreak as much as anyone was, and he played his part in the chaos that came after. And the vaccine? That was his idea. It was, Chester said. But Quigley's dead. So is Cannock. But it was Cannock and Chester's association with him that had led to him and McKinnery working, albeit unknowingly, for Quigley. Call it luck, chance, fate, or divine intervention, there was a thread connecting Chester with all that had happened. He knew it, and felt it tugging at him even now. And in Wales, after you met Mum, you went back to Penrith? Jay asked. To your old house, Chester said. We found a note you left that said you were heading to London. So why did you go to Hull? I mean, why didn't you just come straight here? Because I had a satellite image of Hull, Chester said, and on it I saw there was a beached cruise ship with a lifeboat still hanging from the sides. He gestured towards the boat out on the river. I figured it'd be quicker to get here by sea than by land. It took us five days. How long did it take you and Tuck? Nearly two months, Jay said. There you are then, Chester said, though it wasn't the whole truth behind why they had gone to Hull. The mayor of Anglesey had asked him to investigate whether the wind turbine factory in the city was still intact. It wasn't. Chester decided that his version of the story sounded better. And they've got electricity on Anglesey, Jay asked. From a nuclear power station, probably the last one left on the planet. But that's not much use when your principal industry is fishing. Hence that trip up to Svalbard, in search of oil, and how they ended up picking up your mother. Nah, he added, looking around. I don't think those zombies got in down this end. According to Hannah, Jay said, there are always more of them around in the morning. That makes sense, Chester said. Except, Jay said, when you think about it, that doesn't make sense at all. I mean, zombies don't care if it's night or day, right? So why are they a problem in the mornings? Why not at sunset or midnight? That would be more logical. It would? Chester asked. Yeah. Well, they can see, right? And hear things. I mean, not well, but they do use their ears and eyes. So? So at night there's nothing to see, Jay said. They'd be like us, stumbling around. So one zombie bangs into something, the others hear it and head towards the sound. 
and because these ones can't see either, then they'd knock things over too. I think you've just explained how they ended up here. No, see, you're not listening, Jay said. I'm saying there should be more of them. Well, Jester said, trying to follow the logic and finding he couldn't. Just be grateful there are only three. He looked beyond Tower Bridge to the ruined hotel the government had destroyed to form the eastern part of a barricade that stretched all the way to Buckingham Palace. No, they didn't get onto the path down this end. The breach must be near the souvenir shop. He pointed west and found his gaze drawn to the plumes of smoke rising up from inside the tower's wall. It can't have looked like this for fifty years. Maybe a hundred, but for centuries before that, cooking fires would have been normal. I never knew that anyone lived here, Jay said. Did you? You mean the warders and their families? Yeah, I came here once. That was a long time ago, mind you. I tagged on to a tour. Fogarty says there were a hundred and forty of them living here when the outbreak began in February, but they were all gone when he arrived, Jay said. Fogarty had been a warder before his retirement over a decade before and was the only living soul they'd found in the tower. I suppose they were all evacuated along with nearly everyone else in London, Jay added. Evacuated, Chester muttered. Immune, infected, vaccine. So many words whose meanings have changed from what they were a year ago. Do you know how many? Jay asked. I'm sorry? Chester hadn't realised he'd spoken out loud. How many people did the government give that poison to? The one they said was a vaccine. Back on Anglesey, they reckoned it was about ten million. I think that was just a guess, Chester said. And how many people died because of the nuclear bombs? When you add up Cornwall, the Isle of Wight, a lot of the Midlands, most of Scotland, well, it's impossible to know. How do you distinguish between the ones killed in the blast, the others killed by the radiation, and the rest torn apart by the undead, after what they'd been told was a safe enclave had been destroyed? We can only be thankful that not all the bombs fell, and that at least this part of the world is still livable. Yeah, thankful. Right. But what I'm wondering is, how many zombies there are in Britain? Oh, I see. Chester said. Twenty million? Thirty? Forty? When you've got numbers like that, precision doesn't matter. We're never going to kill them all, so we've got to find a way to outlast them. At least we're safe here, and we've got the river, so we don't have to worry about water, Jay said. Well, yes and no. It's tidal, isn't it? So you've got to wait until the water's coming from inland. Of course, salt's the least of our problems. The river's full of the chemical runoff from the wrecked boats and ruined buildings, the ash from all the fires, and then there's the undead tumbling over the broken bridges. No, it's got to be filtered, boiled, desalinated and distilled. Even then you don't know how safe it is until after you've drunk it. Which is why we should test it on the chickens, Jay said. No, Hannah's right. They're too valuable as a food source, Chester said. He looked over at the lifeboat. Their hope was that if they gathered water from the middle, faster flowing part of the river, it might require less purification. And though we've got water, we've got to search for the firewood to boil it up. You spend all your time looking for one thing, and when you find it you realise you've run out of another. They're waving, he raised a hand in a lazy salute. The soldier, Tuck, waved back. It was her idea to come here, wasn't it? Chester asked. That's right, because of the water. But she's not from London. No, Jay said. She had a friend here, a major. I think she served with him. You know, in the army? Oh, right. Chester squinted at the figure in the boat. I think she's signalling to us. Nah, she's signing. She's saying they need another ten minutes. That'll give us time to find out how those zombies got in. Tell me, was it easy to learn sign language? Chester asked. Tuck, or Lucy Tucker, as she was now never called, was a soldier, though deaf and functionally mute as the result of an IED on some distant battlefield long before the outbreak. It's not that difficult to learn, and there wasn't much else to do, Jay said. It wasn't like we could leave. 
The zombies kept marching through the streets. Don't know where they were going, but it went on for ages. She tried teaching everyone back at Kirkman House, but no one picked up more than a few words, except for Mrs. McKinnery. But she knew how to sign before, you know. Lucky, Chester murmured. What? Jaya asked again, and again Chester realised he'd been speaking aloud. I was thinking that you were lucky. To have Tuck with you, I mean, Chester said. And the two of you rescued Stuart, right? Yeah, from down near Kew Gardens back in July. He'd been shot. Don't know who by. Whoever it was, they must be dead by now. He's obsessed with food. I think he's terrified it'll run out. I don't know, I suppose we're all a bit weird now, you know? Yeah, I do. But there's something about him, something almost familiar. It's almost as if I... Chester laughed. I was going to say I thought I'd read about him, but I don't think he's famous, is he? Don't think so, Jay said. He doesn't really talk about his past, just sort of mutters about stuff. Mostly about a girl. I think she died. But he's okay. Reliable, you know? And people like him. Well, most of them do. Graham doesn't. But I think that's because Stuart took over the cooking from him. He's not the greatest of cooks, Chester said. True, but he's way better than Graham. Then he must have been terrible. There, Chester pointed. You see it? That's how the undead are getting in. To the west of the tower, next to the river, was a small cafe, a souvenir shop and a large gate. The gate was firmly closed. The door to the shop, however, was ajar. Through the gap, Chester could see the door on the far side of the shop was wide open. You stay here and listen, Chester said. I've done this before, Chester, Jay said. I told you, me and Tuck spent two months travelling down from Cumbria. And it wasn't just zombies we had to face. There were soldiers too, and... And I'll need room to swing, so I can't have you right behind me, Chester interrupted. But I also need someone to watch my back. It's called teamwork, kid. The time for bravado disappeared about the same time as the hospitals were shut down. Stay. Listen. Shout if you hear anything. Without giving Jay any more time to protest, Chester went inside. He wasn't being strictly honest with the boy, but that he was still a boy was the very reason why. He breathed in through his nose. Yes, there it was, that damp, musty smell. It might be the river or the lingering odour of those three undead they'd just killed. Chester didn't think so. He trusted his gut most of his life, and on balance it had seen him right more often than it had run him wrong. Something fell over to his left. It was in the next aisle, moving, but not moving fast. He darted around the display of overpriced notepaper, punching the mace out. He hit nothing. That dry, rasping wheeze grew louder and it was coming from near the ground. Chester jumped back as a clawed hand swiped at where his feet had been. He swung the mace down, the creature's skull cracked open, a foul-smelling slime oozed out. Someone made an effort to reinforce the windows, but they must have forgotten about the door, Chester said after checking the rest of the building was clear. Now give me a hand. We can block it with these display racks. This will work for now, Jay said as they improvised a hasty barricade. But we'll need something better. And we should get all this paper out of here. And those T-shirts over there. And don't forget those shelves, Chester added. They'll burn nicely. They will, Jay grinned. Did you ever think you'd be doing anything like this? You mean living in the Tower of London, fighting off the undead? No, I can't say I did. That's not... I mean... I was meant to be thinking about university. That's what Sebastian said. He was always trying to get me to think about the future. Mum as well, I suppose. Sebastian, he was your mum's boyfriend? Chester asked, casually. Jay laughed. No, he was our neighbour. I mean, I don't think he was. Well, I don't know. But he was the one who gave mum that sword. Or gave it to me. And Rob took it back in Penrith. That's how mum knew I was alive. When she saw the man, and saw the sword, yeah? Chester sighed. But there's no point dwelling on the past, not here. You know these people. Who do you think you can rely on to do a proper job of clearing this shop out? You mean without having someone stand over them? Reese, Kevin, and Aisha. Zhao, I suppose. Avon, Greta. 
Maybe Finnegan, but I don't know. He probably would, but not with a smile. We don't need people happy, just working, Chester said. Yeah, but he's tight with McKinnery. Is he? That's interesting. She's got her supporters, has she? Yeah, I guess. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, Hannah's the one in charge. As long as McKinnery allowed her to be, Chester thought. We best get back down to the lifeboat, he said. The tide will be turning soon, and we'll have to set off in search of that Geiger counter. They went back down to the wide cobbled roadway that ran between the tower's outer wall and the river. Chester started hauling on the winch. It and the ropes had come from a display of torture equipment. They slowly wound the boat back towards the shore until it was close enough for Reese to throw them a rope. Chester grabbed it and tied it off. He took a step back, stretched, then walked over to the gold mace that had been part of the crown jewels collection. He picked it up. The top was dented, and the small cross above a miniature crown had broken off, exposing, Here! Look at this! he called out. What? Jay asked. It's not gold. It's not? Look! Chester pointed. It's just lead, covered in gold paint. Of course it's not, Fogarty said, as Reese helped the old soldier off the boat and up the slick stone steps. You think they'd leave all that gold on view, where anyone could steal it? And the diamonds on the crowns? Jay asked. All paste. Everything on display was a fake. That, of course, Fogarty added with a sly grin, is an official state secret. We were assured that the real ones were kept in a vault in Windsor Castle. Personally, I reckon they sold them off. Oh, Jay said, disappointed. Jay, Chester! Jay turned at the sound of his mother's voice coming from the castle gate. I thought I said we'd meet you on the walls, Nilda said, and there was no question in her tone. The zombies broke in through the souvenir shop, Jay said. We had to get rid of them so the boat could come back. Well, I can see that, Nilda said, looking down at the bodies. Why didn't you get help? We were the help, Jay said. When the boat went out to collect the water, we were on gate duty. Look, Mum, there were only a couple of them. And I kept an eye on him, Jester said. He wasn't in any danger. He would have been in less if he'd stayed inside, Nilda snapped. Jay opened his mouth to protest. You're right, it's my fault. I'm sorry, Chester said, and in an attempt to divert Nilda's ire, quickly added, We'll need to get a proper barrier up in that shop and empty it out at the same time. There were some T-shirts, notepads, that kind of thing, and they're only rot if we leave them there. We can use the cement they had stockpiled for the renovation works, Fogarty suggested. Once we get this lot inside, I'll sort out a group. You'll give us a hand, won't you, Reese? Of course. The younger man answered, though he still looked exhausted from hauling the water onto the boat. And you, soldier? Fogarty asked Tuck, who was helping Stuart and Reese load the water canisters filled with their dark, brackish and thoroughly unpalatable river water onto the cart. You'll give us a hand, with a shop. She's coming with us, Nilda said. We're taking the lifeboat down to the city airport, for the Geiger counter. Oh, yes. Fogarty's face tinged with the obvious embarrassment of an old man's forgetfulness. Yes, you said, didn't you? It's all right. We'll handle this, Reese said with a tone that suggested he knew he'd be the one doing the heavy lifting. We'll take the water inside and get some of the others to help. Graham was talking about going out to look for more firewood anyway. You want me to come with you to the airport? Stuart asked. Don't you have enough work to do in the kitchens? Nilda asked. And isn't that where you're meant to be right now? Oh, yeah, I suppose, Stuart said. I just figured they'd need a hand with... I'll make sure Stuart goes back to the kitchens, Reese cut in. Nilda nodded, her rage finally mollified. Thank you, she said. And is Mrs. McKinnery going with you to the airport? Stuart asked. Nilda turned around. McKinnery was walking through the open door. I said we'd use the drone so she could see what London Bridge was like, Nilda said. That's my drone, Jay said. Dev, Stuart and Tuck got it for me, for my birthday. You should have asked. Tuck's hands moved as she signed. Jay smiled. What did she say? Nilda asked. She says we need to get better at communicating, Jay said. 
She was being ironic. Chapter 3 Part 1 Life in London 17th of September Keep it steady, McKinnery said. It's my drone, Jay muttered. I'll fly it how I like. Nilda smiled. It was good to be back with her son. She felt whole again, not as if a veil had been lifted, but as if there was a thin tear through which she could discern the hint of a future. He'd grown in the months they'd been apart, and not just physically. That self-assured confidence his father had possessed radiated from him. Most of the time. Sometimes, like now, there were flashes of the boy lurking under the newly matured surface. You can see the bridge, Mac, Chester said. He pointed at the screen. And I reckon that's the deepest gap. Look at that surf. It can't be more than a couple of inches of water. There's no way you can get the lifeboat through. Fogarty, Reese, and Stuart had pushed the cart with its cargo of newly collected water back into the tower, and the gate was once again sealed. Jay sat on the embankment wall with the computer they used to pilot the drone on his lap. The copter itself hovered half a mile to the west over the ruins of London Bridge. Clustered behind him, McKinnery, Nilda, Tuck and Chester stared at the screen, which showed an image of the wrecked bridge in far more detail than they could see with the naked eye. Yes, yes, fine, McKinnery said. I agree, we can't get the lifeboat through. Nilda relaxed. But, McKinnery went on, I think we can get a boat through. Didn't that old warder say he went up river? He did, Chester said, but that was at high tide and at the beginning of the outbreak. Look at all that wreckage. Jay, can you bring it back out a bit? Now, turn it left about thirty degrees. No, your other left. There, see? There's metal and bits of boats and plastic and... And I don't know what that is. It's an advertising hoarding. Nilda said, for one of the airlines. They had the same poster at the supermarket in Penrith. I had to look at that woman's smiling face on my way into work for six months. You can't believe how genuinely happy I was when I saw them putting up a new poster at the beginning of a shift. And you can only imagine how thoroughly depressed I was when, on my way home, I saw they'd just replaced the faded one with a newer copy. People in Penrith must really have liked flying to Canada, she sighed. But Chester's right... That thing of Fogarty's is more like a collection of holes in a wooden frame than a boat. It's more likely to sink than float, but by all means, try it if you want. Nelda immediately regretted her words, not out of fear for who McKinnery used to be, but because the other woman was the type to take a comment like that as a challenge. There's the other bridges to think about, too, Jay said, trying to play peacemaker amidst the sudden tense silence. They might be worse than this. I wonder why they did it. Was it deliberate? He looked to his mother for an answer. Nilda shrugged and turned to Chester. I've no idea, he said. I'm not even sure who they were. Russians, Chinese. He could have been Quigley. I suppose it doesn't matter, Jay said as he circled the drone around the debris and then flew it up until it was hovering twenty metres above the bridge. Most of the middle section had been demolished. All that remained connecting the north and south banks was a narrow strip of concrete, on which, with its front wheels teetering over the edge of the broken roadway, was a lorry. Jay flew the drone towards it. "'What do you think's in the back of that lorry?' McKinnery asked. Following the soft purr of the drone's rotors, a small pack of the undead rammed into the vehicle. It moved forward a fraction of an inch, and the rear wheels lifted from the roadbed. The lorry seesawed back and forth. Nilda held her breath, expecting it to topple, and so add its bulk to the flotsam and half-sunk wreckage around the bridge. It didn't. It fell back onto its rear wheels, and though the undead knocked and pushed into it as they stretched their pouring hands up to the copter overhead, the lorry didn't fall. Whatever it is, Chester said, it must be heavy. Maybe it's something valuable, Jay said. More valuable than the crown jewels? Chester asked. I mean, properly valuable? Like canned food or candles? Yeah, maybe, Chester agreed. But I've seen that movie. If you try to empty the contents, the vehicle's centre of gravity shifts, and people and cargo all fall down into the river. 
Whatever's inside, we're never going to know. And since we can't get this boat past the bridge, Nilda added, can we agree that we're not going to get to Westminster today? She kept her eyes fixed on the screen as she asked the question. McKinnery was the only person who really wanted to make that particular trip. Everyone else was curious as to what they might find there, but curiosity alone wasn't enough reason to risk the journey. McKinnery had vocally dangled the prospect that when the last of the government forces had been overrun, the weapons and ammunition they'd brought with them would have been left behind. Almost as an afterthought, she'd suggested that there would be other supplies as well. And there might be, Nilda thought. The Tower of London had weapons. Plenty of them, axes, maces and morning stars, hellbirds, bills, partisans and spears, hangers, sabres and giant great swords that not even Chester could lift. Not to mention muskets, rifles and diamond-encrusted submachine guns presented by dictators deposed long before the outbreak. Fogarty had explained that the more modern weapons had all been deactivated. After the bejeweled handguns and gold-plated rifles had been admired, Tuck had pointed out that the only ammunition in the tower were the few rounds for Chester's revolver. He'd flatly stated that he wasn't going to hand those over to anyone, that an echoing shot would summon the undead from a mile around was a secondary problem that they'd not even discussed. Nilda didn't think McKinnery really wanted guns and ammo. She was just using those two obvious and understandable items as a way of gaining public support for her plan. Why she did want to go to Westminster, Nilda couldn't work out. According to Tuck, McKinnery had changed since they'd arrived with news of the community on Anglesey. According to Chester, she seemed exactly as he'd known her of old, obsessed with the pursuit of power, though not with the prize. We would probably find a Geiger counter there, McKinnery said, clearly not having given up. But where exactly? Nilda asked. We're running against the clock. In a few weeks, we'll have eaten the food we have, and any that's in the fields or on the trees will have begun to rot. We can't afford any wasted days. There's Anglesey, McKinnery said. You said they had more grain than they could possibly eat. But you'd be asking them for supplies for fifty people for a year, Chester said. Fuel was a problem when we left. They may decide that it's more economical to evacuate. He stopped as Nilda tutted. Sorry, Chester said. That was a bad choice of word. They may decide to ship everyone from here to the island. Besides, if they were right and the radiation was spreading, I'd rather not start a trek through England and Wales if everything north of Dartford is radioactive. Won't he be able to tell? Jay asked, and Nilda noticed that his hands moved as he spoke, and he was looking at Tuck for an answer. Nilda quelled an unfair swell of jealousy as the soldier signed the reply. It wasn't Tuck's fault. She truly had kept Jay safe over the past months. Even so, it was hard to suppress bitterness at how her son had grown up beyond all expectations under the tutelage of someone else. She says, Jay summarised, that the fields won't be glowing in the dark, so we won't know until it's too late. Which is why we need the Geiger counter, Nilda said. What we need, McKinry said, is a smaller boat. If we had one, I could lead a group to search Westminster while you take the lifeboat down to Kent. Are you sure that all the small boats were removed from HMS Belfast? Nilda's eyes moved to the old World War II museum ship, moored on the other side of the Thames. You can take a look at the recording again if you want, Jay said. But we couldn't see one, just the undead. I counted seven, and who knows how many more are below decks. What we really need is food, and for that we need to go to Kent. That means we need a Geiger counter, and that means going to City Airport. We need time, Tuck signed. There's too much to do and too few people to do it. Right, well, Chester said after Jay had finished translating. Call it need or want, but whichever it is, there's a little point sitting around here. We can't get to Westminster, but we can get to the airport. So I say we go there now, while the tide is in our favour. Agreed? Nilda took one last look at the screen showing the undead clustered around the lorry on the bridge. One at the edge of the pack waved its arms, 
and the motion caused it to stumble out into the roadway. It tripped, fell through the broken balustrade, and tumbled headfirst onto a jagged outcrop of half-submerged concrete. Skin split, skull broke, and the stone was tinged dark brown for a moment, before a wave washed away both creature and stain. Nilda made a mental note to remind everyone why they spent so much time boiling and filtering the water. Look at the battery, Nilda said, pointing at a small window near the top of the screen. It's running low. You better bring it back. Jay tapped at the controls. As the drone slowly rotated, the screen displayed a panorama of South London. There was the Shard, and seven miles to the south, the Crystal Palace transmitter sitting on top of Sydenham Hill. That was replaced with empty streets and ruined buildings, then with the Thames, and then Tower Bridge and the Tower of London itself. The image of the ancient fortress grew as Jay piloted the drone back towards them. If we could get a boat close enough, McHenry said, we could survey Westminster with the drone. If. But we still need that smaller boat, Chester said. Indeed. And a solution to that problem will not be found at an airport. You won't need my help for that trip, but helping to secure that gift shop is a task for which I know I can be of use. I can see Graham on the ramparts. Excuse me. Nilda kept quiet as McHenry left the boat and headed over to the walls. And there's nothing stopping us from leaving, Chester said. Nilda followed him down the steps to the lifeboat. Do you think Mrs. McHenry might try to get to Westminster on foot? Jay asked. As with drone in one hand, laptop in the other, he nimbly jumped from the wall down onto the rocking boat. Maybe, Nilda said. We can't stop her if she does. Tuck untied the ropes, and the lifeboat drifted out into the river. She's right about the boats, Chester said. If there's going to be a long-term plan to use the river to get supplies, then we need a craft we can row. Are we clear on all sides? Right, I'm going to turn the engine on for a bit. What about the diesel? Jay asked. We don't want to waste it. What else are we going to use it for? He replied. There's not enough to get us to Anglesey by boat, and more than enough to get us there by land. The engine began to thrum. Chester tilted his head to one side. Is there a problem? Jay asked. Doesn't sound quite right. Ah, it doesn't matter. Ladies and gentlemen, please settle in for Chester Carson's river tour of apocalyptic London. Next stop... City Airport. Nilda watched the river. It was better than looking at the skyline, now missing so many familiar landmarks and full of so many more unfamiliar ones. When they'd left London, Jay had been a toddler, and she'd been young and foolish enough to think a world of possibilities still lay at her feet. Her memories of that thriving city had been of noise. Though humanity had now all but disappeared, that had barely changed. Under the early autumn sun, metal creaked, soil cracked, and bricks and glass fell from burned-out buildings. Leaves mingled with the detritus discarded during the evacuation, blown by gentle winds into great drifts around broken walls and abandoned vehicles. The river itself offered a cacophonous symphony of wood and plastic, cloth and flesh, thrown by each swell against the embankment wall. But when the lifeboat's small engine sputtered to life, it seemed loud enough to echo all the way to France and beyond. And what if the airport has been destroyed? Jay asked. I came down this way about, oh, it must have been about five days after New York, Chester said. And aircraft were still landing. Tuck caught Jay's attention and began signing. She says that after the island was cut off, planes were still coming in, Jay said. They were carrying ambassadors and staff from overseas, soldiers and foreign leaders, and anyone else who was lucky enough to catch the flight. Then a plane came in from the United States. A colonel was flying it. His family were on board. So were troops from his regiment and their families. But some of the people were infected. When the plane landed, they killed everyone. They used... Jay paused, and there was an animated, silent back and forth between him and the soldier chemical weapons. Tuck doesn't know where the government got them. Britain wasn't meant to have any. After that, they tried to shoot down all approaching aircraft, but they couldn't get them all. Why not? Nilda asked. 
Because a fighter plane only has so many missiles, Tuck signed. How do you know this? Nilda asked. I heard about it while I was still in the Enclave, Tuck signed. Actually, it was part of the reason I left. There was a conversation between the deputy director of MI5 and an assistant to the air chief marshal. Not that they'd been in those posts a week before. They didn't mind talking around a deaf girl. They thought that because I couldn't hear, I couldn't understand. And what were you doing besides spying on them? Chester asked. I was trying to find out where in the world might be safer than Britain, Tuck signed. Some other island, or, she shrugged, anywhere that the people in charge in the morning were the same as the ones running the place the evening before. I could tell it was all going to fall apart. And it did. Gloom descended with Jay's translation of those last few words, but he broke it with a question of his own. You said the planes crashed, but they didn't try to move them. City Airport's built on a pontoon out into the middle of an old dock, Chester said. It's surrounded by water. There's nowhere to move them. Right. Yes, Jay said, impatient. So the planes will still be there? Yes, why? Chester asked. Because I think McKinnery's right, Jay said. If we're going to make the tower work, we need small boats, lots of them. And I think we'll find those boats at the airport. Well, Chester mused. I suppose there might be one or two left in the marina that surrounded the runway, but I doubt it. There's story everywhere, and not just in the UK, but for all those people who made it to Anglesey. They all said that anything that could float was taken out to sea regardless of whether the engines worked or anyone on board knew how to furl a sail. I'd say our best bet for finding a ship would be in the Maritime Museum at Greenwich. I think they had a couple of whaling boats there, wooden, of course, and a bit bigger than this craft, with a single sail and which could be rowed by a crew of four. Or was it six? Actually, thinking about it, I'm not sure that was in Greenwich. Nah, Jay said with a grin. We don't want a museum relic that will dissolve if it comes in contact with water. We want something modern, something that won't rip or tear, and which doesn't need diesel. We'll find it at the airport. How can you be so sure? Nilda asked. There was a movie where a plane crashed onto the water and the passengers all... Life rafts, Nilda exclaimed. Cruise ships have lifeboats. Planes have life rafts. If the airport is full of crashed planes, then it's also full of rafts. We've just got to pull them out. That's actually a good idea, Chester said. For going up and down the river, they'll be cumbersome. But for getting over the jagged masonry around the bridges, they'll be perfect. That material's got to be rip-proof. It is? Nilda asked. Well, I'm only guessing. Tuck says it is, Jay cut in. And there might be food too, you know. Peanuts and stuff. That's what you think, is it? Chester asked the soldier. No, it's what I think, Jay said. But it's worth looking. What's that? Jay asked, pointing ahead of the boat. The Thames Barrier, Chester said wearily. He'd started out as a cheerful tour guide but Jay had been interrogating him incessantly as they travelled down the river. The man's tone was now one of resigned exasperation. Tuck met Nilda's eyes, nodded at Jay, and rolled her own. Nilda took that to mean the soldier was grateful that Jay's barrage of questions was finally being directed at someone else. OK, so what is it? Jay asked. It was designed to stop London from flooding. But the barrier's down, so the city... Or parts of it will flood, Chester said. You mean, like the tower? I doubt it. They started building that fortress nearly a thousand years ago, so I think it's safe enough. But London used to be full of rivers, little tributaries that all fed the Thames. Those rivers became canals or sewers. The land around and above them became houses and offices. The river will find a new course, basements will flood, buildings will collapse, and roads will be washed away. Soon, each time we come along the river, the skyline will be changed. The airport's over there, on your left, he added. Where? I can't see it, Jay said. No, there's a housing estate between us and it. And what's that? Jay asked. Nilda had to smile. What? Chester asked. Those chimneys? Jay pointed. The Tate and Lyle Sugar Factory, Chester said. They made sugar? Really? Curiosity was now replaced by excitement. Shouldn't we check it out? 
They didn't make sugar, they refined it, Nilda said. Without the boats coming in, there'll be no canes to process. Any that was stored there would have been used up during the rationing. Look at those tower blocks near the factory. Think of all the people who live there, and then remember how hungry you were before the evacuation and after. They'll have broken in or stormed the place en masse, taking anything that was left. And lit the walls clean for good measure, Chester added. But it's right there. Surely it's worth looking, Jay said. Sugar might make life sweeter, but you can't live on it, Nilda said. We have to keep focused. The Geiger counter first, and then the farms in Kent. How do we get into the airport? It's a single runway, built out onto water that forms a sort of marina, Chester said. Not like the ones near the tower. There were too many security concerns to let boats come and go as they liked. Access to the marina was through a lock that we'll get to in about five minutes, and I'm pretty sure that it was open when we passed it on our way down from Hull. It was. Chester had to turn the engine on to pilot the small boat through the narrow channel that led to the airport. When he switched it off, there was a brief moment of quiet, suddenly interrupted by a banging clatter from above as the undead clawed at the high-sided metal barriers of the road bridge under which they passed. Nilda scanned the key to either side, but there were no other zombies in sight. Nevertheless, as they puttered away from the lock and bridge, and the sound slowly faded, she thought it an inauspicious start to their quest. "'And that's the airport,' Chester whispered, though the comment was unnecessary. They could all see the planes, dozens parked, others crashed with wings jutting straight up, almost like plaintive hands reaching to the sky. But their collective attention was on a tail wing sticking out of the water at the runway's end. That's a 747, Tuck signed. It was a short runway, Chester said. They'd fly to Europe and not much further. I suppose that plane was out of fuel and had nowhere else to go. The terminal's over there. He pointed down the long stretch of water at the cluster of large warehouse-like buildings at the far western end of the cluttered runway. How close can you get the boat? Nilda asked. You want to risk turning the engines on? Chester replied. Look at how many planes there are. Fifty? A hundred? If they all came in carrying the undead, and if those zombies are still there, I'd rather know before we climb up. Chester turned the engine on and steered a course parallel to the runway. When he pulled the boat up against a steep set of stairs next to a series of pontoons floating lazily in the water, no undead had appeared. "'You know what a Geiger counter looks like?' Jay asked Chester as Tuck tied the boat to one of the pontoons. "'Yep,' Chester said. "'Good,' Jay said. "'Then Tuck and I will sort out the rafts. You go and find one.' "'I think one of us should stay on the boat,' Nilda said with unsubtle subtext. "'There's no room for passengers now, Mum.' You wouldn't be a passenger, she said. You'd be making sure we had a safe way out. Nowhere safe, not until we make it that way, Jay replied. And two teams are quicker than one, and quicker is safer. Then you should come with me, Nilda insisted. Chester, do you know sign language? Jay asked. You know that I don't, he said. Then it's settled. Tuck and I are a team. We've done this before. We'll be fine. Nilda was again reminded how much her son had changed, but as much as she hated it, she knew he was right. Fine. Chester and I will go and find the Geiger counter. You get the rafts. We'll be back here in, I don't know, an hour? Right. And your signal if you get into trouble? Jay asked. If we get into trouble, Chester said, patting his pocket, you'll hear the shots. Wanting to skip forward to the point where she and her son were once more on the relative safety of the boat, Nilda climbed up onto the runway. She was stunned by what she saw. For five hundred metres to the east, the runway jutted out into the water. A hundred metres to the west, the site widened and spread, with windowed warehouse-like buildings ringing the landing strip in a U-shape of unequal height and depth. Going by the position of the train station on the maps she'd pored over back at the fortress, the passenger side of the airport was in the southeastern corner. On every available patch of tarmac between her and those buildings were planes. They were a mix of single engine, twin props and jets, and all were parked wing tip to window. She recognized a few of the paint schemes as those of commercial carriers, 
a few more as being obviously privately owned, but most were burned and broken beyond recognition. There was a narrow path down the centre of the runway. At first, Nilda thought that it had been deliberately left clear, but as she took another step forward, she realised that it was the result of the 747's failed landing. Though there was still enough clearance for one of the small winged planes to set down, the runway was so littered with charred debris that any attempt would end in a crash. Her foot kicked against something. It skidded across a tarmac with a jangling tinkle of metal. Looking down, she saw a twisted seat buckle still attached to a few inches of singed belt. The sound brought her back to where and when she was. She looked and listened, but there was no sign of the undead. Nor could she hear their ominous, shuffling wheeze. Stay safe, she said, turning to Jay. And stay close to the boat, she nodded to Chester. And the two of them set off at a jog towards the terminal. Rafts Which plane shall we start with? Jay asked. Tuck looked around, taking in the wreckage. Not all planes had rafts, she signed. Okay, Jay said. So, which ones did? Tuck shrugged and pointed at a twin-engine jet with a set of steps pushed up to the open door. That one. The stairs will save us the climb. Their presence also meant that the passengers had exited the aircraft. Tug didn't want to enter one of those planes and find it full of the dead, or worse, the undead. Not now, not today. She was tired, and in a way she hadn't felt in months, not since she and Jay had first arrived at Kirkman House. Then it had been the shock of finding a group of survivors and discovering that civilization had been reduced to a handful of people using ramshackle rooftop walkways to scavenge from the remains of a dead city. There had been a euphoric moment when they were rescued from the British Museum, compounded by seeing it was Nilda who'd rescued them. That had turned to near ecstatic joy with the discovery that there were ten thousand people alive and thriving around a nuclear power plant in Wales. That had been the high point from which she'd come crashing down when she'd realised that the fifty of them in the Tower of London were probably the second largest community left on the planet. Anglesey and London, the last bastions of humanity, and each week their numbers shrank, the struggle for survival grew harder, and the only end to it that she could see was death. She glanced at Jay, forced a smile, and planted a weary foot on the plane's steps. She froze. Something was wrong. Slowly, she turned around. It wasn't just exhaustion, not this time. She'd had this feeling before, though in a very different city, facing a very different threat. It was a sense that despite everything appearing deserted, they were surrounded. Again, she looked at Jay. He saw her expression and knew without being told that danger was close. He twisted his head left and right, listening, then tilted it to one side, squinting in a way that reminded her of a cat looking at a mouse that wouldn't run away. Not zombies, he signed. She was about to berate him for being imprecise when, out of the corner of her eye, she caught a flash of movement through one of the cabin windows. Most of the shades had been pulled down, but three near the dirt-encrusted wing were half open. There. She saw it again, something green, but moving too fast to identify any more detail than that. She grabbed Jay's arm and pulled him behind her. He stumbled down the steps as she raised her axe. Before she could signal to him to back away, a small bird with bright green plumage shot out of the open door. Then there was another, and a third, and then, all at once, a great mass of flapping wings as a green wave exploded out of the plain and up into the sky. She ducked the movement involuntary and unnecessary. The birds came nowhere near them. A smile crept slowly across her scarred face. The tension that had been plaguing her dissipated as the flock, perhaps a hundred strong, flew up to circle the aircraft above them. Are they parrots? Jay asked. Tuck had no idea. Probably, she signed. Did they come on the plane? He asked. She shook her head. I don't know, and it doesn't matter. But there's a lesson here, she pointed at the white and black stained wing. We were so busy looking for the undead, we didn't see what was immediately in front of us. Guano. I'm so busy looking at it now, 
that we don't realise what's not in there, Jay said. No zombies. And now there are no birds. Come on. He pushed past her and ducked into the cabin. She followed. As soon as she stepped inside, her nose tried to shut down as it was assaulted by a foul stench. She gritted her teeth and turned on her flashlight. It, like most of the torches the group used, was a wind-up LED model, originally part of a window display at an electrical shop near Farringdon. It wasn't bright, but it added texture to a cabin otherwise only illuminated through the open door and a few half-closed window shades. There was a tug at her arm. Where's the raft? Jay signed. Even in the gloom, his expression was clear. The reason for it, obvious. She grinned. Don't like the smell, she signed. It's pretty, he began, but couldn't find the word. Acrid, she signed. He just shrugged. Try underneath those seats there. There were two rafts, both untouched since their last safety inspection. Where do they keep the peanuts? Jay asked as they dropped the second raft onto the tarmac. Tuck glanced at the birds. Most were still circling overhead, but a few had come to land on the wing and fuselage. They were as good as a guard dog when it came to the undead. She pointed Jay towards the rear of the plane, while she headed to the cockpit. The cabinet marked with that familiar red cross was empty, but she wasn't looking for a first aid kit. As she had looked about the plane, an idea had come to her. It was only half-formed, and the obstacles to it actually working were so great that she almost dismissed it as one of those idle fantasies that came whenever she saw a piece of old-world technology. She bent over the captain's seat, then the co-pilot's, and then examined the control panel and the floor, finding nothing but a couple of shreds of paper. The rest, along with any other clue as to the plane's point of departure, had become building material for the birds that had turned the aircraft into a communal nest. She returned to the main cabin, turning her eyes briefly to the seat backs, then up to the empty overhead compartments. No peanuts, Jay signed, coming to join her. Bird's got everything. What are you looking for? I wanted to know where the plane came from, she signed, so I could work out how far it had flown. Why? he asked, as she led him back out of the plane and down to the tarmac. Because... No, it was a stupid idea. She signed, and picked up one end of the awkwardly shaped orange and red oblong. Jay grabbed the other side of the uninflated raft, and together they carried it back towards the boat. Tell me, he said, when they dropped it next to the stairs. Do you know what aviation fuel is? She signed, as they went to collect the second of the two rafts. By the time they'd carried it over to join the first by the runway's edge, he'd worked it out. You wanted to know how far it had flown— so you'd know whether there was any fuel left, he asked. Sort of, she signed, and looked around for another plane. The birds landing on the broken propeller of the nearest was a good indication that there were no undead inside, but the six small windows suggested that it wouldn't carry anything larger than a life vest. She pointed towards a large jet, a little further down the runway. Why... Jay exclaimed. Do you mean that if you found a plane with fuel, we could fly it? To Anglesey? Not unless your mum bought you flying lessons last year. You mean you don't know how to fly? He asked, and looked genuinely disappointed at the revelation. I was army, not RAF. So why do you want to know if there was any fuel? Because you can use aviation fuel in a diesel engine. You can't just pour it in. We'd need a lubricant. She saw his expression and decided to cut the explanation short. We'd need to prepare it, but we could use it in a boat. Why not just check the fuel tank? He asked. And how do you do that? She signed and pointed at the nearest plane. I don't think it's as easy as sticking in a piece of wire. Oh, but wouldn't it have evaporated by now? Probably. That's why I said it was a stupid idea she signed, and then climbed up onto the wing. Her problem was that she saw the planes as what they had been, a near magical way for people to travel thousands of miles. In their new, harsh reality, they were nothing more than scrap metal. She turned the handle and opened the door. A corpse fell out on top of her. She tripped, stumbling backwards onto the wing, trying to push it off. Except it wasn't a corpse. Its arms clawed, catching in her clothes. 
Its mouth snapped down, and as she tried to shove it away, she lost her uncertain footing, rolled off the wing, and down onto the tarmac. She kicked and punched at the thrashing creature until she was on top, pinning its arms as Jay's crowbar slammed down through its eye. She pulled herself to her feet, pushed Jay back from the plane, and looked at the open door. There was nothing there. She climbed up and checked inside. It was empty. Like I said, she signed, it was a stupid idea. A dangerous distraction. All that we had is now lost, and we have to stop thinking we can have it again. Inside the plane, they found the rafts, untouched, and a passport sticking out of a seat-back pocket. Tuck flicked to the photograph. It might have belonged to the zombie, but it might not. She handed it to Jay. Egypt, he read. Is that where the plane came from? Tuck shrugged. There was no ticket with the passport. She checked the compartment above that seat, then the one next to it, then those opposite. They were all empty. I think, she signed, that he must have been a passenger on the plane. Everyone else left, but he stayed here. Perhaps because he thought it was safer. But that's a guess. After all this time, it doesn't really matter. Mum would say that it does, Jay said. That's why she writes down the names of the undead. Someone might be looking for him. And if they are, and if they find us, then what shall we tell them? That he made it to London, but no further than the airport, and seven months later we killed him on the runway? And that zombie might not be this man. He might have got on the plane before it took off. All we could ever give anyone is more questions that could never be answered. There would be no comfort in that. Maybe, Jay said unconvinced. They went back outside and took the rafts over to the boat. That's four. How many more do we need? Jay asked. As many as we can get, Tuck signed. We could look for fuel instead, he suggested. She smiled, recognising his attempt to soothe her sombre mood. Where? she signed. I can't see any storage tanks. They'll be far away from the runway, probably on the other side of the terminal. If they were above ground... Then, like you said, the contents would have evaporated. But if they hadn't, or if it was stored below ground and we found it, so what? We don't have any way of transporting it. Yeah, but that's not really a problem, Jay said. Not compared to the other stuff we've done. Maybe not. But collecting it would take time. We'd have to go back to the tower, then back here, and back again. We'd lose three days, maybe a week, and at the end of it, what would we have? Like Chester said, we've enough fuel to get the boat down to Kent, and enough for a car to drive to Wales. What do we need more for? Yeah. I suppose. Jay looked as disappointed as she felt. There was something depressing about being surrounded by planes that would never fly again. Nor would people, she thought. Even with fuel and a pilot, they would never take off because there was nowhere left to land. She looked down at the rafts. They would help, of course, but the very point of them was that they didn't require fuel. They represented another step away from civilization. One day they would rip or tear, and then they'd have to try to make new boats out of wood. She wondered how far back they would have to go before they started moving forward, and how many generations it would take after that before people returned to the air. Let's try that plane over there, she signed. Maybe we'll find some peanuts. The prospect appeared to cheer him up no more than it did her. Chapter 4 Terminal Despite telling herself not to, Nilda couldn't resist looking back at her son walking towards one of the planes, his hands moving in animated conversation with the soldier. She told herself to focus and turned her attention to the looming cluster of buildings ahead. A Geiger counter, she said. Would those be kept with customs or with the maintenance crews? I'd say with the police and security people, Chester said. But we might be able to avoid going into the main terminal. The fire engines that they sent to major incidents all had radiological detection equipment on board. And if a plane crash isn't a major incident, I don't know what is. A fire engine? How do you know that? He just threw her a sideways look. Seriously? she asked. You stole fire engines. Only the one. And it wasn't me who actually drove it off. 
I reckon they'd be kept in one of those warehouses. The doors are about the right height. They'd reached the point where the long ribbon of runway joined the far wider land on which the terminal and other buildings had been constructed. The nearest one had a pair of retractable gates. Both were closed, but next to the nearest was a door. Chester tried the handle. It's locked, he said. He pulled out a long hunting knife and was about to leave her at the lock when Nilda put a warning hand on his arm and a cautioning finger to her lips. Listen, she mouthed. It was soft, almost inaudible, but a dry, almost rhythmic rustling came from inside. Zombies, Chester mouthed. Nilda gave an uncertain shrug and moved over to the wide, retractable gate. Cautiously, she leaned forward, pressing her ear against the cool metal. There was an explosion of sound. She jumped back, drawing her sword in one fluid movement, but the sound hadn't come from inside the building. An irregular green streak poured out of a crashed jet. Out of all the possible explanations, her brain started with the worst. Cycling from smoke to chlorine gas before it reset, and she realised that she was looking at a flock of birds. Are they parrots? Nah, parakeets, Chester muttered. They were a common sight over the last few years. Really? she asked. In London? They were taking over from the pigeons, he said. I always reckoned they'd become the dominant. There was a clattering bang from inside the warehouse. In the shock of such an unexpected sight, they'd spoken at an incautious volume. There was no mistaking the rustling of cloth, nor the dry scrape of brittle nails down metal, one at a time, then growing in number and frequency until it was the only sound they could hear. Nilda gripped her sword more tightly as she took a step back, then another. She was sure that the gate would fall, but it didn't. Will it hold? she asked. I was about to ask you that, Chester replied. But I think so. Then we go on. She didn't want to. She wanted to return to the boat and sail away from this forsaken island, but that was fear speaking. If they left now, they would have to look for the Geiger counter somewhere else. She remembered the faces of those she'd buried on the Isle of Scarra, and could too easily picture Jay suffering the same fate. No, they had to go on. There was no one to do the job for them, and nowhere to go if they failed. Do you know where Customs is? she asked. No. You've not been here before? Just to collect people. I'm more an airstrip kind of guy. Planes coming in under the radar, she guessed. Did you even own a passport? I did, he paused. She could tell what was coming. Lots, he finished. Most of what Nilda knew about City Airport had been learned in the last hour. What she knew about airports in general didn't add up to much more. She'd only flown twice, once to Dublin, once to Frankfurt. Both were last-minute city breaks, and both were with Jay's father before their son was born. On those trips, she'd had no interest in the airport, the flight, the sights, or anything else but him. The little she did know had come from television, and those programmes came filtered through a producer whose sole job was to make humdrum tedium seem more action-packed than the biggest Hollywood blockbuster. There was one episode, she remembered, where they'd run a Geiger counter over a plane's worth of luggage— there had been no threat warning or any other reason to do it that she could see, except to add the illusion of action to an otherwise unwatchable half-hour. That one. It's got to be baggage handling, and that'll lead us to customs, she said, angling towards the nearest of the buildings. There was a set of double-width doors reinforced with a metal kick plate at the bottom. She took out the LED flashlight she'd brought from the collection at the tower and pushed at the door. It swung open. No, she didn't know much about airports, but she was certain all the doors should be kept locked. It wasn't baggage handling. The light flickered and died. She pressed the button. Nothing happened. She shook it and swore in frustration. Chester's torch came on, and she saw they were in a long corridor with irregularly spaced doorways on both sides. He pushed past her. The double doors closed, and other than his truncated beam of light, they were in darkness. The nearest door on the right-hand side of the corridor had a transparent window. Nilda stepped closer. It was a control room with a bank of screens, a stack of clipboards, and there wasn't enough light to discern anything more.
Point the light, she began, and stopped, suddenly aware of how loud her voice was in such a confined, silent place. She jabbed a finger at the window. Chester shone the light inside. She saw a lantern standing on one of the desks. The door's handle squeaked as she turned it. The sound grated against already frayed nerves. Automatically, she looked about, sword raised, expecting to see the undead, but the corridor was empty except for a fading white dot imprinted on her retina by Chester's torch. Abandoning subtlety, she wrenched the door open. Trying to see by the occasional flashes of light as Chester moved back and forth, she eased forward, hand outstretched. She found the lantern, grabbed it, found the switch, pressed it. Nothing happened. That's about right, she muttered. When Chester turned and the room was again bathed in light, she waved him inside. With the dim and wavering aid of his torch, she inspected the lantern. It was a cheap model, the sort designed to be kept in a car and used in case of a breakdown on some unlit stretch of road. When she checked the batteries, she found one had leaked. It's not what you'd use on a runway, she whispered. It's not powerful enough. You wouldn't even use it inside. This plastic is too cheap. Chester turned away, and she was thrust into darkness once more. Here, look at this, he said before she could swear. Affixed to the wall was a cabinet. On it were two maps, one showing an escape route in case there was a fire on the runway, the other if the terminal building itself was ablaze. The rooms were clearly marked. Judging by the labels, the area they were in was used by the plane's cleaning crews. Chester pointed at a spot on the map. See that? he asked. Holding cells. How much do you want to bet that customs is nearby? That's where we'll go, Nilda said. Down the corridor, right at the end, then straight on. Third door on the right. She repeated the directions to herself and then ran them backwards so she'd know how to get out in the pitch dark. They left the room and followed the corridor, Chester on the left, she on the right. After twenty paces, she stuck a hand out to stop him. She'd heard something. There was no way that the undead could be in that warehouse by the runway and not inside the terminal itself. No one was that lucky. But the sound didn't come again. They continued down to the junction and turned right. This corridor was narrower, and the left-hand wall was lined with suitcases. As they walked past them, Nilda saw the occasional tail of cloth protruding from between the seal. The cases had been searched, then hastily repacked and moved out of the way. That made sense. What didn't was why anyone would have been searching them in the first place. Clothing and other personal items could be found behind the windows on any high street, there for the taking by anyone with half a brick and enough wits to know how to throw it. That the cases had been searched suggested that people had stayed in the airport, living there long after the undead had taken to the streets outside. Why? It was obvious. They had flown in from all over the world in the hope they would find safety here. When they'd seen it was no different to wherever they'd come from, what reason did they have to go any further? Obvious and depressing. She raised a hand, pointing to the right. One more door and they should reach the holding cells. But those people would have left when they got hungry, right? She told herself that surely they would. But if so, then they hadn't made it to the walkways above Oxford Street, let alone to Anglesey. Did that mean they were still here? They reached the door. It was reinforced. Access was via a keycard and number pad system. Nilda mouthed a silent thank you as she pushed at the door and the long, defunct electrical locks clicked open. Chester stepped through first, mace in one hand, torch in the other, turning quickly as he swept the room. By the flashes of illumination, Nilda saw it wasn't actually a cell, though she should have guessed that, but an office. Along the rear wall was a row of blank screens. In the middle were two desks, back to back, and, and Chester had moved off towards the left, and the rest of the room was plunged into darkness. She stepped inside. He'd opened a metal cupboard. Inside was a row of lamps. He took one out. The light came on, and it was brighter than his rechargeable LED. She took it and instantly relaxed as she felt control over darkness once more. A slow sweep of the room confirmed it was an office, and other than the lamps had little of interest except a second door leading, she guessed, to... There was a hand on her shoulder. She spun around. It was only Chester. 
He was pointing at the door to the metal cupboard. On it were printed instructions. She stepped closer. It was a long list of the procedures to take in the event of almost all imaginable emergencies. Zombies, she noted, were not mentioned, but third from the top was, in the case of a radiological event, and next to it was an instruction to look for supplies in Locker C1.3. Well, what does that mean? she hissed. His response was one of those shrugs she found increasingly frustrating. She gave the room a quick but more thorough examination. Wherever that locker was, it was somewhere else. Her light fell on the room's other door. Chester turned the handle. Lamp in one hand, sword in the other, she stepped through. It was another narrow corridor. There were three doors to the right, each with a small window at head height. There was a sudden banging from the closest door. Nilda spun, raising both sword and lamp. The pounding kept on, but the door didn't move. She shone the light inside, knowing what she would see. It was a cell. In it, a zombie smacked its fists against the reinforced viewing window. Up and down, up and down. The hardened glass didn't break. It didn't even fracture. But with each blow it left a brown-red smear that was slowly obscuring the view. Ready? she asked her hand going to the recessed handle. There's no point, Chester said. I'm not leaving it in there, she said as she twisted the handle and pulled. The door stayed closed. That's what I meant, Chester said. There's no point having a cell with doors that can be opened simply by staging a blackout. She moved to the next cell. By lamplight, she could see another body. This one was a corpse, and it was long dead. There were stains on the glass, these dried and flaking. The body lay with one hand outstretched, fingernails torn and broken, palm open, almost as if asking for help. Left in there to die, Chester said darkly. Enough, Nilda said, walking briskly to the end of the corridor. Another door, another corridor. An interrogation room to the right, a storeroom to the left. She walked inside, still able to hear that zombie clawing at that reinforced window. Quickly, she said. Locker C1.3, wasn't it? It was obvious which that was. There was a bright yellow sticker in the middle, a thick yellow band painted at the top and bottom, and it was the only locker that hadn't been emptied. Inside they found two Geiger counters, a pair of yellow all-in-one protective suits, two rebreathers, and a long box. She opened it. Twelve dosimeters lay nestled inside. She pulled off her pack and stuffed those inside, and then the Geiger counters. For good measure and for no reason other than they were there, she grabbed the rebreathers and yellow suits. They went into Chester's pack. I want to see blue skies again, she said. Agreed. The trap creatures pounding intensified when they made their way past the cells. As they headed down the corridor beyond, Nilda thought she could still hear it, then realised that this was a new sound. It was as if something metallic was being slowly dragged along the ground. It was hard to identify and even harder to pinpoint from where it came. She turned around, trying to peer into the shadows beyond the few dozen yards illuminated by the lamp. Ignore it, Chester said, grabbing her arm. But she couldn't, and the noise didn't stop. It was almost a relief, twenty yards further on, when a set of doors on their right flew open and a zombie stumbled out. It managed two lurching steps before the doors swung closed, hitting it in the face and pitching it back into the room. It was like a scene from one of those bad sitcoms broadcast late at night for an audience too tired, drunk or indifferent to change the channel. And with that image, the flash of fear vanished. The doors pushed open again, the creature staggered out into the corridor, and it did so with a metallic scrape. Attached to its right ankle was a handcuff. The other end of the cuffs was attached to a twisted section of metal tubing belonging to Nilda didn't know what. Calmly she stepped forward and swiped the sword at the zombie's outflung hand, severing three of its fingers as it clawed towards her. As she brought her sword arm back, she ducked and then struck again, slicing the blade through the tendons at the back of its knees. 
She cut through stained fabric and desiccated flesh, and as it tried to snap its mouth down on her outstretched wrist, it toppled sideways. Its head hit the double doors, knocking them inward. Before they could swing closed, she stabbed the sword down, spearing the point through the zombie's temple. It stopped moving. Pitiful, she thought. Truly pitiful. Let's get out of here, Chester said. Yeah, I've had... She stopped. There it was again, that metallic, scraping sound, and it seemed to be coming from every direction at once. Now, he barked, but she didn't need any encouragement. They jogged to the junction where the corridor met the one that led outside. At the far end, she could make out the double doors, silhouetted by a faint halo of daylight. She managed one step towards the light when that sound grew, suddenly amplified tenfold. She looked left and right and back and forth and saw nothing. Then she realized why. She looked up. It's above us, she screamed, grabbing Chester's arm, pulling her back just as the false ceiling above them collapsed. Zombies fell to the floor, blue coats, white coats, a man, two women, a child. Those facts vaguely registered as she backed away. Four more fell, another section of ceiling collapsed, and a score tumbled out. Some hit the ground with a soft crack of rotting bone, others with a crunch of plaster and styrofoam as they found their feet and moved towards the light. As one, Nilda and Chester turned and ran. Behind them, she could hear more falling thumps, more crunching of plaster, and then a harsher, metallic jangling as the light fittings and ventilation that the false ceiling had been built to hide were torn loose. Just run, she told herself, because zombies couldn't. All she had to do was keep moving, but before she could seek any comfort in that thought, the ceiling ahead of them collapsed. Plaster and dust erupted in a thick cloud, turning visibility to nothing. Coughing, spluttering, retching, she could make out the squirming forms of the undead thrashing on the ground, all struggling to stand. Chester bellowed and sprang, his mace cleaving up and down, up and down. He wasn't aiming at heads. There was too much dust to aim at anything. He just hacked and hewed with furious abandon, metal smashing into the floor as often as it crushed necrotic flesh. Nilda ran, swinging the lamp back and forth in one hand the sword stabbing and slicing in the other. She screamed a bellow of incandescent fury and fear as fingers clawed at her legs and tugged at her feet. Cold pain ran up from her calf and she danced sideways, half tripping as a hand caught at her ankle. Then there was a hand at her shoulder, yanking her forward. It was Chester, grunting with the effort as he pulled her free of that heaving heap of death. As her eyes cleared and her brain focused, she saw the corridor ahead was clear. She tried to run, but that turned into a limp. Chester threw an arm under hers, roughly dragging her onward, and then right at the next junction. There, ahead, was the bright outline of daylight on the other side of a door. In front of it, heading towards them, were four of the undead. She hurled the lamp at them, taking quick, Shallow breaths, trying to recover, preparing herself to fight. Never stops, does it? Jester muttered. There was an eruption of light and sound as he fired, again and again, four shots, then five, then six, emptying the revolver. Three fell, the fourth staggered with the impact as the bullet hit its collarbone. Nilda hobbled forward, slicing the sword at the creature's legs, knocking it down to one knee, bringing her hand back, stabbing it through an eye before it had a chance to stand. They pushed the door open. The light was blinding, the air was cool, and for a brief moment all seemed well. But then her eyes adjusted. She saw the mechanical graveyard in front, and to her right she saw the other door, the one they'd used to enter the terminal, and out of which came a slow procession of the undead. Can you run? Chester asked as he grabbed her arm. Let's find out. With Chester half dragging her, she limped away from the terminal building. Those green birds seemed to be everywhere now, all flying up and away from them, and the slow and inexorable death that followed. The boat! She waved an arm towards the southeast, but they were running to the north. We'll be fine. Just a bit further. And he was right. 
they ran around a broken section of wing and found themselves on the relatively clear stretch of runway. The terminal was now to their right. The zombies were following them, but were getting caught in the wreckage. Chester, his hand a vice on Nilda's arm, didn't slow. Ahead she could see two figures. One waved. Another hundred yards, and they were close enough to hear Jay call. What happened? When behind her, there was a sharp popping sound, followed by a rattling clatter. Nilda found herself looking back towards the warehouse in which the emergency vehicles had been stored. The retractable gate broken. The undead that had been trapped inside spilled out onto the tarmac. She froze. Children, she said. They had to be. Though there were a few taller figures, most were too small to ever have been adults. No time for it, Chester grabbed her arm and tugged her back towards Jay. Tuck and the waiting lifeboat. As Chester piloted the boat back out into the Thames, Nilda couldn't take her eyes from the undead staggering along the runway. Three reached the end almost at the same time and kept on moving, tumbling down into the water. How many do you think there are? Jay asked. Two hundred? Three? More? Nilda said, taking out the much-depleted first aid kit to clean the cuts on her legs. It's a shame, Jay said. Yes, Nilda said. All those children, all those lives wasted, flown all this way in the hope they would find safety, forced to take refuge in that building when the terminal was overrun, only to find that sanctuary was really a mausoleum. No, Jay said. I meant... It's a shame, because there was probably some useful stuff in the airport. She wondered when her son had become so callous. But he hadn't, not really. He didn't see the undead as children, but simply as an annoying obstacle to be avoided or overcome. I think, she said, that with that number of people staying at the airport, they would have used up all the obvious supplies. Yeah, but... We're starting to need the unobvious ones, Jay said. Things like brake cables. We didn't know they were useful until we started making the walkways. Then there's bleach and string and paper. Didn't they have bookshops at airports? And we didn't look for the fuel. Fuel? Nilda asked. Yeah, plane fuel. Tuck says you can use it in a car or boat. Can you? She asked. In a diesel engine, sure, Chester said. And if those people stayed at the airport, I wonder. What? Well, it's fifty-fifty whether I'm correct, but thanks to that jumbo jet, no planes could take off, right? Perhaps the reason they stayed at the airport was that there were a lot of pilots among them. Until that runway was wrecked, they intended to fly out of there. In which case, they'd have had a stash of fuel. That's just a guess, Nilda said. A nice theory that neatly fits some of the facts. Tuck says, Jay began, that the planes we went into could be flown. Wait, no, would have been able to fly. Ah, oh, yeah, before the birds got in, she means. Nilda glanced up. That great green flock was now looping around the airport. Occasionally, one would dart down, flying towards the broken planes, then shoot up again before landing. What did those birds eat? she asked. Because maybe we can eat it too. We can eat birds, Jay said. Even parrots, right? Parakeets, Chester said. Some people saw them as a bit of a pest. I like them myself. Made a welcome change from pigeons. I haven't seen that many birds in a while, not since earlier in the year. And then they always seem to be migrating. They might have perched in a tree or on a roof for a night, but a day or two later, they'd all be gone. It's a good sign. I'm going to take it as that. What about you two? Did you see many when you were on your way down from Penrith? A few in the countryside. None in the towns, Jay said. We did see a fox once. That was near Cambridge. I saw a few birds on the Isle of Scarra, Nilda said. Not many, and none settled on the island. Maybe the people who stayed at the airport had food, and that's what the birds were eating. Maybe they used all the uh, aviation fuel to power a generator. We don't know, and now we have no way of finding out. At least we have the life rafts. She turned away from the airport and looked down at the stack of rafts tied to the deck. Some were orange marked with red, others yellow marked orange, 
a few, an orangey-yellow with red stripes. "'And did you get the Geiger counters?' Jay asked. Nilda stared at him blankly. She'd been so distracted that she'd completely forgotten about the radiation. She ran over to her pack and pulled one out. It worked. Or she thought it did. "'Is this right?' she asked, handing it to Tuck. The soldier took it, looked at the counter, then quizzically up at the sky. Then she nodded. What? Jay and Chester asked, almost as one. Normal, Nilda said. The reading is normal. Well, it's a bit higher than before, but not by much. You see on the lid here, there's a chart. It gives a background level for London, for traces in medical procedures, and all the way up to lethal. That's... I don't know what that means. Jay said. It means we're safe, Nilda said. So what's wrong? Jay asked, as if sensing her doubt. It should be much higher, she said. Those people on Anglesey said that it had been spread by the winds. People had gone to Cornwall and got a lethal dose. Wasn't it Birmingham? Chester asked. And they said that those people had to turn back, but both were a long way from London. Maybe the wind's been blowing out to sea. On the telly, whenever they showed the weather maps, the front's always, for seven months, Nilda cut in. And if it was blowing west to Birmingham, southwest to Cornwall, how was it always blowing east here in London? Yes, fair question, Chester said. But the reading is more or less normal. That's all that matters. Exactly why we've not died from radiation poisoning isn't as important as the fact we haven't. Yes, yes, of course. Sorry, Nilda said. You're right, it is good news. It was the sight of those children, I suppose. And that cell. I can't get that image out of my mind. What cell? Jay asked. Nilda briefly summarised what they'd seen in the holding cells at the airport. You see, she finished, I can understand why you might lock up someone who'd been bitten. That's safer for everyone. But that window was small, and when we first went down the corridor, it was transparent. When we were heading back, it was so covered in that brownish... Well, I suppose you can call it blood, but it was so coated in the stuff, I couldn't see the creature at all. You're saying that we were the first people to go down there since the person died and the zombie came back, Chester said. Exactly, Nilda said. They were locked in there and left to die. Maybe not, Jay said. Maybe they planned to go back but they got infected too. Maybe. But what about the other cell and the person in there who hadn't turned? Nilda asked. What was it you said about Stuart? Some people shot him and killed the people he was with, all for food. Who's to say that those people, or people like them, aren't out there still? You look for the bad in everyone, Jay said. Since we're doing all we can to help others, we should assume others will help us. The golden rule's a nice idea, kid. Chester said, but when you're older, you'll find out the real world doesn't work that way. Maybe because it's full of cynics, like you, Jay said. Yeah, maybe I am a cynic. It doesn't change the fact that someone was locked in that cell. How much do you know about the people at the tower? How many of them tried to rescue you from the museum? Ask yourself that, and then tell me I'm a cynic. He turned the engine off. I think we can let the tide pull us for a bit. Well... We got the Geiger counters, Jay said, and the rafts will help. Oh, and we found these. He pulled a can of lemonade from his bag and offered it to his mother. So, what's next? Kent, she said. That was the point of this, wasn't it? Find a Geiger counter, and if Kent isn't radioactive, find a coastal farm and gather the food before it rots. I think we've enough fuel to make three trips along the coast, maybe four. I suppose we could fill up the rafts and tow them behind the boat. We'd be able to bring more back with us that way, and then... I don't know. We're all running on empty, and so on edge that the only thing keeping us from falling off is that we're heading forward at full speed. It can't go on. We have to stop before we collapse. We all need time to heal, time to grieve, time to remember what it means to be human. We can't do that when each dawn brings new worries, and each night reawakens old fears. Or we just keep going... Chester said, never stop until we're forced to, and hope that when we do, we realise we found safety. You got anything stronger than lemonade in that bag of yours? There's Coke, Jay said. Yeah, figures. But the reading is normal, 
Finnegan asked. That's right, or a little higher than normal, Nilda said, repeating what she'd told everyone when she and the others had returned to the tower. Once the initial good news had been passed on, Hannah had said that further details could be given at the meeting after the evening's meal. As Nilda went off to wash, change, and throw another set of ruined clothes on the pile to be incinerated, she tried to think of what additional details there were to give. By the time she'd walked into the two-story red brick building that had once been the tower's restaurant, she thought of nothing, nor had she found any inspiration in the few mouthfuls of over-seasoned stew that she'd managed to swallow before Finnegan had asked his question. She stared down at the unidentifiable contents of her bowl. She wasn't sure she would have finished the meal, but she'd have liked to have had the chance. "'But it's safe, right?' Finnegan continued. "'I mean, that's all that matters, isn't it?' "'Please, everyone,' Hannah said, standing up. "'If we're to start the meeting now, please remember the rules. "'You must wait to be recognised before speaking.' The room went mostly quiet. "'Um, right. Well, yes. Well, the radiation. The reading is above normal, but—' She glanced down at a stack of ledgers she'd brought with her into the dining hall, and which she'd spread out over the table, her own meal forgotten and congealing to one side. "'Yes, it's safe. That is the important part, though in this context safe is hard to define. We have to rely on the figures given in a couple of textbooks, and they all seem to base their conclusions on the same studies of Chernobyl. The professor would have known, of course—' A wave of sorrow fluttered across her face. "'But perhaps the details aren't important. We here do not have to worry about radiation.' There are, however, plenty of things we do need to worry about. Water, food, and heat are at the top of the list, along, of course, with safety. She closed the ledger and opened the next. Things aren't as good as any of us would like. We lost a lot of supplies with those vehicles we left at the British Museum. But it isn't all bad news. The pigs and the chickens. Hannah began an overlong explanation of feed stores, energy requirements, how much water the animals required— and how much human energy and time was needed to repair it. Nilda looked over at McKinnery. The woman was sitting hands folded, listening intently. She was one of the few. Most had returned to their meals or sat with eyes glazed, not really taking in the details of what the young vet was saying, but seemingly comforted by the scientific summary. Which means, Hannah finished closing the ledger, that unless circumstances change, we will need to slaughter one pig in five days' time, and another a week after that. If we can stockpile water, and not have to use all our electricity on purification and sterilization, then I think we could keep a freezer running for a total of eight days, but this would not be ideal. I know that pork chops are an appealing prospect, but what we eat now, we can't eat this winter. There are a few nods, a few grumbles but no real dissent. They would follow the young vet, Nilda thought, and do what she said because they'd been fed and told that there would be food tomorrow. Winter is the real problem, Hannah continued, and autumn has yet to truly begin. Stuart, do you have the list? Stuart stood and waved a clipboard. It comes to about two weeks of stores? Hannah asked. That's it, Stuart said. About a week of fresh in the kitchens— then we're on to the stores. Two weeks. Everything on here. I added it up when we brought it in from Kirkman House. So, Hannah said, including livestock and their feed, we'll be starving before December. That news was meant with stony silence. What about Anglesey? Her voice called. Nilda turned to see who'd spoken. It was that man that McKinnery had gone to help earlier that day. Graham, wasn't it? They'll have food, won't they? Graham continued. And they've a power station. So isn't all this planning a bit pointless? Graham, please. We will be coming to that, but we have rules. You can speak when I've finished, Hannah said. Nilda was surprised to see that, after a brief pause, the man did actually retake his seat. But yes, Anglesey. It will take Chester a day to drive to Wales, and perhaps two more to get to the island. Is that right? At best, Chester said. At best, yes. At worst, it... Um, she stammered to a halt. At worst, I'll die along the way, Chester said with a disarming smile. But it could take longer than three weeks. 
If the boat comes, it might bring food, but we're assuming that they still have food to spare, and they may not. And when we left, they had a real problem with fuel. They might only send a sailing boat with a sat phone. Thank you, Hannah said. And as such, we must plan as if they don't exist. That means we must go out and find more food, more firewood. There's plenty of that in the old church, McHenry interrupted. A pew burns as well as a shelf. You know my feelings on that, Mrs. McHenry. And Nilda noted that Hannah didn't berate her for interrupting. But perhaps in an emergency we must forego those considerations. As I was saying, we need more clothes, more candles, more wind-up torches, and anything else that will allow us to save our firewood for boiling water. With those rafts, we should start thinking about trips across the river to South London and places that, as Hannah spoke, Nilda got a better idea of her leadership style, or rather, her lack thereof. She clearly had no interest in power and had fallen into the role with the deaths back in Kirkman House. She acted like a schoolteacher and treated everyone as if they were children perhaps because of the horrors surrounding them. People welcomed that regression back to those halcyon days where the greatest danger was a playground bully. As long as Hannah was spelling out what had to be done, by whom and by when, few people took the initiative. Therein lay the danger. Nilda had no intention of formally challenging Hannah for leadership, as long as everything was being done that could be done. It didn't matter whom people considered the group's highest authority. She threw a glance over at McKinnery. It almost didn't matter. And that brings us to Kent, Hannah finished. If there is fruit still on those trees and... And why should there be? Graham cut in. Because, Chester snapped before Hannah had a chance to remonstrate, it was called the Garden of England for a reason. Sorry, he added. I forgot I was meant to wait for my turn. Yes, um, well, Kent... Hannah looked down again. I've made a list of farms I know of and which are close to the coast. We have enough diesel for the boat to make about 300 miles while leaving enough for a car to get to Wales, and a small reserve in case we need to abandon this castle. I propose we send a small group down to Kent to find some suitable farms. Once we know how much food is there, we can devise a safe way to bring it back. Obviously, this should happen immediately. We we'll need better weapons than we have here if we want everyone who leaves to come back, McKinnery said. Swords and spears are a recipe for death. I'll take one of those rafts upriver to Westminster. When the government was finally overrun, the few who escaped wouldn't have been able to take all their weapons and munitions with them. With those, we could collect all the food we need and do it safely. Nilda looked over at Tuck. Her and Jay's hands were moving in an intense back-and-forth conversation. Yes, um, Hannah stammered, looking down at her ledgers again, as if one of those might find a clue as to how she should respond. Tuck'll go too, Jay said loudly. She says you'll need someone with you who knows about guns. And if she's going up river, Chester said, speaking before McKinnery could reply, and since Nilda's not going to be doing any running for a couple of days, I'll go down to Kent. What about Anglesey? Graham asked. You heard what Hannah said, Chester answered. Without that food, you'll starve before I get back. I'm more used to travelling around the wasteland than most, and Anglesey can wait until this is done. Of course, you can always go to Wales yourself. Just head north for a hundred miles, then take a left. When you hit the sea, follow the coast until you see the electric lights. So, we have a plan, Hannah said, in an attempt to regain control of the meeting. Looks like it, Chester said. And it's a clear night, not much point waiting for dawn. So, who wants an autumn getaway to the seaside? Let's go, Nilda said to Jay as Chester handed out pieces of paper for everyone to write their names on. What? Where? Jay asked. We haven't put our names in. And we're not going to. Chester's right. I'm not going to be running anywhere for a day or two. But I can, Jay said. And you're coming with me, to Kent. We'll pilot the boat but we won't go ashore. Why not? Jay asked. Because someone has to stay on board. Then you can do that, Jay said. You don't need me to stay as well. Look, Mum, I fought my way down from Cumbria. I know how to handle myself, and I'm better at it than most of the people here. Ask them. They'll tell you. Why do the young always think it's about themselves? 
Nilda asked of the world at large. Jay, less than a month ago I was on an island out in the middle of the Atlantic, wearing nothing more than rags. I had to watch as every last one of the people that saved me from a watery grave died from radiation poisoning. And then I had to bury them with my bare hands. The closest I've come to a day's rest since was on the boat from Scotland down to Anglesey. I'm tired, I'm sore, I thought my son was dead, and now I find he's alive. Forgive me if, after all I've been through, I want to spend a couple of hours with him in relative safety. Right. Yeah. Sorry, Jay mumbled. Nilda immediately regretted her words. They were true, and it was important that Jay understood, but the tone was half a year out of date. As Chester gathered the scraps of paper and placed them in an upturned roundhead's helmet, a dozen lies that would have better salved Jay's young ego came to her. But it was too late. Reese, Greta, and Finnegan had drawn the short straw and were going to Kent with Chester. As soon as their names had been drawn, Chester hurried them to get ready and then hustled them out to the boat with hours to go before the tide changed. Nilda followed them, finding a perch by the lifeboat's controls. The three people looked reliable enough, and Tuck had given her stamp of approval on the volunteers. So why did she feel such a foreboding weight of anxious finality when she looked from one face to the next? Finnegan pulled out a long bare net, then took off his belt and adjusted the scabbard. Chester had made them swap the long spears that had become most of the survivors' weapon of choice for the less imposing but far more practical hand axes. The bayonets had been Tuck's suggestion. They were early twentieth-century models from the small Fusiliers Museum that took up one corner of the inner tower's grounds. She'd also had to tell them to get rid of the armour that most had taken. Plate and chain mail might stop a bite, but the best protection against the undead was speed. Finding a farm shouldn't be difficult. They just had to follow the coast with an eye on the shore and another on the map, and they'd return to the tower with the tide. As Chester had said, it should almost be a holiday. Perhaps they'd have time to gather some food, perhaps enough to fill the boat. Probably not, but either way, they should be back at the castle before the next evening meal. No, that wouldn't be difficult. It was the next part that would be deadly hard. They would have to take as many people as they could down to the farm and fill every bag and container they had. There was no way of doing that safely. If they filled the rafts and towed those behind the boat, they would be able to bring back more. And they would need to. In a few weeks, the real autumn storms would set in. At about the same time, the diesel would run out, and any fruit left on the trees would have fallen to add its bulk to the leaf matter, fertilising the orchards. Then there would be no more food until they'd grown it. And that was where the true danger lay. If they found nothing in Kent, or if they didn't find enough, or if there was no food to spare in Wales, or if the boat they sent was lost at sea, or if one of a hundred other possible calamities befell them, they would face starvation before winter began, and would all certainly be dead long before the spring. Chapter 5 Part 2 The Ruins of Whitehall 18th of September Tuck slowly lowered the packs and improvised oars down the side of the tower, she and McKinnery were going to Westminster alone. Perhaps out of guilt that they'd escaped the obviously more dangerous trip to Kent, people had volunteered to go with them. Tuck had turned down their offers of help. It was Nilda's fault, or it was Chester's, or maybe it was no one's. She'd never entirely trusted McKinnery. During their days trapped in the British Museum, she'd realised there was something inherently dangerous about her. Those suspicions, confirmed by Chester, and his revelations about the woman's past had now grown to encompass nearly everyone in the tower. Finnegan, for example, had seemed to be a close confidant of the woman back in Kirkman House. She was equally wary of Greta and Rhys. That was why, when Chester had asked who would be most reliable on the trip to Kent, she'd given him those three names. 
The rope went suddenly slack. She'd not noticed that the bundle had hit the ground. She grabbed the other pack, clipped it onto another rope, and began lowering it. She felt slightly guilty about helping Chester arrange that lottery. It wasn't that. Tuck's thoughts were interrupted by a tap at her shoulder. It was McKinnery. I didn't think we were due to leave for an hour, McKinnery said. Grateful that her hands were full, Tuck finished lowering the bag to the ground, perhaps a little more slowly than she needed. I woke early, she signed. Yes, so did I, McKinnery replied. You don't need to come. I am more than capable of completing this chore on my own. I'd rather do this and spend the morning watching water boil, Tuck replied, and that was partly true. Standing by the great stainless steel urns they used to sterilise the water was the very definition of watching one's life tick away. Besides, she added, it's Jay's drone. He made me promise no one else would use it while he was away. Sorry. McKinnery shrugged and seemed indifferent. Tug couldn't tell if that was genuine or a front. That was the problem. She now saw everything McKinnery said and did as an act. Tuck took one last look at the tower. Constance was shooing away the ravens while Hannah fed the chickens. Or she thought it was Constance and Hannah. It was hard to tell from this distance when everyone wore the same mismatched, ill-fitting clothing. But those two were always among the first to wake. Had there been a few more people up and about, then they could have used the gate. But with no one to close it behind them, they had to resort to the ropes. It was an unwelcome addition to the morning's exertions. Tuck couldn't sleep inside the castle. The rooms were too small, the ceilings too low, the windows too narrow. It felt claustrophobic and crowded. Instead, she'd created a bivouac on top of the Wakefield Tower. She didn't sleep much outside either, but from there she could stand up and see the lifeboat when it was tied up. When she sat with her back against the old stone, all she could see were the tops of the skyscrapers and pretend, if only for a moment, that the world hadn't changed. She checked her gear one last time, grabbed a rope, and climbed over the wall. At least there were no undead on the river path this morning. When dawn had arrived and she'd accepted that another day would have to be faced on a few interrupted hours of sleep, there had been two of the undead lumbering towards the west side of the tower. They'd come to a halt at the thick plastic barrier that separated the grassy moat from the ticket booths and restaurants to the west side of the castle, and now stood immobile, almost expectant. What had summoned them, whether it had been a squeal from a pig, a groan from a person, or any other part of the clattering cacophony that heralded the group's attempt to start the day? Tuck didn't know. It didn't matter. Abruptly, the zombies' arms waved and pawed their necks, jerked back and forth, and their mouths snapped open. What had seemed like a glorious morning was destroyed in that macabre reminder that the day's work wouldn't be done until more of the undead had been killed. Her feet hit the ground. She grabbed one of the smaller rafts, pushed it halfway down the worn and river-slick steps, and pulled the cord. Inflated, she found it was much larger than she'd thought. McKinnery's plan, if it could be called that, was to hope they could steer the raft through the wreckage of London Bridge. Tuck was hoping they couldn't, and so the expedition would be brought to an early halt. But if they did make it as far as Westminster— she planned to fly the drone around the rooftops until the battery ran low, and hoped that would be enough for McKinnery to realise that whatever she was looking for was now gone. Careful with that, Tuck signed as McKinnery unslung her battle axe. It was a double-headed affair, with a blade on one side and a long spike on the other. It had been presented to a long-dead king by the long-forgotten emperor of somewhere following the battle of somewhere else. Tuck couldn't remember exactly what had been printed on the plaque next to the weapon's display case, except for the quote at the top, To the victor go the spoils. She suspected it was that which had drawn McKinnery to it. Tuck used an oar to push them out into the river. The oars had once been giant rammers stored next to the cannon kept in the White Tower's basement. They'd stripped off the thick leather and cloth padding, attaching flat squares of durable plastic in their place. The end result, Tuck thought, as she tried to steer the craft towards the widest gap underneath the wrecked bridge, was as cumbersome as the raft. McKinnery grabbed the other oar and started paddling herself. 
Soon, they'd established a rhythm. McKinnery wasn't shy of work. Tuck had noticed that before. There was an expression her old friend, the Major, had used to describe his brother, and it seemed appropriate to describe McKinnery. She was like a part-time preacher who'd sell you a car on Saturday, God on Sunday, and run a breakdown service from Monday to Friday. She could be relied on within very specific parameters, but never trusted. A current pulled the boat up and suddenly south, and it took a frantic five minutes of paddling before they were back on course. Tuck's arms were beginning to tire, and from the strain in McKinnery's shoulders, the other woman was feeling the same. The rafts weren't going to work, not long term. That was okay with Tuck, and she hoped it might help persuade McKinnery to give up on her quest. Another wave, and this one far larger, caught the craft. It took all of Tuck's concentration, and their combined effort, to stop it from crashing into the floating museum ship HMS Belfast. They reached London Bridge, an arm agonising ten minutes later. It looked much the same as it had on the drone's cameras the previous day. The truck still balanced precariously on that thin ribbon of concrete. Water churned white over, under, and around the artificial dam of broken ships, floating debris, and the twitching limbs of the undead. They were halfway through the wreckage, when a body fell from the bridge, landing in the middle of the raft. McKinnery moved with a quick efficiency that hadn't come solely from practice since the outbreak. She slammed the oar down on the zombie's knee, then on its back, and then its head. Tuck leaped forward, stabbing her bayonet through the back of its neck and into its brain. Together, they hauled the motionless creature over the side. Pulling on the twisted sections of rebar and pushing against the broken masonry, they reached the deeper water beyond the ruined bridge. Tuck resheathed her bayonet. It could be cleaned later, but the scabbard would have to be destroyed. That was a shame. Like the knife, it was an antique, but there were plenty of them and it would be a waste of wood and water trying to sterilise it. Another moil, another bridge, McKinnery said, turning to face Tuck. The soldier didn't reply. She just picked up the oar and started rowing once more. They were finally stopped half a mile from the ruins of Parliament at the remains of the Hungerford Railway Bridge. Rails and sheet metal jutted out of the river. Around them, white water danced and dashed against a staircase that, in better times, had led to a floating restaurant. The stairs now lay at right angles to the river, thudding against the broken rails with each surging wave. They secured the raft by steps that led up to a giant stone obelisk. Cleopatra's Needle, McKinnery signed. Looted from Egypt, centuries ago. Tuck nodded but her interest wasn't in the hieroglyph-covered monument, but in a building beyond. The walls of the embankment were high, the river low, and most of the building's roof and upper floors were gone, but she thought it had once housed the Ministry of Defence. She moved closer to McKinnery so she could see the map. They were on that section of the river that ran north to south, from embankment down to Vauxhall. The MOD wasn't marked, nor were any of the government buildings except for Downing Street, as she followed McKinnery's finger, tracing possible routes through the political heart of London, Tuck noticed that it kept hovering on, or close to, Buckingham Palace. For a second, she assumed that was where the woman wanted to go, then realised that it was probably a ploy to distract Tuck from wherever her real destination was. A supply dump would be established in an open space, McKinnery signed. Buckingham Palace, St. James's Park, or somewhere similar. And those are beyond the drone's range, Tuck signed back, and to forestall any further conversation, handed McKinnery the copter. She smoothed down the waterproof cover. A large transparent sack, Jay had insisted the laptop stay inside at all times due to the terabyte of sitcoms he'd discovered on its hard drive, turned the rotors on and flew the drone straight up. Tuck fixed her eyes to the laptop screen and the small window that showed the image from the camera. Along the road, almost as if they'd been parked, were an odd mix of refrigerated delivery trucks and armoured security vans. The software had two other windows, both blank, that would have shown the drone's position on a street map had the GPS been working. To navigate, she had to rely on the image from the small camera, the clock and the battery indicator. 
From experience, she knew she'd be relying on landmarks and guesswork to match the drone's path to the map McKinnery clutched in her hands. The copter kept rising, and the image changed to that of a broken window surrounded by smoke-blackened stone. Another window, this one unbroken and through which Tuck could see that the floor inside had collapsed. Up again, until the wall was replaced with a rooftop filled with aerials and satellite dishes, except at the northwestern end, where there was nothing but a gaping hole. Tilting the drone so the camera took in the skyline, she rotated it until she found the shard. That gave her a position for London Bridge. A few more degrees of a slow turn, and the screen showed the shattered remains of the London Eye. She looked over her shoulder at the broken ferris wheel on the southern bank of the Thames and the other side of the ruined bridge. It must have been deliberately targeted, she signed. Probably by a submarine captain, who'd spent half a day queuing for a ride, McKinnery replied. Watch the battery. There's time for sightseeing later. Tuck turned her eyes back to the screen. She'd forgotten whom she was sitting next to. She kept the drone rotating, mentally noting where Big Ben should have been, and then the building-free expanse that she took to be St. James's Park. Though the screen was small and the window showing the camera's image even smaller, something about the park looked wrong. She tilted the drone until the camera was facing down and slowly piloted it forward. The building she thought was the Ministry of Defence was now mostly a crater. Some of the thick, repeatedly reinforced walls were still standing, but very little of the roof was. There's nothing there, she signed, looking up at McKinnery. The older woman nodded and seemed uninterested. Tuck turned the drone east. Out of the corner of her eye, she caught McKinnery's sign. Where are you going? Tuck jabbed a finger down towards Charing Cross Station. She was reminded of Dev and his obsession with train stations. Not for the trains themselves, but for the storerooms that supplied all the fast food outlets. While she wasn't sure they could really call it food, they had found a lot of calories there, and Charing Cross was close to the river. Had been. The train station had been destroyed, not by a missile strike, but deliberately collapsed to form part of the government barricade. She turned the drone and then abruptly stopped it. The image juddered before settling on Nelson's column. It, at least, still stood. She was glad of that. Not out of any martial pride, but from relief that something of the past remained in a place that had been a living museum as much as a city. That gave her a direction. From there she headed southwest to Whitehall. She brought the drone to another hovering halt. Her interest not in the government ministries, but in the long row of double-parked tanks lining both sides of the street. Treads had been dislodged, turrets dismounted, barrels bent, and there was no mistaking the impact marks on roadway and armour from high-velocity rounds. Nor was there any mistaking the shambling figures moving slowly down the road towards the drone. McKinnery was trying to catch her attention. "'Can you drive one of those?' she signed. "'A tank?' "'No,' Tuck replied. It was a lie. She had been through the training course and driven one under fire, albeit only for a harrowing mile and a half. But if she revealed that, she knew full well what McKinnery's next question would be. Besides, she added, I don't think any of those would be operational. Pity. What about the Foreign Office? Can you get a view of that? Tuck looked back at the screen. The camera was pointing down the length of Whitehall. The grey stone buildings all looked identical to her. She just shrugged and flew the drone up to take in the rooftops once more. Stop. There, McKinnery signed. Ninety degrees east. There, that's the Foreign Office. It looks intact, don't you think? That corner took a direct hit, Tuck signed. And those windows have gone. Yes, yes, McKinnery said. There was an odd calculating look on her face. Deciding that she'd had enough of circumspection, Tuck tried a more direct approach. What do you think we'll find there? She signed. Probably nothing, McKinnery replied. Just like everywhere else. If you turn it a hundred and eighty degrees, we'll see Downing Street. The copter, an overpriced novelty from the toy store on Regent Street, was devilishly difficult to change direction when it was in mid-flight. Whenever Tuck tried, the drone ended up pointing in completely the wrong direction. She stuck with flying it in a straight line, bringing it to a hover and slowly turning it around until she found Nelson's column. 
then orientating herself accordingly. As such, she overshot Downing Street. A small part of her regretted that. She was curious to see what the garden behind the Prime Minister's house was like, but the battery indicator on the software was at 70%. It would have to wait for another time. She steadied the drone and aimed the camera down. They were over Horse Guards Parade. The old open space, home to jousting in the days of ancient kings, had been turned into a vehicle park. There were more tanks, a court's worth of construction equipment, and in the corner, close to the old Admiralty building, were a dozen parked lorries. Tuck didn't need McKinnery's finger stabbing at the screen to know to have the copter descend, circling the vehicles, looking for damage. There was none that she could see. A wave caught the raft, and as they were bounced up and down, Tuck's finger nudged the controls. The image started to rotate. She jabbed at the keyboard, getting the drone to rise. By the time the boat had steadied itself, the copter was fifty metres up. Tuck breathed out, brought the drone to a halt, and then into a descent, as curious as McKinnery as to what might be inside those lorries. A finger tapped the screen. Tuck blinked. She'd been so focused on the vehicles, she'd not seen what was now heading towards the drone. A long, thin line of the undead, coming from the direction of Whitehall, had followed the soft whir of the rotors. Tuck shrugged, levelled off and checked the battery level. Sixty percent. Next trip, she signed, ignoring McKinnery's finger still pointing at those parked vehicles. Tuck turned the drone up and west to get a view of the park. She realised why the image had seemed wrong. The grass had gone. More construction vehicles, though these with a distinctly civilian paint scheme, had been abandoned next to huge mounds of earth. Graves? McKinnery signed. Tuck shook her head. Fields, she replied. And somehow, that was worse. Inexpertly dug, incompletely finished, and improbably excavated with bulldozers. It wouldn't have mattered if this redoubt hadn't been destroyed during the attacks. The people inside would have starved long ago. Then she remembered the tanks, and the only purpose to which they could have been put. Those people had no intention of being farmers. The battery light flashed fifty per cent. Tuck took that as a sign their aerial tour was over. She rotated the drone until she found the shard and started piloting it back. It was halfway along a canyon of curving road when the light jumped from an orange 45% to an ominous, narrow red line. Tuck had barely enough time to steer the drone into the middle of the road before the image blurred and then went blank. What happened? McKinnery asked. Tuck tried the controls. She gave up. The battery ran out, she signed. Where? McKinnery asked. Three hundred metres away, Tuck pointed at the map. Perhaps four. We have to go and get it, McKinnery signed. We don't. We do. We can't get another. Not easily. Not without fighting our way to Regent Street and battling our way through that department store. Where else would we find one? How long would we spend looking? Without that drone for surveillance, we only have our eyes. And since Westminster is one of the places that we will end up looking, we might as well go there now and collect the drone while we're about it. The logic was sound. Tuck hated that. She stowed the laptop in the bag, checked the bayonet was loose in its scabbard. The rope attaching the boat to the steps was fast, and the axe was ready in her hand. She jumped onto the stone steps. They were slick with slime, and she almost slipped as she caught the thick iron railings and climbed over. She offered a hand to McKinnery, but the woman leaped from the boat more nimbly than Tuck had managed. Alert for the undead, Tuck scanned the road, trying to find a way over or past the rubbled remains of the railway bridge blocking the road to the south. She saw no zombies, but that just meant they'd all followed the drone. Behind the ruined tube station was a wide tunnel, Embankment Place, according to the embossed sign above the entrance. It was a grand title for a pedestrianised thoroughfare that ran under the bridge. On either side were those ubiquitous cafes, with drifts of leaves and rubbish piled up against their broken doors. Except as she picked her way over the broken glass, Tuck saw that one wasn't a cafe but a bicycle shop. Near the back of the store, there were at least three that looked ready to be ridden away, they would be genuinely useful, 
as they had none at the tower. She was about to step inside when she sensed movements to her side. A zombie crawled towards her on elbows and arms. Both its legs were broken, with the left only attached by a thin strand of sinew. Its open, snapping mouth filled with mud and leaves as it ploughed its way through the gutter. Tuck hacked the axe down, wrenched it free, and decided that the bicycle shop could wait. She looked over her shoulder. McKinnery stood there, her battle axe in hand, an odd look on her face. She would have heard that zombie approach, Tuck thought. And then she realised that she and McKinnery were here alone, and no one would think it odd should only one of them return. Moving more quickly than before, she left the gloomy tunnel. On the road to the right, there was another creature, this one heading away from the river. Her eyes on the zombie. Tuck didn't see what was beneath her foot. Whatever it was, as it broke, the creature turned, its arms jerkily flapping as it staggered towards her. Ignoring the clothing and what other few identifying features remained, she darted forward. It wasn't a person, just a threat to be eliminated. She chopped the axe at its legs, breaking bone. It staggered, toppled, fell to its knees, arms still clawing out, and mouth still snapping open and closed. She changed her grip, slashing down, skin split and skull broke as the axe smashed into its brain. Tuck looked up, trying to reconcile the images from the drone with the streets in front of her. Above the roofs to the north, she could just make out the Admiral's hat at the top of Nelson's column. Below that, at the end of the road, were more of the undead. Ten? Fifteen? She wasn't sure how many, but there would be more behind those. At least they weren't moving. That thought had come too soon. Three of the creatures slowly rose. She was almost relieved when McKinnery pushed past her, waving her axe towards a side street branching to the left. Tuck followed her over a mound of rubble spilling out from a building that had taken a direct hit. All that remained to identify its former purpose was a scorched scrap of green cloth fluttering against a broken flagpole. Beyond the rubble was a long curving road with CCTV cameras pointing in every direction, including straight up. She was certain she didn't recognise it from the drone's images. McKinnery had taken a diversion. She was sure of it. Gearing up for an imminent betrayal, Tuck sped up, trying to catch her. But McKinnery did the same thing, sprinting ahead with a speed that belied her age. Tuck's mind filled with memories of traps and ambushes, until McKinnery dived forward, grabbing something from the ground. The drone. Tuck came to a stumbling halt, smiling with the relief of it, but that smile froze in place as she looked beyond McKinnery and saw the undead filling the road. Of course they'd followed the sound of the drone's rotors. Tuck looked the way they'd come. The undead were slouching towards them, blocking the road behind. She looked for an escape, and saw a thick wooden door partly blown off its hinges and singed by a familiar burn pattern. She was still debating whether to risk the unknown or charge the undead when McKinnery shoved the copter into her hands and ran into the building. The expression on her face was so out of place that Tuck had stuffed the drone in her pack and followed McKinnery into the building before she realised what it was. Triumph they were in a wide corridor, with open doors spaced equidistantly along it. Daylight streamed through each, axe raised, expecting the undead to spring out. Tuck moved past McKinnery and looked through the first door. It was a meeting room, with a ring of tables and enough chairs to seat a dozen. Was it a government office, then? The next room was the same, but with a name only a hotel would use, printed on a plaque by the door. As she neared the end of the corridor, Tuck looked back and saw a zombie stagger into the building with a second creature a flailing arm's length behind. McKinnery, reading something in Tuck's expression, turned, twisted, and flipped her battle axe around. It carved a chunk out of the ornate wallpaper before the blade cleaved up through the zombie's chin, splitting its face in half. As red-brown gore and black gobbets of brain slid down the blade, McKinnery punched the axe at that second zombie's legs. It fell, and when McKinnery turned, motioning for Tuck to continue, her expression was utterly emotionless. Tuck quickened her pace, as much to get away from McKinnery as from the undead. 
The hallway branched. To the left was a hasty barricade. To the right were three uniformed bodies, each with matching head wounds that told the story of their deaths. She jumped over them and kept running. Another junction, another barricade, more bodies. She turned left. The corridor curved, and she was worried they were heading back on themselves. McKinnery grabbed her arm and pointed at a doorway, wider than the others. On it was a tarnished brass sign, Gravington Ballroom. Underneath that was a torn piece of paper. All that remained of the words printed on it were, No Admittance. Before Tuck could protest, McKinnery had pushed the doors open. One side of the room was empty. The other was full of tables. On them, behind and underneath, were crates. Tuck recognized the type instantly, as those used to store and transport ammunition. She grabbed a stack of chairs from near the wall and pulled them down in front of the door. The barricade was rough and ready, but would hold back the undead long enough for them to escape. There were two other doors from the room, a small one marked as an emergency exit, and another that was larger than the one by which they'd entered. That, she hoped, would lead to the front entrance. McKinnery was going from crate to crate, opening some, ignoring others, and occasionally pulling out a few loose rounds of ammunition and throwing them into her bag with a casual disinterest. Tuck realized that McKinnery was talking to herself. Her head was half-turned, and the only words the soldier caught were, "'Must be here.' Tuck ran to her and grabbed her arm. "'We have to go,' she signed. "'Not yet,' McKinnery said. "'Look, there's ammunition here. At least,' she thrust a fistful of rounds at Tuck. The soldier pocketed them. "'And it's useless without a rifle,' Tuck signed. But McKinnery hadn't seen. Tuck grabbed her arm, turning her to face the now shaking doors. "'Yes, fine,' McKinnery said. "'Time to go. But get the ammunition. There's no point leaving empty-handed.' She scooped up another few fistfuls, dropping them into her bag. "'Now!' Tuck rasped. McKinnery grabbed one last handful of cartridges and pushed past the soldier, heading towards the doors. "'It's clear,' she signed. A real battle had been fought in the corridor beyond. Bodies were strewn about one on top of another. Some had been ripped apart, others had been shot, and only by the head wounds was it possible to discern the human from the undead. There was a brass plaque on the wall, with an arrow pointing towards reception— Tuck started moving more quickly, ignoring the doors to either side, her attention on getting out of the building. A zombie reared out of a side room, its snarling face inches from Tuck's own. Only the axe held across her body prevented the creature's teeth from tearing at her face. Tuck twisted, shoved, but those clawing hands were pushing her back. She let go of the axe and dropped to the floor, scything her leg out, knocking the zombie down as her hand went to her belt. She pulled out her bayonet but McKinnery was in the way, not attacking the creature, but jumping over it, running past. Tuck stabbed down and pulled the knife free. She couldn't see the axe, no time, she thought, and ran towards the exit. McKinnery hadn't reached it. She'd paused in the lobby and was pulling at. They were remains, though parts would be a more apt description. It was impossible to tell which limb belonged to which torso, nor even how many had died. It was a last stand, the destruction wrought by landmines or something larger, used when all hope of rescue or escape had gone. Tuck reached out to grab McKinnery, uncertain what macabre purpose she had, but the woman straightened with a look of triumph on her face. In her hands was a rifle. The barrel was bent, the stock charred. Before the soldier could protest, McKinnery had thrust it into Tuck's hands, and then pushed past her, grabbing another, similarly damaged weapon. Rifles, she mouthed. Tuck looked at her, wanting to scream. Instead, she ran out of the main doors and down into the street. There were undead there, and there were more on the right. So she went left, using the broken rifle to club a path through the living dead. The roads blurred into one as she swung the rifle, pitching the undead from their feet no longer caring if they rose again in time to attack McKinnery. She saw the river, but there was a zombie right in front of the railings. She kept running as it twisted around to face her, and then turned the run into a leap. Her shoulder hit its face, snapping its head back. 
She spun, bayonet ready, but the creature had lost its footing, slipped and fallen onto the spiked railings. One had gone straight through its neck. Its arms thrashed, its legs kicked, and the skin around that gaping wound slowly tore. Tuck took a step back, looked around for any more imminent threats, and saw McKinnery not three paces behind. A broken rifle was slung over her shoulder, a second in one hand, and the battle axe in the other, an almost serene look on her face. Tuck stabbed her bayonet into the eye of the impaled zombie, and then took one last look back at the road. She expected to see a great pack of the undead heading towards them. Whenever she ran from them, she always forgot how slow they were. They would be impeded by the rubble, and might never get as far as the river. She threw a look towards the tube station and the bicycle shop hidden behind. Not this trip, she decided. She clambered over the railing and down the steps to the raft. McKinnery moved to pull the rope free. Tuck shook her head. The tide, she signed. It won't turn for an hour. McKinnery nodded and sat back down. You said you needed a firing pin, she said, pointing at the rifles. Tuck nodded. The only modern weapon in the tower that wasn't covered in gems or coated in gold was an SA-80, assault rifle, that had been part of a display on modern warfare. The firing pin and back spring had been removed. Tuck looked at the weapons with their twisted barrels and melted stocks. She took out one of the cartridges that McKinnery had taken from that ballroom. It was the right caliber. You can make the gun work, can't you? McKinnery asked. Maybe. Tuck signed. McKinnery smiled. As they waited for the tide to turn, Tuck tried to work out why. Chapter 6 By the time she stood on the battlement walls, watching Kevin and Aisha bicker, she'd not found the answer. They'd brought back 463 rounds of 5.56 NATO ammunition. At best, that represented no more than the deaths of three hundred of the undead. She wasn't sure how much ammunition there was in the ballroom, but even if they went back, collected it all, and planted each bullet in the forehead of one of the living dead, they would only make a shallow dent in the total numbers left in their undead Britain. It was a distraction from the real threats facing them. That was the argument she'd been working on as she'd carried the drone back to Jay's room. But when she'd found McKinnery again, the woman seemed to have lost all interest in the rifles and ammunition. Tuck closed her eyes, seeking a moment of calm in the silent dark. She kept trying to place McKinnery on a spectrum with the power-mad crook she'd been at one end, and the altruistic philanthropist she'd claimed to be at the other. Perhaps she was wrong, and McKinnery was just plain mad. To a greater or lesser extent, and each in their own way, everyone who'd survived this long had developed eccentricities that went far beyond neurotic. Why should McKinnery be any different? It was a comforting thought, because it suggested that, with no reason behind McKinnery's actions, there was no subterfuge either. That meant that she could focus on the other, far more pressing problem she discovered on their return. The two zombies she'd seen pouring at the barrier on the far side of the moat when they'd set out for Westminster were still there, and they'd been joined by a third. It wasn't that anyone had spent the morning relaxing, just that they'd opted for the back-breaking but safer chores inside the tower's walls, filtering, boiling, desalinating and purifying the water, splitting the firewood, mucking out livestock, and all the rest added up to full-time work for two dozen people. Then there was the never-ending toil of laundering and mending the clothes that could be salvaged and burning those that couldn't. It all had to be done, of course, but those were tasks that used their stores, not ones that added to them. And after all that was done, and after all that they'd been through, didn't people deserve some time to relax? No, was Tuck's answer to that. Clearly she was in the minority. Her concern was that despite, or perhaps because of, Hannah's talk the night before, it was turning into Kirkman House all over again. It was too easy to confuse intent and action, particularly when they were all waiting for Nilda to return with news of whether or not they would be starving before winter set in. 
but anxiety wouldn't hurry her return. So Tuck had organized a small group to get rid of those undead, and at least make a start at crossing things off the shopping list. She opened her eyes. Kevin and Aisha were still bickering in that way only two people in love could. Tuck watched them, trying to leech some of the happiness from the scene. Then she caught a few very unexpected words cross Aisha's lips. She looked at the woman, this time more carefully, and realized they shouldn't have been unexpected at all. Then she realized she was staring, and turned her attention back to the shopping list. That was the name Jay had given it. It was a piece of paper he'd pinned to the door next to the kitchen, on which anyone could write down essential items they would like the next outgoing expedition to look for. At the top, underlined and surrounded by a small box, were the words, Firewood, Food and Water. Underneath and in the varied handwriting of whoever had added it were soap, detergent, blankets, gloves, coffee, tea, that had been underlined as well, then toothbrush. Next to that, and in a different pen, the letters E-Fs had been added. Someone else had added times three. That had been crossed out with the word lots scrawled in its place. Halfway down was bicycles. She crossed it out. They knew where to find those now. At the bottom of the list, just below toilet paper, which had been underlined a dozen times, was one pair of shoes, size twelve. That was in Stuart's chicken scratch, Scrawl. Under that, and again in his handwriting, was written, or boots, and under that, or sandals. Chester had arrived at the tower barefoot. He'd needed a pair of shoes for the rescue mission to the British Museum, and Stuart had volunteered his. Yesterday it had transpired that those were the man's only pair. He'd been padding about with a couple of layers of cardboard between a pair of thick socks, and no one had noticed. She checked the ropes were secure, and the sword was loose in its scabbard. If they did go back to Westminster, she'd reclaim the fire-axe. It was a familiar weapon, even a reassuring one, but Nilda seemed happy with a sword, so when Tuck was looking for a replacement, she'd taken one for herself. It was a hanger designed to be worn at the belt of a ceremonial uniform, and had belonged to King George the Third. That's what Fogarty had said though the metal looked suspiciously new to Tuck's eyes. At least the blade was sharp. The old warder had had little else to do during his time trapped in the tower but hone the edges of the exhibits. The happily bickering couple put a pause on their argument as Graham climbed onto the battlements. Tuck nodded a greeting. Graham was a hard man to read. He'd walked off the work detail barricading the souvenir shop yesterday, apparently because Stuart was on it, choosing instead to go out beyond the walls. Most people assumed the enmity was a product of Stuart replacing Graham as the group's cook. Tuck didn't think so. In her opinion, he was firmly in the finding it impossible to adjust group of survivors. Willing to work today, but always holding on to the hope that tomorrow would turn out to be a yesterday now forever gone. Stuart was simply an easy target for his misplaced rage. But Graham was one of the few people who didn't seem to mind leaving the safety of the castle's walls. After him came... Hannah? Tuck looked at her quizzically. I know, Constance was meant to come, Hannah said, speaking with a now practiced overpronounced enunciation. But I said I'd go instead. She's not... she's not well. Tuck nodded, understanding. There were two mothers and three fathers among the small group, though none from the same family. The appearance of Nilda and her reunion with her son had kindled the hope that their own children may still be alive. And then there was Constance. She'd seen her children die. She'd seen them come back, and she'd given them that final peace. You shouldn't come, Tuck signed slowly, and then had to repeat it. You shouldn't be here, Aisha said, either finally understanding or just guessing Tuck's meaning. It's too dangerous! I have to learn, Hannah said, gripping her halberd more firmly. There's no room for passengers. We all must do all that we can, all of the time. There were only three undead in sight. The risk wasn't great, and perhaps it would do the woman good. Tuck shrugged, grabbed a rope, waved the vet to one of the others, and climbed down the wall. When her feet hit the ground, she released the harness and looked up. Kevin was halfway down, Aisha following, helping a far slower Hannah. 
Tuck drew the sword and gave a practice swing, trying to get used to the balance as she walked towards the souvenir shop. Ignoring the undead on the other side of the wide gate, she looked inside the shop. Reese and the others had done a good job. The door that had let the undead in the day before was now firmly sealed, and the shelves were bare. But those shelves were still there. That wood could burn, and if it didn't, it would rot. But collecting it would be a safe and easy job, and one that could wait. When she looked past the gate to the broad piazza beyond, she saw the zombies slouching towards her. To encourage them, she ran the sword along the iron railings, watching almost curiously as their movement became more vigorous. Or was it frantic? Eager, perhaps? And then she stopped herself. Those thoughts only acted as a reminder that the creatures had once been human. She looked back at the castle. Perhaps they could plant seeds in the grass moat. Not fruit. It would take too long for the trees to grow. Vegetables, perhaps. But all that separated the moat from the undead was that chest-high transparent barrier. That would have to be reinforced. Or would the moat flood again now that the Thames barrier was forever down? She didn't know and suspected no one else could give an answer any better than a guess. She turned back to the approaching undead. They'd probably come through the gap in the government barricade near the old Billingsgate fish market, the same one that Chester and Nilda had used when they had driven to the British Museum. Seeing it was just one more problem that would have to be faced. So many questions, so many problems. The first of the creatures was two metres away, and they were a problem she knew how to deal with. She braced herself, right foot forward, the sword tip hovering between two railings, the left braced on the hilt, ready to push. The zombie jerked forward, its palm slapping against the gate. Tuck waited, timing her strike, watching the forehead, and never looking into those near-blind eyes. It lurched a final step, its mouth opening in a hissing snarl, its head bobbing back and forth. She lunged, the blade ripped through skin and muscle, tearing a huge gash across the creature's face as it moved into the cut and slammed its wrecked face against the railings. Tuck pulled the sword back and then aimed the point until it was almost touching that grey-flecked eye. She stabbed, hit resistance, and kept pushing, twisting and turning the sword, breaking bone as the blade sank deep into its brain. The zombie's arms went limp, and for a moment she was holding it up until, with a wrench, she pulled the sword free. Her opinion of Nilda rose another notch. The long, curved hanger was an utterly impractical weapon against the undead. Perhaps the wider, shorter blade of the gladius made it more effective at crushing. But this sword was only good for slashing. It was too late to change the weapon now. She made do with mentally cursing mad King George and felt a little better for it. The other two zombies had reached the gate. So had Hannah, Aisha, and Kevin. Graham stood a little way back, his head turning left and right. Hannah looked nervous, Aisha looked angry, and Kevin looked tense. Though Tuck suspected that had nothing to do with the undead. She motioned the vet forward. The long halberd wavering in her trembling hands, Hannah jabbed at one of the zombies without aiming first. The spear's point hit the railings. Hannah made another half-hearted stab, but the weapon had twisted in her grip. The ankle was now wrong, and this time it was the broad blade that hit metal. Conscious of the onward march of time, Tuck gently moved her out of the way and motioned for Kevin and Aisha to step forward and finish the creatures. They did, not with ease, nor without obvious distaste, but it was over quickly. The river path to the west was clear, so was the wide piazza to the north. Tuck pointed to the buildings in between and led them up the ladder, down the other side, and out beyond the safety of their fortress. She walked slowly, tracking her gaze across the buildings, trying to pick out which might be worth investigating. There was a block of mostly one-room studio apartments overlooking the river, and a cluster of office blocks behind that. The ground floors of those were emblazoned with logos of every fast food and slow meal franchise the country had to offer. If it could be fried, baked, sandwiched, or grilled, it could be bought within a raven's core of the tower. She raised a hand to grab Graham's attention, and then waved at the restaurants. Empty, she mouthed. I've checked them all, 
he said. There's nothing there. She nodded, though through the window of a French café she could see wooden stools stacked on equally wooden tables. It was at least a day's worth of firewood. Ahead, just past the glass and steel ticket office, was a compact circular building about six feet in diameter. According to Fogarty, it was a subway tunnel that led under the Thames. This news had elicited great excitement among the group until they realised that it didn't lead anywhere that any of them wanted to go. The pool of volunteers willing to venture down its length shrank when the old warder had explained that a bomb during the Second World War had compressed its diameter to less than four feet. Now that they had the rafts, Tuck suspected no one would be prepared to crawl through a pitch-black tube, trusting their lives to the hope that the other end had been sealed from the undead. The block near the entrance of the subway had a sign with that universally recognised stick-figure silhouette indicating a public convenience. She turned to ask Graham whether he'd searched the toilets, but he'd fallen back, his eyes on the skyline south of the river. It didn't matter. Tuck was sure Fogarty had said he'd stripped the place of toilet paper just after he'd returned to the tower during the early weeks of the outbreak. But there would be detergents and bleach there, and no harm looking. Then they could try one of the larger offices further to the west, and Kevin moved forward, overtaking her. A pair of creatures had moved out from behind the ticket office and were shambling towards them. One of the undead wore a suit. It always baffled her that when told to leave their homes and bring nothing but that which they could carry, some people would insist on wearing their best jacket and tie. As she got closer, she realised that it wasn't a suit, but the remains of a dress uniform. The peeling sole of the one scuffed shoe flapped up and down as the undead soldier staggered towards them. All indications of rank were torn off or obscured by dirt, but Tuck could make out three medals hanging loosely from the tattered breast of the jacket. She raised her sword and then changed her mind, waving Hannah towards it and Kevin and Aisha towards the other, a creature in tattered tweeds. Hannah tensed but looked determined as she raised her halberd. Tuck took an instinctive two paces back. She'd been right. The vet mistimed the blow and swung the long-handled weapon around in a great sweeping arc. The narrow point cut through the zombie's jacket but left the creature unharmed. The blade kept moving, slicing through the air inches from Tuck's knees. Hannah, however, was undeterred. Her mouth moved in curse, apology, or Tuck didn't know what, as she changed her grip and, holding the halbard, more like a broom than a weapon, jabbed it forward. She missed, took a step closer, jabbed again, missed again, another step, another jab. This time, the foot-long point sliced across the creature's cheek. The vet didn't withdraw the weapon to try again. She just kept pushing as the zombie kept advancing. As it twisted its head, the spear point tore through flesh, but did no real damage. By accident, though it looked like design, the zombie's arm batted at the halberd, knocking it out of Hannah's grip. Enough, Tuck thought. She stepped forward, raised the sword, and hacked at the creature's leg. Once, twice, she felt bone break. It collapsed. She stabbed down at its head. A quick check confirmed Kevin and Aisha stood over the unmoving corpse of the second zombie. Tuck half bent over the body of the dead soldier intending to look for an identity disc, but stopped when she saw the single crown on the remaining ragged epaulet, and which three medals it was that remained on his chest. In itself, that didn't mean anything. There were lots of majors who'd served in those conflicts. She peered at the face, but it was unrecognisable twisted in death, racked by decay, and ruined this one final time. Perhaps it was because she'd been thinking of the Major earlier. Perhaps it had been the sight of all those uniformed bodies back in the hotel. Perhaps not. But only someone who knew they were going to die would have donned their blues for one final time. Was it her old friend? There was an easy way of finding out. Her hand moved closer to the collar, then stopped again. She remembered what she'd told Jay back at the airport. It was better not to know, she decided, and in ignorance let cherished memory remain untarnished by truth. She picked up the fallen halberd and held it out to Hannah. The woman's eyes were unfocused. Tuck clicked her fingers. Hannah shivered, shrugged, and mouthed an apology before taking the weapon. Tuck was tempted to send her back to the tower, but that would have done Hannah no good. 
perhaps on Anglesey if everything Chester had said was true, and a lot of that had been filtered through Jay and tempered with his mother's distrust of the place, then perhaps the vet could grow old without having to fight another of the undead. But not here. Not if they ever had to abandon the castle. She turned to Kevin and Aisha, but in that moment, seeing the couple standing so close together was more than depressing. She waved a hand towards a sign for the public toilets, letting them lead the way. There was no toilet paper, but there was detergent. Six five-gallon containers of a concentrated deep purple cleaner with a label that had more hazard signs than it did ingredients. They carried those back to the castle and left them by the barrier to the moat. It was a start, Tuck thought. Not a great one, but each time they went out and killed the undead, people, weapons and clothes all had to be cleaned. The detergent would save on water, and that would save on firewood, and that would save them time. After that, and since one road was as good as any other, she pointed to the nearest, checked that Kevin and Aisha had eyes for Hannah as well as each other, and gestured for Graham to take the lead. As they went past the lurid bright signs and their faded posters of impossibly stuffed burgers, she made a mental note to ask Graham whether he'd checked inside for soda syrup. During her and Jay's trip down from Penrith, those jugs had been their principal source of sugar, found undisturbed in nearly every pub, restaurant, takeaway, and anywhere else there'd been a soda fountain. There wasn't much you could do with it beyond dilute and drink it, but calories were calories. They might as well check now, she decided, though it would move toothbrushes right to the top of the list for the next scavenging mission. She jogged forward, reaching out to grab Graham's arm. He turned before she reached him. There was shock on his face, but he wasn't looking at her. She turned around. A zombie had fallen through a second-story window to land in the roadway just in front of Hannah. Glass rained down as a second creature toppled out of the building. The first creature's legs were twisted at an impossible angle, but its body broke the fall of the second zombie, and that creature slowly stood. Tuck started to run as a third tumbled out of the broken window. Aisha and Kevin had jumped back out of the way of the falling undead. Hannah just froze as glass carpeted the ground at her feet. The creature, with the broken legs, was stretching out its uninjured hand towards her. The one standing had already turned its snapping mouth her way. Tuck turned her run into a sprint, but there was no way she'd reach the young vet in time. Aisha snarled back at the creature and hurled her axe like an Olympic hammer. The handle hit the zombie in the face. It staggered back a pace, and that was far enough because Aisha had started running as soon as the weapon left her hand. She launched herself across the intervening few feet, tackling the creature around its waist. They fell in a heap. Kevin, ever close behind, didn't leap. He shoved Hannah out of the way with one hand, the other awkwardly slamming his axe down on the head of the partially immobile creature. But he didn't pause to check if it was dead. He kept on running, grabbed Aisha's jacket and pulled her up. The zombie grasped her arm, and it rose with her. Tuck slammed a shoulder into the creature, knocking Aisha and Kevin free and the zombie back to the ground. Momentum kept her moving past it, but she turned that into a pivot as she raised the sword and hacked at its neck, half-severing it. She changed her grip and thrust down. The blade stuck, and she let go, pulling out the long bayonet as she turned to face the third of the creatures. Its arms came up, and she leaped, bellowing an inarticulate yell of rage as she stabbed at its head over and over again. When she stood, the zombies were unmoving. So was Hannah. Kevin was yelling at Aisha. Graham had gone to check the door to the building, and Tuck felt that familiar burning ache in her throat as her damaged vocal cords protested at having been used. The rage that had overtaken her was caused in part by the figure in the uniform. The other part was the presence of the woman out here, and what it would mean to their group if she were to die. You! Back! she rasped, pointing first at Aisha, then at the tower, then, almost as an afterthought, at Hannah. Hell no! Aisha growled. Tuck shook her head warningly. She wasn't going to argue. She pointed again at the tower and then at Aisha, this time slowly lowering her finger to halt just below the woman's stomach. Then she pointed at the tower again. You know, 
Kevin asked, somewhat redundantly, Tuck thought. She made a shooing motion, perhaps out of the shock of being discovered. Aisha complied, pausing only to take Hannah's arm. Tuck stopped them long enough to take the halberd from the young vet's unprotesting grip. Hope was important, but just as important as nurturing it was ensuring that nothing happened to destroy those hopes that had yet to take root. Jay had represented it for so long, and in nine months, or to be accurate, some point far less than nine months, Aisha would represent the idea that there was a future, a point to all that they suffered and struggled through. It was very unlikely Aisha would be the only new mother. No, that was one more reason to keep their doctor alive. Tuck waited until the two women had reached the safety of the tower before continuing down the road. She checked one of the restaurants, an obscenely priced hamburger joint. There were napkins, cutlery, and salt shakers, but no syrup or anything else that could be counted as calories. She waved Kevin and Graham back out onto the street. They could clear those places later. What they needed was something tangible to show for the expedition, something people could see, and in doing so understand that the risk of going outside the walls could make each of their lives measurably better, or something that no one saw because it was always there. As the nights grew longer, what they needed was light. Ahead of her was the church. She motioned for Kevin to listen by the door. He shook his head. He'd heard nothing. They went inside. The church wasn't what she'd expected. Rather, it was exactly as she should have expected, and exactly as it had been a year or decade before. Dust danced in the daylight streaming through a tall window behind the altar, but otherwise the church was unchanged. Embroidered cushions lay under seats, hymnals and prayer books were stacked neatly, ready for a service that would never begin. Despite Hannah's objections, they would make good kindling, and paper was always needed, but Tuck found, suddenly, she didn't care. She closed her eyes, trying to rid her mind of the question over the identity of the body lying a short distance away. They'd lost people getting out of Kirkman House, but they had reached the tower. Jay was alive, and would be tomorrow. Hopefully they all would. That was what mattered now, she told herself. Not the past. There was a tap at her arm. It was Kevin. On his face was a grin, and in his free hand was a candle. Two feet long and three inches wide at the base. Dozens! he mouthed, gesturing over his shoulder. He'd found a store cupboard full of boxed candles, a mixture of the votive and those large enough to light the entire church. Candles, bleach, a few broken rifles, and a few hundreds rounds of ammunition. It wasn't much for an entire day's labour. As they carried the boxes back to the tower, Tuck hoped that they would find Nilda had returned, and with a better haul. There was no sign of her as they headed back to the church, nor when they returned from the second trip. On the third, they were interrupted by a stray zombie slouching up the road from the west. On the fifth, the rain began to fall. When Tuck went for dinner, there was still no sign of Nilda. The idea of sitting in the dining hall without Jay's company was less appealing than the food. Making conversation out of mimes and the few, mostly martial, signs that the group had picked up took a considered effort that she wasn't in the mood to endure. So she took her bowl up to the relative privacy of the walls. The meal Stuart had cooked wasn't too bad, but somehow he'd managed to make it over-seasoned and bland at the same time. There mustn't be much choice in ingredients, she supposed. It was hot, and it filled a hole. That was what counted. The brief shower had ceased, but the sky hadn't cleared. Ominous clouds scudded east, promising a longer-lasting deluge to come. They'd have to find an alternative to the increasingly ineffective solar panels. Wind turbines, perhaps, although she didn't know where they would find them. During the summer, she checked the roofs they could reach using the walkways, but found none. Perhaps Chester would know where in London they might look. And that thought had her standing up and staring down the length of the river 
in the hope that wishing might make the boat appear. It didn't. Not wanting to be idle while there was daylight left, she turned her attention to the rifle. Not the three they'd brought back from Westminster, but the weapon that had been part of the display on modern warfare in the Fusiliers Museum. She quickly dismantled it, and it didn't take much longer to strip the broken weapons. A few minutes after that, she held in her hands what she was nearly confident was a working rifle. It just needed to be cleaned, and then it could be tested. She took the rifle apart again. A few minutes later, she wasn't surprised to see McKinnery appear through the arched doorway of the nearest tower. She was surprised with what the woman said. When I was emptying my pack, I found another twenty cartridges. Here, McKinnery held them out. They're of no use to me. Tuck nodded and found herself smiling politely as she waited for the question she was sure was coming. Again, she was wrong. Each day seems to bring events we could never have dreamed of, McKinnery said. Yet I can't think of a situation where a rifle would help, except, of course, the most desperate of ones. Where all hope is already lost. She bent down and picked up a tubular piece with a pistol grip that Tuck had meant to hide away. This is what I think it is, she asked. A grenade launcher attachment for one of the rifles, yes? It doesn't work, Tuck signed. If you fired it, the grenade would detonate in the barrel. That wasn't true. She'd found nothing wrong with it at all. More useless against the undead than a rifle, McKinnery said, again contrary to Tuck's expectations, though she seemed reluctant to put it down. An exploding zombie would spread infected guts over the shooter and anyone else within range. Useless. I should be back soon, Tuck signed, trying to draw McKinnery's mind to something else. The lifeboat? Yes, I suppose. She placed the grenade launcher on the ground. And of course that's important. But McKinnery turned her head and started walking away, and Tuck couldn't see what else she said. She mulled over what McKinnery had wanted in Westminster, if not a firearm. The only conclusion that came close to plausible was that it was akin to the desperation that had her, Tuck, seeking fuel at the airport. It was the desire to believe that there was something out there, some simple thing that could make life as easy as it had once been. A magic bullet, she thought, picking up one of the rounds. That didn't fit with McKinnery's personality. Whatever the reason, Tuck decided there was little point dwelling on it, nor was there any point having a rifle and not knowing if it worked. She loaded the round, balanced the gun on the walls, rigged it with a piece of string, and fired into the river. She regretted the shot almost immediately, not because the sound would summon more of the living dead, but because after she'd picked the rifle up from the battlement walkway, she saw that everyone had run out to see what had caused such an unfamiliar noise. On each face there was an expression of hopeful glee that turned sour when they realised the shot did not presage the arrival of a rescue party sailing up the Thames. 19th of September Midnight came, the clouds cleared, and there was no sign of the lifeboat. At 1 a.m., Tuck retreated to her own bivouac on top of the Wakefield Tower. It was another restless night. Every few minutes she'd think she sensed the boat's return, and couldn't dismiss the notion until she'd left her shelter and stood up to look. The night wore on, the clouds returned, the stars disappeared, and she saw nothing but the lamps she'd hung as a beacon from the outer wall. As a light drizzle turned to a persistent rain, she couldn't even see those, but still found herself compelled to go and check. An hour before sunrise, she gave up on sleep and stood by the walls. For the briefest moment, an illusion of mist, fog, and the light from the false dawn made the skyline on the southern bank appear almost as it once had. But when day slowly seeped along the river, the ruined city opened up before her, and she saw it as a desolate ruin it truly was, and now, forever, would remain. She went to find breakfast, and found she wasn't the only one up early, nor the only one who'd spent the night waiting for the boat. As the number of restless people grew and started to get in the way of those trying to get on with the day's chores, 
she organized a group to go and strip the restaurants and cafes of anything that could burn. She took eight people with her, and for half an hour the work was a welcome distraction. But that distraction made them incautious. Whether by chance or summoned by the sound of their labor, the undead appeared. At first it was one or two, and they were quickly dispatched. That bred complacency. They were strung out between the overpriced burger joint and the waist-high barrier by the moat, carrying tables and chairs back to the castle when five zombies appeared. Chairs and tables were dropped, weapons grabbed or unsheathed, and four were quickly dispatched. The fifth wasn't. Zhao, a former concert pianist stranded in London during the outbreak, sliced at the zombie with an eighteenth-century sabre. His wild slashes cut flesh, but did little real damage to creatures that noticed no pain. Her first shot missed the zombie's head, taking it in the shoulder. That was enough to spin it back, away from the downed man, and it gave Kevin the chance to step in and bring his axe down on its skull. Following the sound of the shot, or of the fight, more creatures came soon after. Within ten minutes, they were all standing on the moat side of the chest-high tourist barrier, cleaving axes, stabbing spears, and hacking swords down on the living dead. It was two hours before a whole twenty minutes went by without any more appearing. Tuck counted the bodies. Sixty-eight of the undead. She'd thought there would be more. Still, it was a good count for the morning, and there had been no injuries among the living. It was a drop in the ocean, but perhaps all those little drops did add up. More importantly, there was a genuine look of achievement in the faces around her, one that didn't completely vanish when they realized they had to get rid of the corpses. She ordered half the wood to be taken inside, and the other half broken up, to be used in a pyre. She was still working out where that should be built when the heads around her turned to the castle walls. There was a figure waving and pointing towards the river. She looked to Kevin. The boat's returned, he said. When she reached the path along the waterfront, she saw everyone crowded near the steps, up which came Nilda and Jay. Where's Chester and the others? she signed. We don't know, Jay signed back. They went ashore. We waited for them, but they didn't return. When the tide turned, we came back because, well, he looked at his mother. Nilda was clearly explaining the same thing to the group at large. They know where London is, they know where the tower is, Nilda was saying. We left them with a life raft, and we know where that is. But we're running out of time. We saw two farms on our way down there. Perhaps farms is a bit generous. There's one with at least three trees, their branches laden with fruit. There was another with a polytunnel that looked promising. I know, I know, it's not much, but it's more than we've got. I need some people to come with me, back along the coast to gather what food we can— after that, we'll head to the beach where we left Chester and the others. Perhaps they are there, with packs full of food and the addresses of where we might find more. Perhaps they are paddling that raft towards us right now. Or perhaps they're not. But we can't sit in a lifeboat off the beach waiting for them. Mouths opened, and a myriad questions were fired off. But Hannah ended the debate before it had a chance to begin. Everyone who went out with Tuck yesterday or this morning, she said, you're on the expedition. And perhaps because they were given no choice or time to think, no one seemed reluctant. Even counting the time it took for some to change and gather clean or better weapons, they departed less than thirty minutes later. As Tuck looked around the faces, mostly still eager, she was struck by how packed the boat was despite the claim painted on the side that it could fit a hundred and fifty. Hannah was clutching a sword, the same one that Tuck had handed her the day before when she'd taken the vet's halberd. She wasn't happy that Hannah was with them, but perhaps it was important as a symbol, not out of a demonstration of leadership, but of each person doing all they could, all of the time. She'd let Zhao off the detail. The man had been limping earlier, and as she looked around the boat there was no sign of Graham. She wasn't sure she'd seen him that morning. McKinnery had her battle-axe. Kevin and Aisha talked quietly, smiling as they honed the edge of their shorter war axes. No, she thought, they didn't resemble the passengers from a cruise ship at all. There was a tap on her shoulder. It was Jay. It's like a Viking war party, he signed, amused. So, anything exciting happened while we were away? Not really, she replied, and began to tell him. 
The first farm really wasn't anything of the sort, just an immaculately maintained house with three apple trees in a corner of the garden. As the undead slowly gathered on the other side of a high fence separating the house from a once busy coastal road, they hastily gathered the fruit that had fallen. They shook the trees to encourage more to drop, but there was still plenty that stubbornly refused to fall. When Kevin walked towards a tree, his axe in hand and a calculating look in his eye, Tuck had grabbed his arm to stop him. What about next year? she signed. He hadn't understood, or perhaps he had but disagreed. But at that point the fence broke, and they retreated back to the boat. The second really was a farm, or it had been. A long polytunnel ran across a paddock overlooking the sea. Behind it was a farmhouse, and behind that were scores of plastic-covered tunnels filling the farmland for a mile in either direction. Unfortunately, almost all the tunnels had survived the months of neglect intact. Without irrigation, the plants inside had withered and died. The one exception was a twenty-metre-long section near the edge of a field, where a branch had fallen from an old oak, smashing the plastic and exposing the plants inside to the elements. They're strawberries, Hannah said. It was too late in the year for any fruit, but they added a dozen trays to the lifeboat's cargo in the hope they might find a way of keeping the plants alive through the winter. Tuck didn't need Jay to point out the beach on which Chester and the others had gone ashore. The bright orange life raft was unmistakable, as were the undead surrounding it. "'What do we do?' Jay asked. "'There's no point killing the zombies, not if Chester and the others aren't nearby,' Nilda said. The tension, which had been building since the raft and the undead had first been sighted, dissipated a little. "'But do you think they are somewhere close, just waiting for us?' Jay asked. "'I'm not sure,' Nilda said. "'I don't think so.' "'Can you shoot them?' Jay asked Tuck. "'Yes,' she signed. "'But more will come.' "'Fire it anyway,' Jay said. "'If they're close by, they'll hear the shots.' "'If they came back and saw the undead, they won't have lingered,' Tuck signed. But she saw the desperate need in Jay's eyes. She understood it. The boy had to know that everything that could be done had been done. She unslung the rifle, took aim, and fired. A zombie fell. She aimed again. Fired. Missed. The first shot, she decided, had been a lucky one. She fired again. Another miss. "'It's the boat,' she signed. "'The waves make it too unsteady to get a clear shot.' Three is enough,' Jay said. "'If they're nearby, they'll have heard.' They all stood or sat, eyes scanning the shore, waiting. She kept her own eyes on the undead, as ten of them staggered out towards the lifeboat. A large wave crashed against the shore, knocking three over. The others staggered on. Another wave, and another two, were swept from their feet. Once down, they had difficulty standing up. It was a pitiful sight. She was about to suggest they leave, when Hannah spoke. "'That's long enough,' she said. "'Has Nilda said? There's no point waiting here. We'll go back.' They arrived at the tower long after nightfall. They travelled slowly, scanning the shore for anywhere they might find food, and gone ashore twice more. They found a row of straggly beans growing up the side of a barn on the first trip, and a second excursion was cut short when the rain started falling again. "'It's not much,' Nilda said, looking at their haul. "'Barely a day's worth of food.' "'I don't know what we should do,' Hannah said. "'I was hoping Chester would have found more. I—' No, I really don't know. We'll have to take the boat out again, Nilda said. We might get lucky. If we don't, then we'll all have to go out on foot, each in a different direction, and hope we find something. Tuck wasn't ready to pin her future on hopes as thin as that. One trip, one day. But unless they were visited by a miracle, someone else would have to be sent to Anglesey. Perhaps they should all go. The uncertain risks of the undead were preferable to the certain finality of starvation. Chapter 7 Part 3 A Crowded House 18th of September You understand why I'm not coming with you? Nilda asked. 
They were in the lifeboat's small cockpit. Jay and Greta were sitting on the deck, watching for obstructions. Finnegan and Reese were inside, checking and rechecking their gear. You mean other than your leg? Chester asked. Because that limp of yours does have a tendency to come and go. Now look, I get it. You found your son. That was what this was all about. Yes. Yes, I suppose. It's just, like I said before, Chester interrupted. The idea that we have a connection forged in the heat of battle is nothing but a romantic desire for there to be a meaning in all of this. We wake up, we struggle, we go to sleep, and all in the hope we get to repeat it the following day. That's life, always has been. The orchestra changes, but the song stays the same. Jay's right, Nilda said. You are a cynic. Do you have a plan? For when we go ashore? Broadly speaking, yes. Well, maybe you should tell them, she suggested, nodding towards Finnegan and Reese. The two men were both on the repacking side of their obsessive packing emptying curve. Okay, you two, Chester called. Time to get some vitamin D. Sit down before a wave hits us and you end up over the side, Chester said, clambering up after them. The hard protective shell of the boat wasn't designed to be sat on so much as clung to by any survivors of a wreck unable to find a space inside. We're going to keep it simple, he said when he found a perch that was secure, if not comfortable. What's the reading on the Gaga counter? It hasn't really changed since we left, Greta said. Good. As long as it stays that way, we'll go ashore in Kent, farm one of these farms, work out how much food is there, and come up with a rough plan of how we'll get it out. So when your boots hit the ground, ask yourself whether the surrounding roads and fields are free of the undead. Are there any gates, and can they be secured? Are there any handcarts or perhaps a tractor nearby? There probably won't be, but it can't hurt to look. It's all pretty straightforward. Hannah's List has some farms that are a bit too far inland, and there's one that's too near Whitstable for my liking. We want to avoid small towns. In fact, we want to avoid the undead entirely. So from now on, eyes on the coast. If we see anything that looks like a planted field, we'll go ashore to investigate. And how exactly are we meant to harvest wheat or maize? Reese asked. We aren't. We can manage picking fruit from a tree or pulling crops from the ground. Anything else is beyond us. We're looking for an easy haul, and I'd define that as what twenty of us can pull out of the ground while another twenty are keeping the undead at bay. You're planning to bring forty people down here? Reese asked. We want to get this done in one trip, maybe two, Chester said. We don't really have the fuel for more. Even if we did, in a week it'll be gone, and we won't be picking anything from this part of the world until next year. This is our one chance at something approaching self-sufficiency. Without it, we'll be reliant on Anglesey. Oh, we return there, with the boat this end, Finnegan said. Assuming you don't starve before that boat arrives, if they can send a boat, we're approaching storm season, so it might be spring before they feel they can risk it. If and when a boat arrives, they may not have space for everyone to go back with them. An able-bodied man like yourself would no doubt be among those who'd volunteer to stay behind. And he said that with a wide, malicious grin that he was irritated to see sailed over the other man's head. We do need the food, Chester finished, but we're going to collect it from places that are safe. How will we know whether it's safe? Rhys asked. Well... Chester said, thoughtfully. I suppose if we can't smell the fetid breath of the undead billowing about our heads, then... Chester! Nilda called, warningly. He sighed. All right, look. You don't know me. He looked from face to face. It just reminded him that of the people he had known when he left London, only Hannah and McKinnery were left. You don't know me, he said again, this time with regret. But for the last five months I've been trekking the countryside rescuing people. I've killed more than my fair share of the undead. The trick is to keep moving. If you get into difficulty, don't let fighting be your first instinct. Just run. Now, you all know where the Tower of London is, right? Right? There was a trio of indecisive nods. Well, what about reading a map? Do you know how to do that? Okay. Well. The tower is on the north bank of the Thames, and London is west of Kent. So if you get lost, if we get separated... 
If you have to run until you haven't a clue where you are, head north until you reach water. Take a left, head towards the setting sun until you get to the QE2 bridge. That's still standing, and you can cross the river there. And if we do have to fight, Greta asked. Go for the knees, Chester said. Knock them down. Then run in the knowledge they can't even walk after you. If you can't run, remember two things. First, that if you've broken its legs, a zombie's mouth still works. Second, that the rest of us will be coming to help as soon as we can. That's probably the most important thing, he added. We've got to stick together. If you see someone in trouble, you stop and help, because you'd want someone to help you. Look, I know you think you drew the short straw, Chester knew for a fact they had. He'd rigged the ballot. But think of this as a holiday. You're out in the fresh air, and nothing's trying to kill you. Believe me, life doesn't get much better than this. He didn't need the exasperated sigh from Nilda to know he shouldn't have ended his short speech like that. Eyes on the coast, he added. Keep watch for a farm. And he sat back to scan the shoreline himself. They were, Chester thought, like those people who'd set out by boat on the day of the outbreak, then stayed offshore until the chaos on land forced them further out to sea. Though each had witnessed the deaths of people they knew and perhaps loved, they'd been hiding from danger ever since. That had been the sensible thing to do. It was certainly more sensible than what he'd done. But the upshot was that these three, who according to Tuck were the most capable of those at the tower, had done little more than clamber down through the roofs of buildings to kill the handful of undead trapped inside. They viewed the Tower of London as a place of safety, but it wasn't. Sure, the castle's walls were thick, and they had access to all the brackish water they could find the firewood to boil. Each successive trip outside would take them further from the castle, and thus the danger increased. It was inevitable that people would die. With no way for their numbers to be replaced, that meant more work for fewer people. So they would take greater risks, and more people would die until, ultimately, their fragile community collapsed. Their only chance was in finding enough food to keep the community alive until crops they'd planted had a chance to grow. That would take twelve months, at least. Even without the undead, Chester couldn't see them passing a whole year without a death from disease or accident, suicide or childbirth. No, it wasn't twelve months. It was twelve years. This generation had to hold on until enough children could be born and grow strong enough to take over some of the labour. Twelve years before they could relax, twenty before they could dare a true day's rest. He looked around the boat, his gaze finally settling on Jay. No, regardless of what he'd said, the tower wasn't sustainable. He'd have to go back to Anglesey. That had been inevitable too. He'd never expected to find Jay and had planned for nothing more than wandering Britain with Nilda until his own death. Was that why Mr. Tull had given him that copy of Bill Wright's journal? Had it been a thinly veiled instruction as to the form his penance should take? It didn't matter. They'd found Jay, but he wasn't yet safe. He couldn't be. Not until he'd reached the Welsh island. If Chester made it to Anglesey, they would send a boat but he honestly didn't know if it would contain food or instructions to abandon London. Despite what Nilda might want, one last final evacuation was probably for the best. Chester closed his eyes and tried not to ask himself why, then, he was on a boat, heading to Kent, rather than in a car, attempting the trip to Wales. "'What about that one?' Jay asked. Chester was beginning to regret insisting everyone look out for farms. Ever since they'd passed Graves End and left the London commuter belt behind them, every other tree was pointed out as a potential source of food. Yeah, the field looks green, Finnegan said. I say it looks blue. It's flooded, Chester said. You can't grow much in salt water. At least Jay seemed to be enjoying himself. Chester guessed it was because he hadn't seen much of the world beyond Penrith until he'd travelled down to London with Tuck. The boy was starting to view desolation as the norm. There! Jay yelled, and Chester realised he'd fallen asleep. Where? What? he asked. There! That field! 
Jay pointed. There's nothing in it. At the edge, Jay said. Just before, right? You see the house? He's got a nice view of the sea, Chester said. Yeah, so there's a path running along the coast. Follow it down for a hundred metres. And there are trees. You see them? I can see trees, Chester said. But not what's getting you so excited. The red things on the trees? You see those? Oh, yeah. Are they apples? Probably, Finnegan said. They're more orange than red, Greta said, taking an interest herself. Could be peaches. Or oranges? Jay asked, hopefully. Let it say the greenhouse, Finnegan said. Do we stop? Take a reading, Chester said. I just did, Greta replied. And it's the same as before. So, do we stop? Chester gave the house a closer examination. There were three trees with something orangey-red in the branches, and no undead in sight. No, he said slowly. Not yet. If we go ashore now, we'll lose a tide. And three trees doesn't add up to much when you share it out among fifty. There's probably more further inland, Finnegan said. Maybe, maybe not. We can stop there on the way back. It'll be nice, though. Something for us to look forward to. And now they knew they wouldn't return empty-handed. How much further do we need to go? Rhys asked. Past the Isle of Grain, and then past the Isle of Sheppey. About another twenty miles or so. Maybe a bit further. Settle back. Have something to eat. Finnegan pulled out one of the ration bars that had been stored on the lifeboat. Their only virtue was that they didn't require any cooking. I'd rather have some fruit he said. There, those ones, Rhys said, pointing towards the shore. That polytunnel, do you see it? There's a chunk missing from the middle. Chest appeared at the hemispherical metal and plastic tube. I think you're right, he said. Whatever's inside looks green, doesn't it? But before you get your hopes up, four things. First, what was grown in there might not be edible. It could be flowers or something. Second, the insects and birds might have beaten us to it. Third, whatever it was might have come ripe earlier in the year. Fourth, look back that way. He gestured towards a barn, and the undead moving from it down to the shore. It's the engine, Jay said. The zombies follow it. Follow us. So they're all heading east, Finnegan asked. Sure, Chester said. You must have realised that's what happens. I knew they followed sound, Finnegan said. I suppose I just didn't think of it before. Wait, so they're going to keep on going? I mean, when we get to the beach, they'll be heading that way? Nah, there's going to be walls and houses in the way, and those will slow them down. Once we're out of earshot, they'll stop and wait until some other sound wakes them up. And that's going to be us, coming back, Greta said. Probably. Nothing we can do about it, but we'll add that place to the list of those we'll investigate on our way back. A bit here, a bit there. It all adds up. Check the Geiger counter, Finnegan said, moving towards it himself. What? Why? Chester asked. Look over there. You see it? That entire village has burned down. The reading's fine, Greta said. It's probably a house fire that got out of control. Chester said dismissively. How did it start? Jay asked. So no, Chester said. I doubt it was people. Light refracted against a car wing mirror onto a pile of leaves, maybe. Or through a kitchen window onto a carelessly stacked pile of newspaper. It could be anything. It could have been a zombie knocking something over. It could even have been lightning, or a compost heap gone critical, or a dozen other things. Fires happen. They happen all the time. There's just no one left to put them out. Chester? Nilda called. He went below. What's up? The waves. The tides turned. And we're burning fuel just to stay in the same place. Chester pushed his head up and scanned the shore. This'll do. We're still miles from the farms that Hannah wrote down, Nilda said. He's Kent. You can't throw a cow without hitting an orchard. He pulled himself back on deck. All right, listen up. We're going ashore here. We'll head in a loop, two miles south, then east, then north, and follow the coast back here to the boat. We're aiming for about eight miles in total, or a couple of hours on foot. 
If we find a likely looking farm, great. If we don't, we've got those places we spotted earlier to check. Everyone happy with that? They weren't, but they nodded. Then check your gear. Water, weapons, and empty bags. Anything else is dead weight. Tie up those straps, Jay added, pointing at Finnegan's pack. And check your laces are double knotted. You don't want anything the zombies can tug on. We'll see you in about three hours, Chester said. We'll be waiting, Nilda replied. Okay, Chester said as he clambered down into the inflated life raft. Don't forget, if you get lost, if you can't find your way back to the beach, then head west. It isn't going to be easy. It's not going to be safe. It's... well... As he looked from Reese to Greta to Finnegan and saw that each wore the same expression of barely suppressed fear, a memory of a long-ago Saturday afternoon came back to him. His father had been newly released from prison. As the rain had pounded on the windows, they'd watched a movie on the television, both unable to think of anything to say to one another. It was a film about D-Day, not one of the great ones, just a cheap thing from the early days of colour, made when the props were all army surplus, and the landing craft had come straight from a Royal Navy depot. He remembered the look on the faces of the extras, all men old enough to have worn the uniform for real, as the young actor portraying the gallant officer tried to boost their morale. They'd been amused. Chester sighed. It's what we call life now, he finished. They paddled until Chester's oar brushed against pebbles. Close enough, he said and jumped in. The cool water felt refreshing against his skin, and had a tantalizing clarity he found hard to resist. With the raft dragged above where damp stones betrayed the high tide mark, he took stock of where they were. Beyond the pebble and flotsam beach was a path, beyond that a patch of scrubland, and then a wall, a road, a hill. The path made of flaking timber had an optimistic hand-carved signpost with an arrow pointing to the east. Only a broken corner of green plastic remained of the label, indicating exactly what lay in that direction. Where to? Greta asked. Chester checked the map, but couldn't be sure of their position. All paths lead somewhere, he said. We'll follow this for a bit, see where it takes us. It led, after four hundred yards, to an empty car park at a point where the road ceased running parallel to the coast and cut directly inland. Now we go south, Chester said, pulling out his knife. He hacked a rough arrow into the wooden planking, pointing in the direction they'd left the raft. You wouldn't remember to turn left at the car park? Reese asked. I'm a city boy, through and through, Chester said. For all I know, there's a spot like this every mile, and this path runs along the entire stretch of coast. We go south, keep an eye on the time, Another on the fields and... And a third out for each other, Greta said. That's what Tuck taught us. Good advice, he said, picking up his pace. But I was going to say, keep your weapons handy. We'll come across the undead. Soon enough. He was right. Though the first they came to wasn't a threat, it was a forlorn creature standing in the middle of an empty field. Or that was what Chester first thought. It's been baked in there, he said as they walked past. The zombie's hands clawed out as it tried to reach them, but its feet were stuck fast in the ground. It must have been there for, I don't know, months, Greta said. Since the last spring rains, Chester said. It stayed there for want of any reason to leave. And now it'll remain there until the rains come again. The creature's arms were flailing up and down almost in unison, and with each swing a tattered fragment of cloth flew off, only to drift down around its feet like a macabre blossom. We'll go on for a mile and a half south, and then turn east, Chester prompted, and they set off once more. The fields they passed were much the same as the one with the living scarecrow, and filled with nothing more edible than weeds, and the occasional serpentine bramble snaking out from an overgrown hedgerow. You think we can eat them? Reese asked as they passed one laden hedge. Greta pulled a berry from a stem and popped it in her mouth. 
think so, she said. I'd have washed it. Don't know what's been along this road, Chester muttered. And checked the Geiger counter first. And when he did, the reading was no different from earlier. Chester mulled that over for the next mile. He trusted Mr. Tull and could see no reason why he would have lied. And, indeed, it was a good thing that Kent wasn't the radioactive wasteland that Scotland and parts of the Midlands had become. But why had it been spared? He'd just come to the conclusion that the answer must be connected to why they'd seen so few of the undead when, reaching the top of a slight hill, they saw a dozen zombies huddled in a dip a hundred yards further down the road. Four of us, twelve of them, Finnegan said. Yeah, Chester said. So don't just stand there. Get across that field. We're not going to fight, Finnegan asked with obvious surprise. What's the point? Chester replied. It'd only slow us down. The field led to a paddock and the skeleton of a horse. Where's the raven? Reese muttered as they climbed another fence and were back on a road. What? Chester asked. Shouldn't there be a raven? Shouldn't there be birds? Didn't you say you saw lots at the airport? Parakeets, Chester said. Hundreds of them. Haven't seen a raven of late except at the tower. Foreboding, that's what it is, Reese muttered, too morosely for Chester's taste. The road curved and kinked, and Chester realised they were heading more south than east. He was about to propose that they turn back towards the coast when Finnegan pointed. There, you see that? Chester looked ahead. What? You mean the trees? Yeah, they're planted too neatly, Finnegan said. That must be an orchard. I can't see any fruit, Chester said. Not all fruit is bright red, Finnegan replied. The road dipped and twisted and the trees were lost from sight. Chester was just wondering whether anyone had built a straight road in Kent since the Romans, when they saw the field again. Now they were closer. It was obvious that the trees were planted in rows and that they had once been cultivated. Zombies, Reese hissed. In front of a wide, tall gate were six of the undead. Two had been male. One, judging by the lank remains of long blonde hair, had possibly been female. The other three were too desiccated to make out any features beyond the snapping teeth, gnashing and snarling with increased vigour as the zombies saw the four travellers. This is where we fight, Chester said. I've got the right. Finnegan, you take the left. Try to angle behind them. Greta and Reese, you go down the middle of the road. Get them to split up. Remember, go for the legs. If more than two come at you, back away. Don't run, just move quicker than them. They walked abreast down the road as the creatures staggered towards them. Chester raised his mace and the other three raised their axes. He took a hopping skip forward. As he hoped, the sudden movement caused two of the undead to angle towards him. One was tall, even after months of walking death. The other, save for a matted beard that stretched halfway down its neck, was as nondescript as the hundreds of others he'd brought to a second, final end. The tall creature's arms clawed pendulously out and down. Chester skipped back, out of reach, then forward. He raised his left arm to block its back-swung hand as his right went low, smashing the mace into its calf. There was a moment of soft resistance as flesh was pulverized, and then a sharp crack as bone broke, and a grunt from Chester as a toppling zombie's flailing arm slapped against the side of his head. Ears ringing, he stamped his heel into its jaw with a revengeful crunch. The second of the undead was only a pace away. Chester took another step back as it took a step forward. The prone creature lashed out with its spindly arms. The second zombie tripped, fell. Chester brought the mace, two-handed, down on its skull. He turned his attention to the other four and cursed. Reese was cleaving his axe left and right, hacking at the three zombies in front of him. Each blow cut flesh, severed fingers and maimed limbs, but the only effect of his wild swings was to force Greta back behind him, where she couldn't reach the undead. Go for the knees, she yelled, but Reese didn't hear, 
and with each blow he took a half-step forward, and the undead were edging around him. Chester bellowed as he ran towards the trio of undead. They paid no attention to his war cry, and were still swiping and clawing at Reese as Chester swung the mace low, knocking one to the ground, then high, smashing a second to its knees, then up over his head to bring it crashing down on the third's skull. Finish them! Quick! he yelled, but Greta was already darting forward, stabbing the axe's sharp point at a zombie's exposed head. Chester turned to look for the last one and saw Finnegan leaping over its unmoving body, heading towards that spindly creature whose spider-like arms still flapped against the muddy roadway. Finnegan swung down once, Greta once more, and it was over. All right, Chester said, breathing hard. Look, race, race, look at me. Right, you're all right, it's over. You did good, but next time remember that you're not chopping wood. And try to aim at their heads, not mine, Greta snapped. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, he mumbled. Well, what about this orchard? Finnegan prompted. It wasn't an orchard. Supported on rows of wooden poles, a great lattice of wire and rope was suspended ten feet above the ground, trailing up and then hanging down in nearly neat rows about eight feet apart was a mass of leaves, dangling from which were a forest of small cone-like flowers. "'What are they?' Greta asked, picking one and rubbing it across her fingers. "'Hops,' Chester said, as in beer. "'That was the other thing that Kent was famous for.' Can we eat them? Finnegan asked. I don't think so, Chester said. Let's try the next field. That will at least get us away from the road. At the field's far end, they found another gate leading to another hop garden. Hold my legs, Chester said, as he climbed up the gate. Braced, he craned his neck left, then right. There's a couple of fields like this to either side, he said, as he jumped down. Beyond that, I can't tell. They climbed over the gate and into the second field. This one was not so picture-perfect as the first. Half of the wooden trellises had been pulled down, or had collapsed under the strain. Still, Chester thought, as he took a cautious sip from his water bottle, it was a more pleasing sight than most he'd come across. "'Where you find hops, you probably find barley nearby,' Rhys said. "'And how do we harvest it?' Greta asked. Sickles and scythes, Reese said promptly. There are enough weird weapons at the tower, which look like... I didn't mean what tools we'd use. How much could you cut by hand? She swiped her axe at a trailing plant. If it weren't for the undead, it would be back-breaking work. But we could manage it. But as it is, how much time would we have before the zombies came? An hour? Less? We could never gather enough to feed everyone. And a stalk of barley isn't the same as a refined grain, Chester said, putting his bottle away. I've learned that much these last few months. But you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that farms were big on diversification, and this one wouldn't focus solely on hops. They'd grow fruit for cider. Maybe grapes? Really? Greta asked. Probably, Chester said. We'll keep going for a couple more fields, and after that, we'll think about heading back. He was halfway across when he heard the scream. He turned in time to see Reese fall to the ground. He started running, but Greta reached the man first. Chester saw her swing the axe up, then down with a meaty thunk. By the time Chester reached him, she was pulling the axe from the skull of a zombie, missing both its legs, and which had been hidden beneath the collapsed crop. Finnegan! Greta! Eyes open. Check for more of them. Reese, you okay? Chester asked, bending to look at the man's leg. I'm fine, Reese said through gritted teeth. Yeah, you probably are. It's taken off a bit of skin, but not done much more than that. You'll have another nice scar to add to your collection. Any more zombies? This last was asked of Finnegan and Greta. No, I think we're alone, Greta said. What now? Finnegan asked. Do you think you can walk? Chester asked the injured man. I can try, Rhys said. That's a spirit, but let's stop the bleeding first. He pulled a small first aid kit out of his pack. Does it hurt as much as last time? He asked, 
as he tore the ragged trouser leg free and wrapped a bandage around the man's wound. Last time? Rhys asked. Yeah. The last time you were bitten? I've never... I mean, I haven't. You mean you don't know if you're immune? Chester asked. When he'd asked Tuck which people had the most experience of fighting the undead, he'd... he realized that he'd just assumed she'd given him the names of three people who were immune. Well, you haven't died yet, he said. That's a good sign. Your colour's good, and your temperature's fine. That's important, is it? Reese asked, with eager anxiety. Oh, yeah, Chester said, with as much confidence as he could manage. It wasn't much, but we need to get out of here. Finnegan, you take his weight. Chester pulled Reese to his feet. Greta, you keep an eye out behind us. We're looking for a farmhouse or anywhere else that's less exposed than here. And then what? Reese asked. We want a bike. A handcart will do in a pinch, but a bicycle would be better. It's about three miles back to the boat in a straight line, but we can't go back the same route, so call it five miles. We could walk that in an hour, run it in a lot less, but since you can't do either, we'd have to stop to fight any time we came across the undead. If we're lucky, we'll make a mile an hour, and that means we'll still be out here come nightfall, and you do not want to be wandering around outside after dark. At the end of the hop garden, and separating it from the next, was a track that led to another field, this one filled with weeds and the familiar sun-baked earth. There's a chimney, Finnegan said. Then that's where we're going. It was a farm with a house, two barns, and a collection of outbuildings. The closed gate was a welcome sight, but it opened with a grating screech that was echoed by a clattering rattle from somewhere around the back of the house. Stay here, Chester said, leaving them by the locked front door. A zombie wearing the ragged remains of a camouflage jacket and even more ragged red jeans staggered around the corner. Chester swung the mace sideways, smashing the creature's skull against a pebble-dashed wall. As the body collapsed, he listened, counting slowly to ten and then to twenty. He could hear nothing but Finnegan's feet shifting as he balanced the weight of the injured man. Chester forced the back door, gave each of the rooms a cursory glance, and then thumped a fist against the wall, twice. He counted to five. He still heard nothing. He let the other three in. In there, Chester pointed. Finnegan helped Reese into the front room, and dropped the injured man onto the sofa. Chester checked the house again, this time more thoroughly. Finally satisfied that they were alone, he returned to Reese, took off the bandage, and examined the wound. He looks good, he said. Really? Reese asked, sceptically. It's been an hour since you were bitten. I'd say you're going to be fine, though you won't walk for a while. Finnegan, Greta, we're going to check the barns and the outbuildings. Look for a bicycle, but keep your eyes open for a car, or a tractor, anything with an engine that can run on diesel. Surely there won't be any fuel left, Finnegan said. Probably not around here but there's some in the lifeboats, tanks. One of us can cycle there and bring it back. We'll only need a litre or so. They checked the barns and the outbuildings. There was no bicycle. There was no car. There wasn't even a tractor. All they found in a raised bed behind the farmhouse was a patch of rubbery pick-and-eat lettuce. Never liked lettuce, Greta said, and these are the leaves even the slugs rejected. But at least it's fresh. With that zombie wandering around here, you'd have to boil it up first. You ever eaten boiled lettuce? The farm was surrounded in parts by fence, in other parts by wall, and others by hedge. With the front gate closed, Chester felt sure that no undead could easily get in. They were back inside. Finnegan collapsed into a chair next to Reese, and Chester went into the kitchen. What are you looking for? Greta asked. Tea? Coffee? Beer? Anything that isn't water? All those ration bars. The cupboards were empty. Chester closed the last one. Right. So, someone came here and emptied the place, and they did a thorough job of it. There's the lettuce, Greta said. Shall I start a fire? There's plenty to burn, but we've only got the water we're carrying. We could clean it with bleach, I suppose, if you're that hungry. He bent down and pulled open the doors under the sink. The cupboard was bare. 
Or you could if they hadn't taken the bleach with them as well. So what do we do? she asked. Chester looked at the wall between the kitchen and the living room. Then he looked out the window. The shadows were lengthening. That's a good question. He went back into the living room. Here's the situation, he said. It's going to take four or five hours to walk back to the boat. Since it's unlikely we'd make it before nightfall, we might as well stay here rather than searching for a place in a couple of hours' time. I could run there, Finnegan said. I'll be back here before dark. Right, but what would that achieve? I suppose Nilda could come back with you, but I don't like the idea of leaving Jay alone on that boat, and I doubt she would either. They could go back to the tower and return with more people, but all they could do is help carry him. And what would we eat and drink while we're waiting for them? You could bring back some diesel, of course, but what would we do with it? No, a run to the boat would be nothing but exercise. I think I can make it, Reese said. The leg's not that bad, and five miles isn't far. Maybe, but it's not your decision, Chester said. It's our lives as well, and the safest thing right now is waiting for dawn. And by dawn you'll know whether it's for hobbling or three walking, Reese said. Nah, Chester said. You're immune. I'm almost certain of it. Over the last seven months you must have come into contact with the virus, albeit unwittingly. No, in fact, I am certain. I reckon everyone who's still alive is. Not that I advocate testing the theory. Now, as long as there's daylight, let's not waste it. See if you can find a map so we can plan out our route for tomorrow, and look for an address book. Maybe there's a fruit farm along the way. The address book was easily found, and it listed a number of properties nearby, but the names alone gave no indication of what they might find there. The more Chester thought on it, the more convinced he was that even had there been an entry for an orchard, they'd find it stripped clean. Whoever had come to this farm had so thoroughly removed everything of use that Chester couldn't imagine they'd have left any of the neighbouring properties untouched. He pulled a stack of recipe books from the kitchen shelf and took them into the front room, dropping them next to a chair as he fell into it. In my experience, survivors can be split into four groups, he said. You had people like Tuck who were in the enclaves and got out. There aren't many of them. Then there are the ones who survived the evacuation. There are even fewer of those. Then there are those who stayed at home. Either they couldn't go or they didn't want to. I take it you lot fall into that last camp. Not really, Greta said. I was on holiday. In London. Staying in one of the hotels. I wish... If I had, I might have got food. No, I was subletting a flat. One of those internet deals, you know? I tried lining up at the supermarket, but they said that without a TV license, they wouldn't give me anything. They didn't tell me what a TV license was, just that they couldn't trust that I hadn't already collected my food for the day. Whoever's bright idea that was, she trailed off. In order to survive, to eat I had to, she trailed off again. Well. If that was your compassionate society, then I wanted no part in it. I stayed in London because I wanted to go back home. And it would be easier to do that without being surrounded by millions of people in an enclave. I thought the zombies would stop after a week or two or four. And instead, she glanced down at Reese's leg and shrugged. And now, you're one of the last people left alive on earth, Finnegan said. His voice filled in unexpected sadness. And what about you? Chester asked Rhys, to fill the silence. Why didn't you trust the government? Did you ever meet our government? No, I was prepared. I knew something was going to happen, and it would all collapse. Not this, I mean. How could anyone expect this? But you remember what this country was like? How, if there was even a hint the fuel duty was going to rise, or the petrol stations would be pumped dry? How a few months of rain caused flooding which ruined half the farms. Or those riots, you remember them? The country was shut down for three days. I remember, Chester said. All those stories about farmers pulling together and helping one another out. I remember when there was rioting and the streets were on fire at night. How the shops still opened the next morning. 
That was calculated self-interest, Reese said, and I didn't have you down as a believer in the British spirit. Nah, I'm not. Jay reckons I'm a cynic, and I'm not that either. I've just seen enough to know that when you're cornered, when your back's to the wall, when you've no fight left, it's better to charge at the darkness and simply hope you'll live long enough to see the dawn. Well, that proves my point, doesn't it? Reese asked, wincing at a needle of pain from his leg. Looking back on all the things you told us that happened, and how and why they happened, if the country had hung together, then maybe not so many would have died alone in the dark. There was a long minute's uncomfortable silence, as no one could think of an argument to refute him. You said you were prepared, Greta asked. You mean you had food and things like that? I had a three-month supply, Rhys said. Is that all? she asked. Hardly. I had three years' worth in a cabin. Built it myself. Stocked it myself. So why aren't you there? The zombies. I stayed in London because, like you, Greta, I reckoned it would be easier to travel once the evacuation was complete. I did try to leave a couple of times, but the furthest I got was five miles from my house, and that took an entire day. And then Mathis found me. And now, he shrugged. Where's this cabin? Finnegan asked. Because three years' worth of supplies would... It's twenty miles north of Leg, Rhys said. In Scotland? Finnegan asked. Rhys nodded. It was an old croft, really. Four stone walls and no roof. I bought the land as part of a syndicate years ago. It was meant to be an investment. It turned out to be a con. I bought the others out and kept the land, built a roof, added a timber-framed second building. Wasn't meant to, of course. It was against the planning regulations, but no one cared. I mean, why would they? There was no electricity, no mains water, but there was a stream nearby. It was great for fishing. I could have lived there for a couple of years without having to go within a mile of another person, he sighed. And now it's gone. Yeah, whatever I was expecting, it wasn't ending up laying on a ragged sofa waiting to learn if I was going to turn into one of the living dead. I told you that you're going to be fine, Chester said as cheerfully as he could. Where do you think that is? he asked, searching for a different topic of conversation. I'm sorry? Greta asked. In that photo on the mantel, please. Do you think that's Morocco? Tunisia, maybe, Finnegan guessed. It's odd. There's only one picture. The family would have taken the rest with them, Chester said, either when they went on the evacuation or when they came back. How do you know they came back? Greta asked. And the state of the rooms upstairs, Chester said. Someone went through them, looking for specific things. Not just clothes, but keepsakes. Who else but the people who lived here? Judging by the kitchen, they stayed here for a night or two. If it was longer, they'd have made an attempt at washing up. Then, perhaps, when they realised that no other family members would return here, they left. Not long after that, someone else came along and took everything that was of any possible use. Food, soap, bleach. He picked up the television's remote control from the coffee table. The batteries. And the tractors, Finnegan asked. Possibly. More likely they were requisitioned, Chester said, picking up another book from the stack by his feet. Which means that we won't find anything at any other farms nearby. Doesn't it? Rhys asked. Probably not, Chester said. But the time when you could rely on finding canned food and half-empty packets is past. Though it's always worth looking. He put down the second book and picked up a third. Didn't any survivors from Kent reach Anglesey? Finnegan asked. Not that I can think of. I know I didn't come down this far. I don't think anyone did. London was in the way. Further west, you had the M4. That was full of the undead and formed a pretty decent barrier. Some people from Kent had to have made it out during the first weeks. But after that... Well, the people I met were more concerned with where they were going to than where they were coming from. He put down the book and picked up a fourth. What are you looking for? Greta asked. A recipe that involves hops, Chester said. There's got to be one. As the sun disappeared behind the newer of the two barns, he closed the last book, having found none. There was little point lighting a fire, 
so as darkness fell, one by one they went to sleep, except Chester. Flashes of the past came to him, of Cannock, of McKinnery, of his father, and of the life that he'd had. He searched through them for a single memory on which he could hang the prospect of a future. All he found was an understanding of the misery and despair he had wrought on others. His future lay before him, a mirror of the life he'd led, an echo where theft was sanctioned, violence required, and where there would be no respite except in death. Until he'd met Nilda, that hadn't bothered him. Now he felt there had to be something more, some purpose to it all, some point at which he could stop fighting and start to live. A recent memory of those days on the lifeboat travelling down from Hull came to mind. He and Nilda were too busy trying to stay afloat to call that time happy. Yet, the dry coughing rasp brought him to his feet. The room was dark, but he knew from where the sound came. He pulled out his knife. Race, he called softly. There was a heavy thump as something fell a short distance to the floor. Race, he called again, louder. He could see the man's outline. He could hear the scrabble of fingernails on carpet. He heard the wheeze as the last breath in the man's dead lungs was expelled. Oh, race, he sighed, with well-practiced regret. The only response he got was a violent thrashing of arms and legs as the zombie tried to stand. Chester kicked its legs aside and stamped his foot down on the creature's back. He dropped to a crouch, so his knee was at the back of its neck and raised the knife. I'm sorry, mate. I truly am. He stabbed down. Once. Did he? Was that? He turned, Finnegan asked, scrambling to his feet. He did, Chester said. It happens. But not to everyone, he added. Look at me, at Jay, at Nilda. Not everyone turns. It's important that you remember that. Wordlessly, they went into the kitchen to wait for dawn. Chapter 8 19th of September The sun's coming up, Chester said, nodding towards the window. By the faint light of the new day, the farmhouse kitchen had lost its quaint charm. Now it appeared as a dingy shadow of its former self. Those shelves... Greta said. They'll never be full again. I'm sorry, Chester murmured, standing, stretching. It's the same everywhere, isn't it? It's more than likely we'll be the last people to ever set foot in here. Think of all the houses all across the world, and the time and love that went turning them into homes. It was all for nothing. Maybe, Chester said, but I find it's best not to think about that. Certainly not first thing in the morning. Save those thoughts for next week or next month, when you're safe behind thick walls and outside of a hot meal, with the knowledge that a new day will bring nothing more than gruelling toil. If that day ever comes, Finnegan said. And what do we do now? We go back to the boat, Chester said. Then head back along the coast. We'll go ashore anywhere we can and gather what food we find. But this time we'll stick to the places where we can smell the sea, even if we can't see it. I'll head to Anglesey as soon as we get back. There's a grim job ahead. For me, I mean, he added. And I've put it off for long enough. Get your gear. And Rhys? Greta asked. What about him? We can't just leave him, she said. We can't afford the time to bury him, Chester said. There's no reason for us to return here, and like you said, little chance anyone else will. Give it a few years, and this house will collapse. That's a better tomb than most of us get. There were two zombies near the main gates. I'll deal with, Chester began, but Finnegan and Greta pushed past him, the man moving to the left, the woman to the right, raising their axes as they stalked towards the undead. Almost simultaneously the blades came down, and the zombies fell. Greta remembered to twist her blade with the cut. 
Finnegan didn't, and he had to stamp on the twice-dead creature's face to retrieve it. Chester said nothing as he opened the gate, but he made a point of closing it behind him. He looked back at the house. He'd spent many nights sitting up with people who'd been bitten, and he'd known many of those far longer than the few days he'd known Reese. Yet the man's death seemed somehow significant. It felt almost like the end of something. He shook away the thought. The sea is that way, he said, starting off at a brisk clip. They'd barely gone two hundred yards before they saw a pair of zombies on the road ahead. Same as before. I've got the left, Finnegan began. Greta, you— No, Chester interrupted. Look behind him. There's another three coming. We can deal with five, Finnegan said. Yeah, but they either followed us or heard us, and it doesn't matter which. Five, there means more behind. If we stick to this road, we'll have to fight the whole way back. That's fine by me, Greta said. We'll kill them all, every last one of them. Save that rage when you need it. Don't think of them as an enemy that can be defeated. Think of them as vermin, too numerous to exterminate. You have to learn to live with them and hope you outlast them. We'll go back and try one of the roads to the east of that farmhouse. But when they got back to the farm, they saw a small pack of the living dead approaching from the other direction. They were left with no other choice but to head south through one of the fields of hops, then down a track and to a lane. The hedgerows on either side already half collapsing to fill the narrow thoroughfare. The sun was rising high when they finally smelled the sea air and found the footpath with the wooden cross Chester had carved into the planking the day before. Almost there, he said, trying to buoy his own spirits as much as those of the other two. The mace was growing heavy. He'd used it frequently during the long morning's trek. They stopped six hundred yards from the raft. It was surrounded by the undead. The lifeboat was gone. Where are they? Greta asked. It's probably the tides, Chester whispered. They'll be back. Do we fight? Finnegan asked. There's at least twenty of them. To do it safely, we'd have to lure them towards us, get them to spread out. It would take us half an hour at least, probably longer. And then what? I'm not sure it would be safe to take the raft. It's hard to tell, but I think the tide would pull us out to sea. How much water have you got left? A mouthful, Greta said. A couple of inches, Finnegan said. That's not enough, Chester said. No, it's too much of a risk. We stay on land and keep heading west, back to London. On foot? Finnegan asked. It's taken us nearly five hours to travel three miles. We'll find bicycles, but we won't find them here. Chester swallowed a mouthful of core and crunched down on a pip. The taste was bitter, familiar, and wonderful. Finnegan took out the map. Where do you reckon we are? he asked. Somewhere east of the Downs? Chester guessed. I meant this farm. If we came back, do you reckon we can carry all this fruit to the boat? I think so, Greta said, pointing at the map. I'd say we are ten miles from the coast, and no more than fifteen. If it wasn't for the zombies, I'd say yes, Chester said. I'd say that if everyone in the tower helped, and if we all used bikes, or since this is a fantasy, why not say a tractor or three, then yeah, we could manage it. And there would be enough to keep us and the pigs happy until the end of winter. But in this reality, we've got no tractor, and there are just too many undead. He stood, stretched, and pulled another pear from the tree. He took a bite and looked left, right, forward, and back. The road was invisible. All he could see in any direction were trees, some still laden with fruit, the ground about them littered with more. They'd found a bicycle in the garden of a house two miles from where they'd left the raft. Taking it in turns for one to ride and scout ahead, they'd had advanced warning of the roads blocked by the undead, so had to backtrack less. The other two bikes were found an hour later, and the pear farm soon after that. We're not going to make it back to London tonight, Finnegan said, voicing what Chester had been thinking. No, he said. We'll fill the bags. The fruit will do us for food and water. Twelve each per day should be about right. He was about to take another bite when a wasp landed on his hand. He watched it crawl over his hand towards a spot of juice and then fly up and onto the pear. Carefully, slowly, he put it down on the ground. Wouldn't Alma fly, Greta said, with an attempt at a smile. 
Not when I don't have to, Chester said. Not any more. On two wheels, they made better time. When they found the way blocked by the undead, sometimes they fought, sometimes they fled, and sometimes they cycled straight through them. The choice often wasn't theirs. The frequent storms and recent rain had washed the soil off many fields. The narrow roads were often coated in a layer of mud too thick to cycle through. Minutes became hours, and their progress took them south as much as east. I think those are carrots, Finnegan suddenly yelled. Before Chester had time to break, the other man had dropped his bike and climbed into a field. He reached down and wrenched at a patch of leaves, coming up with a handful of small, stunted, bug-eaten stumps that were coated with black and white mould. No one spoke as Finnegan climbed back over the fence, picked up his bike, and set off, faster than before. You see that? Greta said, pointing at a sweeping field of green and amber. I reckon that's Bali. Could be wheat or oats, but whatever it was, the zombies beat us to it, Chester said, sparing a glance on the road to watch the undead tramp their way through a golden field whose edges were already choked with weeds. The further they got from the coast, the more fields they saw with crops still in them. The barley was replaced with rapeseed and then with lavender, all reminders that not all that was grown was meant for food and that which was they had no way of gathering. Hives, Finnegan said. Chester nodded. He'd seen them too. No one suggested they stop. All right, that's it, Chester said, bringing his bike to a halt. What? Greta asked. Chester pointed at a cluster of steel chimneys sticking up beyond a distant hill. That. I don't know what it is, but this road leads straight there. I don't fancy going through it, so we'll have to go around and that can wait until tomorrow. He gestured towards a paddock. We'll try over that way and see if we can find a house or barn or anything with a roof to keep out the rain and walls to keep out the undead. People have been here, Greta said when they were halfway across the paddock. They might have, Chester said. No, I mean they definitely have been, she said. Look at that tree. It doesn't look any different to the others. Then look at the hedge, Greta said. What for? Chester asked. Just tell me, I'm too tired to guess. There's no blackberries, she said, and there's no fruit on that tree. It looks like a horse chestnut, Chester said. Look at the leaves. They're the same as the one in the orchard. It's a pear tree. Chester squinted. The leaves were green. That was about as detailed a description as he felt confident to give. Then the birds beat us to it. All the insects, he said. Or more likely you're wrong about what type of tree it is. I'm not, Greta said. She'd gone a little ahead and was bent low over a ditch just beyond the tree. Come and see. They did. That, she said, pointing at a rotting pear, is a bite mark. So either the zombies are developing a healthier diet, or there are people nearby. People who stripped those bushes and this tree. Yeah, Chester peered at the decaying fruit. About a week ago? Less. Not today, though, he murmured. Then he straightened, looked down the lane, and then at the fields. Right, yeah. So, the other two looked at him, expectantly. People, Chester said slowly. Enough of them to collect the fruit from the bushes. That's something. It's not just survival. That's actually living. And, Finnegan prompted, and what? Well... Do we look for them? Chester laughed. Of course. It was easier said than done. There were no footprints to follow, no beckoning plumes of smoke to head towards. Beyond the field was a lane, and they followed it simply because they'd seen no signs of life in the direction they'd come. After they'd passed another paddock, the lane branched. They went left until they reached a crossroads and followed a path up a hill. It's getting late, Chester said. We're tired. We need to stop. And at least we know that those homes are empty. He pointed down the hill at a housing estate still under construction. The houses to the right of the graded but unpaved road had roofs, and most had doors. The ones to the left were just skeleton frames. Closer to the road, there was nothing more than string markers indicating where the properties were to have been built. They just passed the first of those string-marked plots, 
when a zombie staggered out of one of the gaping doorways. It snarled as it lumbered forward and fell straight down into the hole dug for the next house's foundations. Chester tried to laugh, but all he managed was a weary sigh. Slowly, he trudged up the road. You want me to finish it? Finnegan asked. Chester looked down into the hole. The creature was rolling back and forth, its legs churning the shallow puddle into muddy froth. Leave it. We'll try over there, he said, pointing towards the finished houses. He doubted it was alone, and had that suspicion confirmed when another zombie stumbled out from behind a vacant house. Whose turn is it? Greta asked, sounding as exhausted as Chester felt. I'll do it, Chester said dropping his bicycle to the ground. He unslung the mace and noticed the strap was getting frayed. Focus, he told himself. The zombie was wearing camouflage, and not the off-colour variety sold in surplus stores. Grunting with tiredness, he swung the mace low, breaking the creature's knee. He skipped back a pace as it fell forward, brought the mace up again and smashed it down. It took two blows before the creature stopped moving. He took out his long hunting knife and prodded around the zombie's collar. What are you doing? Greta asked. Checking for ID, he said. And there isn't any. This wasn't a soldier. Is that important? she asked. I don't know. There's another, Finnegan said. I've got this one. He lumbered forward axe half-raised, swinging it in a lazy stroke that missed the creature's head and sliced across its chest. The zombie's hands swiped out. Finnegan swung a hasty backhand, smashing the flat of the blade into the zombie's face as its other clawing hand raked down on his arm. He kicked the creature in the leg, but there was little force to the blow. The zombie rocked back and then Greta was there, punching her axe into its skull. You all right? Chester asked his eyes on the blood beading up from the wheels on the man's arm. Just a scratch, Finnegan said, with an attempt at nonchalance. Three scratches, boy, the look of it. Chester nodded. The words of comfort that sprang to his lips seemed trite after Reese's death, so he said nothing. The next zombie they saw was wearing the many-layered, stained and torn clothing of an evacuee, and it was already dead. So was the next, and the one after that, as they moved further into the construction site, Chester realised they were following a trail of bodies, all leading to the more finished properties furthest from the road. I think we found who was harvesting that food, Chester said, looking at the pile of the twice dead around the front door of a house at the far edge of the estate. That one's been shot, Greta said, pointing. And that one. You two stay here, Chester said. What for? Greta asked. In case there's a zombie in the back garden, then I'll do it, Finnegan said, pushing past Chester to the gate. He kicked it open and ran inside. There's nothing here, he called out. The back garden was empty. The house wasn't, though its sole occupant was dead. They stood in the kitchen looking down at the body slumped in the chair. Chester picked up the nine-millimeter pistol from where it had dropped out of the woman's hand and ejected the magazine. Empty. She really did save the last bullet for herself. He took out his knife and prized back the collar, and she was military. Derry, he says her name was. There's no food here, Finnegan said, looking in the cupboards. They checked the other rooms in the house. They were much the same. This isn't where she lived, Greta said. I think she led the zombies here. Do you think she knew she was dying? A trail of blood led from the door to a savage wound on the soldier's leg, where it joined a pool that had dripped from a ragged gash in her arm. Must have, Chester said. Then if you don't mind, Finnegan said, wrapping a hasty bandage around his arm. If she led the undead here from where she lived, I'd like to find out where that was, while I still have time. At the back of the building site was a bridle path. They wheeled their bicycles along it in silence, Finnegan in the lead. Greta following close behind. Chester watched the two, his mood darkening. Reese had died and Finnegan would probably be dead soon. He couldn't help but feel that he'd condemned them both by not leaving for Anglesey as soon as they'd returned from the British Museum. He tried telling himself that they could have died anyway, 
but by rigging that ballot and not letting Chance choose his companions, he'd marked them for death. And all for what, he muttered. All for... Chester, look at this, Finnegan called. They'd stopped at a wooden stile. On the field side were a trio of wooden doors. Front doors, judging by the brass number 17 still stuck to one. A trench had been dug into the ground, into which the doors had been placed, and cement had then been poured. And look at the field, Greta said. The hedge has been reinforced. Can you see the wire? And the poles? They're not poles. They're pipes, Chester said. But they are reinforcing the hedge, she said. That's to keep the zombies out. It has to be. Then, Finnegan said, it looks like we're on the right track. What? Don't I even get a sympathy laugh for that? He unslung his axe and stuck it in the gap between the doors. What are you doing? Greta asked. Trying, Finnegan said as he levered them apart, to see what's inside. Polytunnels, lots of them. Different types, too. Oh, very promising, Chester said. You want to stay in there tonight? It'll be as secure as anywhere else. We keep going, Finnegan said. It can't be far. What can't? Greta asked. Finnegan had already started wheeling his bike along the path. The town, he said. Think about how much effort went into this. It must have taken hundreds of people. Maybe thousands. They must be around here somewhere. Yeah, Chester murmured, which was as close to a word of encouragement as he could manage. Finnegan was right. The work would have taken a large community. So where was the smoke from the cooking fires? Where were the people tending the crops? That the soldier Derry had saved the last bullet for herself gave the answer to that. The track ended at the crest of a hill. Beyond was a sloping paddock filled with a multicoloured patchwork of yellow and purple flowers. At the bottom of the hill was a twelve-foot-high wall topped with spikes. Behind that, Chester could see rows of neatly dug trenches, haphazard trellises and jury-rigged greenhouses, all filled with leaves and occasional patches of colour. The only place that hadn't been planted was the almost circular swimming pool next to what could best be described as a mansion. It was a three-storey building, shaped almost like a figure eight, with a long, one-storey extension stretching out towards the pool. The style might have been called Spanish, but only by someone who'd never ventured further south than Dover. On the roof of the long extension, painted in red, was the word, Help. To the right of the paddock was a road that led to a wide sheet metal gate in the wall. From their vantage point, Chester could see the long curving driveway that led up to the house, but on the road side of the gate were the undead. Why count fifteen? Finnegan said. Yep, Chester agreed. I'm going down there, Finnegan added. Why? Greta asked. It looks deserted. It might not be, but it doesn't matter if it is, Finnegan said. This is probably as far as I go. I don't want to die in a farmhouse, surrounded by nothing but your pity. No, I want my death to have a purpose. You saw those fields? There's enough food there to keep everyone in the tower alive for months, maybe years. That's what we came for. We found it. Now we have to get rid of the undead. But how do we get the food back to... She began. Finnegan cut her off. That's your problem. I'm going. Chester nodded to himself. The man has a point. He took out his revolver and checked it was loaded. I'm going as well. Greta, you should stay here. How many shots does that thing have? She asked. Six. So that'll leave three each. Those are good odds. And before either Chester or Finnegan could argue, she'd started down the hill. They were fifty feet away when the zombie at the rear of the pack turned slowly around and staggered towards them. The three of them stopped. Chester hated this part, the waiting. It seemed, of late, life had become nothing but. The creature got closer. Behind it, another two had turned from the gate and were making their slow, slouching way towards this new prey. Were they slower than usual, Chester wondered, or was that his imagination? 
He tried to rid his mind of unnecessary questions and keep focused on the undead getting closer, 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 close enough. He darted forward, using his left hand to bat the creature's arm out of the way as he punched the mace at its head. It fell. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Finnegan move towards them. No, let them come to us, Chester called. There were five, no, six, now eight. Now, Finnegan, the one in green. Greta, that one without the face. And Chester ran forward, twisting into the strike as he hacked at a zombie between those two. It was a solid hit. The creature flew up and back. Chester kept running, changing his grip, shifting his weight. So just as the zombie hit the ground, he stamped his heel down on its face. He felt the rotten bone disintegrate beneath his foot. But momentum kept it pressing down, and it kept him moving straight into the pack beyond. He swung left, right, up, down, slashing wildly with the mace, grabbing with his free hand, hauling the zombies off balance. He was surrounded. Everywhere he looked, he saw nothing but dead eyes, peeling skin, exposed bone, rotting hair, and gaping wounds, oozing that inhuman red-brown pus. He could hear nothing but the snap of teeth, the crunch of breaking bone, and the dry wheeze as decaying lungs involuntarily sucked air in through ruined mouths. No, there was something else. Someone was screaming. He realized it was him. Chester slammed the mace into a skull and lost his grip on the gore-slick handle. It fell as hands pawed at his clothing and clawed at his neck. He had the hunting knife free and slashed low and high, all sense and reason gone. Chester! The word cut through him, and he saw it was Finnegan's face in front. He turned the blow just in time, his left hand grabbing the man's coat, pulling him out of the reach of a snapping mouth. Chester turned the missed blow into a downward stab, the knife impaling the creature's brain. The blade stuck, fists raised, determined he'd die fighting and almost relishing the prospect. He looked for the next opponent, but there were only three figures still standing, not counting himself. Greta walked over to the last of the undead, still pouring ineffectually at the mansion's metal gate. She swung the axe up one last time. It collapsed without ever having turned around. Finnegan looked around, checking the zombies were truly dead before turning to Chester. What the hell, he managed before shaking his head. That was meant to be my last stand, not yours. Chester tried to think of a retort. He couldn't. What exactly did you do before the outbreak? Greta asked. This and that, Chester managed. He bent, retrieved his knife, and then kicked at the corpses until he found his mace. It needed cleaning. He looked down at his hands, his clothes. He needed cleaning. He looked at Finnegan and Greta. So did they. Shall we go inside? Finnegan suggested. Chester nodded. As he approached the gate, he saw that it wasn't made of sheet metal, but was a set of retractable railings that could slide back into the wall itself. Onto it, and presumably preventing it from ever being opened, flattened pieces of metal had been welded, bolted, or otherwise attached. We won't get this open, Greta said. But they would have left themselves a way out, Finnegan said. And a way out can also be a way... He trailed off. What? Greta asked. People? Finnegan gestured through a gap in the reinforced sections. Chester moved closely so that he could see. There were two figures, a man and a girl. She can't be more than nine, Greta said with disbelief. Hello, she added, calling out to the two figures. Hello, the man said, and he sounded as tired as Chester felt. He stopped six yards from the gate, a hand on the girl's shoulder. I'm Greta. This is Chester. And Finnegan. Eamon, Finnegan corrected her. Really? she asked, turning to look at Finnegan. Where are you from? the man asked. Anglesey, Greta said, by way of the Tower of London. We were out looking for farms, orchards, anywhere with food that we could harvest. You came here on foot? the man asked. We came along the coast by boat. Greta said. There were too many undead to get back to it. So now we're going across country. Oh, the man said. They all waited, 
The silence stretched, but he didn't say anything more. Where's Anglesey? the girl asked. It's an island off the north coast of Wales, Finnegan said. Not America? the girl asked, disappointed. Were you expecting people from the US to come here? Finnegan asked. Not really, she replied. But we were expecting someone to come. We have been since March. And we're the first people you've seen? Chester asked. The man didn't say anything, but the girl nodded. Lots of people leave, she said. But you're the first to arrive. Chester? Greta asked, the unspoken question, obvious. We'll be going back to London tomorrow, he said. And you can come with us and wait there for a boat from Wales. They have electricity and people from all over the world. It's safe there, or safer than anywhere else. He'd said those words a dozen times since the outbreak, always with a sense that the journey was at least half done. This time, they came out flat. That sounds like a lot of people, the man said. Chester waited, but the man didn't say anything more. Well, look, as I say, we'll be going back tomorrow, Chester said slowly. He could feel tiredness overtaking him. But we need a place to sleep tonight. Will you let us in? We could, the girl said. How did you find us? The man asked. Pure accident, Finnegan said. The man nodded to himself, thinking. What about became clear with his next question. What's the catch? He asked. Catch? Chester asked. The con? The angle? We haven't seen anyone new for months. No planes? No signs of life? Then you show up with talk of electricity on an island hundreds of miles away. It's real, Greta said. It really is. We're not here to rob you, Chester said. If you don't let us in, we'll go, but we'll have to go and we won't come back. I doubt anyone ever will. You'll be here on your own, just the two of you. He waved a gory hand at the undead, littering the ground behind them. It's your choice. Oh, please, the girl pled. We should let them in before the monsters come back. Fine, the man relented, but he didn't seem happy about it. He disappeared behind the high wall, appearing again a few seconds later near the top. He lowered a ladder over the side. They climbed up. Chester's first impression was of chaos, but then he saw the order and pattern behind it all. The vast lawn had been dug up, subdivided and planted. Some of those plots still had plants growing in them though in many they were wilting, dying now that the warmth had gone from the year. Others had been dug over or covered with planking or plastic in preparation for a spring planting. Many more had been left uncovered with small mounds of stems piled to rot in one corner. It would have taken a lot more than the effort of a man and a child to complete this labour, let alone that in those reinforced fields nearby. He remembered the dead soldier, Derry, how many more had once called this mansion their refuge? Was this your house? Chester asked the man. Not on my salary. Leave your weapons by the wall, he said, adding a heartbeat too late, if you don't mind. Of course, Chester said, laying the gore-covered mace and bloody knife by the wall, and as he straightened, he half turned so the man wouldn't notice when he checked the revolver was still secure in his pocket. It's a guitar, the girl said. I'm sorry, Greta asked, laying her axe down. She means the house. It's built like a guitar, the man said. Or oh, that's what it was meant to look like from the air. It was a rock star's mansion. The swimming pool is meant to be a musical note. Huh, Chester grunted. Meetings like this were always awkward, but he didn't have the energy for the bluff bluster he usually employed. So, what's your name? Greta asked the girl. Janine, and this is Detective Inspector James Stiles, Janine said with obvious pride. Really? Chester asked, giving the man a closer inspection. Where were you based? London, Stiles said. The Met? Huh, Chester grunted. He looked over at Finnegan and noticed the man was leaning up against the wall. We could do with somewhere to wash and some spare clothes if you've got them. We use the pump house down the pool for washing, Stiles said, and we'll see about clothes. They're army clothes, Janine said. Really? Chester asked. It's a long story, Stiles said. I'll tell you over dinner. 
Come on, Janine. He turned and led the girl back to the house. That was odd, Retta said. Yeah, I bet. Do we leave the weapons here? Finnegan asked. We do. He's no threat. So we might as well be polite, Chester said. I'm not sure why we should when he didn't even thank us for saving him, Greta said. Yeah, well, people are like that, Chester muttered, his mind already elsewhere. He didn't recognize Styles. he was sure of that. Not that that meant anything in itself, but he would be the first police officer that Chester had met since February, who'd actually admitted to have been in the force. After the implementation of martial law and their involvement in the evacuation, any who had made it to Anglesey had wisely kept quiet about it. How's your arm? Greta asked Finnegan. Stings a bit, he said. What do you think my chances are? he asked Chester. You've not been bitten before? No? Then I'd say it's fifty-fifty the infection got inside. If it has, you've a ten percent chance of turning. Bad low. I thought anyone who survived this far must have been exposed to the virus schools of times, and so had to be immune. Reese gave the lie to that. They washed, mostly with bleach, and entirely in silence. Styles brought them clean clothes. They were, as Janine had said, military uniforms. You said there was a story behind these, Chester asked. It's pretty much the same as a story behind this place and us, Styles replied. I'll tell you about it after you've met everyone else. After that, you can have dinner. There are more of you, Greta asked. Get dressed and come and see. Up the path there. That leads to the front door. He looked the three of them over one more time, and was on the verge of saying something else, but he just gave a rueful shake of his head and walked away. I'm not sure I should go inside, Finnegan said as they walked up a path lined with green-veined marble. In case, well, you know. Chester patted his pocket. I've got the revolver, if it's necessary. He glanced at the house. Honestly, I don't know what's going on here, but whatever it is, I'd rather you were there when we go inside. Ready? Chester pushed the door open and stepped into a vestibule, with a huge glass window stretching five metres high and just as wide. The setting sun was on the other side of the house, so it let in little light, but there was more than enough to make out each of the faces staring at the three newcomers. Some sat on the stairs, some on the floor, others stood half hidden in the doorways, leading off left and right. Chester swallowed. How many? he asked, the words coming out gruff, hoarse. Forty-three, Stiles said. Janine's the oldest. Marco's the youngest. He's five. The man gestured towards a tousle-haired boy, barely visible behind a circular bronze statue. And you? You're the only adult? Greta asked. There were more. They left, looking for help, or just looking to get away. Leaving their children behind? she asked. Those with kids were among the first to leave. No, this lot all came from a boarding school, down near Sevenoaks. They were brought to the enclave, and that, as I said, is a long story. You'll want to eat. Hi, Finnegan said, waving. The children watched him warily. They didn't look scared. The expressions were far worse. They looked resigned, as if all possible disappointments had already been visited upon them. We've come from the Tower of London, Finnegan said. We're going to take you back with us. Then a boat will come to take you to an island in Wales. They have electricity and lots of food. You're going to be safe. It really is going to be okay. The children looked at him blankly, then at the inspector. They said it better than I could, Stiles murmured. The food's waiting. He led them into a long room with a view of the garden. Dinner was a soup, so thick that it almost qualified for being called vegetables boiled in sauce. Do you have a radio? Stiles asked, almost before Chester had sat down. No, sorry. No way of communicating with these people in Wales? No. But you mentioned a boat. A lifeboat, Chester said. It dropped us off. We'll go back to London and arrange a point somewhere near the coast. There'll be room for all the kids. If we can get to the coast... Styles said, walking over to an empty bar in the corner of the room. He opened a drawer and took out a packet of cigarettes. My last pack, he said. I was keeping it for... 
I don't know. Not this. Thousands of people, you say? About ten thousand, more or less, Chester said. Probably a bit less. Some people arrive, and then they leave again. They go out searching for their families, or... And no one mentioned us, Stiles interrupted. We didn't know you were here, no, Chester said. Would you? Should you? I mean, could people have been sent from there and just not arrived? If someone reached Anglesey with the news that there was a farm filled with children, help would have been sent, Chester said. It's the same in London, Greta added. If we'd known, we would have come. Finnegan nodded in agreement. Chester wondered if it was true. He was sure Tuck and Jay would have made the effort, but would anyone else? So no one made it? Well, I suppose I already knew that, Stiles murmured, tapping the pack on the counter. Eat, please. It's getting cold. Finnegan did. Greta took a polite mouthful. Chester just looked at Stiles. How many were here, originally? he asked. Originally? No one, Stiles said. The place was empty when we arrived, but there were seven hundred and eighty-eight of us when we left the enclave. Men, women, children, families and orphans, soldiers and civilians. Now it's just me and the kids. Everyone else went looking for help, and none of them made it. I'm sorry, Chester said. The man gave a brittle laugh. Ten thousand in Wales, you say? How many in London? Fifty, Greta said. Fifty thousand? Stiles asked. Well, that's something. No, just fifty, Greta corrected him. Oh, I see. And what about everywhere else? What about America? The kids kept thinking they'd send help. That was Amy's fault. She kept saying that their aircraft carriers wouldn't be destroyed, that they'd be the first to get back on their feet, you know. He tapped the box on the table again. I buried her last month. It wasn't the undead. It was a fever. She wasn't the first. A lot of people died, but most left, looking for help. And you're sure none of them made it? Chester sat back, his appetite gone. Not that I know of. You didn't live around here? Greta asked. Me? No. I was on holiday. In Tankerton, you know it? It's a little seaside place on the north coast. Or was. An off-season break. That was my plan. Something to look forward to as a way of getting through the winter. So I was there when they decided to turn it into an enclave. They planned for it to be a stopover point for ships going between the Isle of Wight and London. Plans and ideas. They had a lot of those, and they didn't last long. A ship came in. I don't think it was one of ours. It shelled the village. We took shelter. I'd been given charge of the children. They'd come from a boarding school, did I tell you that? Their teachers didn't come with them. I don't know if that was by choice or accident or even design. It doesn't matter, does it? I was an adult without responsibilities, and they were children in need of supervision. We hid from the shelling. I don't know how long it went on for, but it seemed he tore the film off the pack. I don't know. When it stopped, when we went outside and looked around to see who was left... There were fewer than a thousand of us. That's a small fraction of the number that'd been there before. There were no plans then. A lot of people ran. The rest of us followed the screaming, sorting through the wreckage, trying to find survivors. We were making a bad job of a worse situation when Corporal Derry arrived. She told us about the nuclear bombs that'd been dropped along the south coast, how the government had collapsed, and how it was everyone for themselves. More people left, but she stayed. Her and the soldiers with her. We found her, Chester said. She was dead. In an empty house on a construction site. About a mile from here. Yeah, I thought she would be, Sarl said, emotionless. She left last week, and was the last to go. We'd had more deaths as we tried to bring in the harvest. And then, well, then it was just me. Her and the kids. The zombies were getting thicker around the gates. She tried to lead them away. When she didn't return, I guessed what had happened. A few more days, that's all we needed. If we could have harvested the rest of the food, we'd have had enough to last until spring. We could have stayed inside, safe, waiting for the snow. And then, for the thaw. 
and then he trailed off again. The people who left, Chester asked. Did they go on foot? They drove and we had fuel. They took the bicycles when we ran out. After that, they walked. Always going west? Chester asked. We knew there was nothing to the south, east or north. West was all that was left. Everyone promised they'd send help if they found a larger group, or come back if they found a smaller one. They never did. Around June, after we'd stripped all the houses nearby of everything that could be of use, they did stop leaving for a while. I think people really did understand that this, here, was all they had. Then the undead came, and in greater numbers than we'd seen before. We lost a lot of people fighting them off, and a lot more got sick afterwards. That's when people started leaving again. But this time, no one promised to come back. They just disappeared in the night, never saying goodbye. So there are no cars left? Chester asked. There are a couple of coaches, Stiles said. The same ones we drove the kids here in. They were both full when we arrived, he added. But there's no fuel. No, we've got food here. We've got a well. Staying isn't safe. The undead come. You saw that for yourself. But it's safer than trying to leave. We won't starve, so we'll wait. We can outlast the undead. And what if a horde comes? Chester asked. You haven't seen one of those. Millions of undead trampling through the countryside, destroying everything in their path. The only safe places are islands or cities. The buildings act like breakwaters, splitting them up. Like you said, we've not seen one yet. There haven't been many zombies around here until recently. Thirty-eight was the most we saw in a day, and that was about the same time as the sickness came. I'll take my chances that no horde will ever come this far south over the certain death that the children will face if they try walking to the coast. Eat your meal. Sleep. Leave tomorrow if you want. I'd rather you stayed because the children need your help, but it's your choice. Excuse me. He stood up and left the three of them alone. Chester took a mouthful of the soup. It was good, but he had no appetite. What about helicopters? Finnegan asked. Could they fly them down from Anglesey? To here? I've no idea if they would have the range, Chester said. We can't leave the children alone, Greta said. They've survived okay for all these months, Finnegan said. They can last a few more weeks. They won't, Chester said. And they haven't. There's only forty-four of them left. And you know how they managed it? You heard what he said. The undead appeared when people stopped leaving. Just think about it. All those hundreds of people leaving every other day or so, and all heading west. They lured the zombies away. Now there's no one left to make that unwitting sacrifice. The undead will come back. They'll gather at the walls, their numbers will grow, until the gates break. And then every last one of those children will die. Then we have to get them out, Greta said. Yeah. We do, Chester said. He was thinking about Anglesey, and how so few children had reached the sanctuary there, of how Jay was the youngest of the survivors in London. He remembered the airport, and all those tiny undead creatures tripping and staggering along the runway. And we'll do it the only way we can. We'll drive one of those coaches to the coast, load them onto the lifeboat, then get Anglesey to send help. They will, for children. I guarantee that. He said there was no fuel, Greta said. So I'll go back to London. We'll bring the boat back to somewhere along the coast, and I'll return here with enough diesel for us to drive to the sea. There. That's a simple enough plan. You two can stay here. And well, you don't need me to tell you what to do. Excuse me. And he left the room, going outside to look for Styles. He found the man in a battered deck chair a quarter way through the pack of cigarettes, the butts lying amidst a thin pile of ash at his feet. Smoke, he offered the pack to Chester, who took one. I'm going to leave tomorrow, Chester said, and come back with enough diesel to drive those kids to the coast. We'll rendezvous with the boat and take them to London, then to Wales. Really, 
Styles sounded distant. Gresha and Finnegan are solid, reliable. They'll help you with the kids. You know, Styles said, dropping the half-smoked cigarette to the floor. You're not the first person to have said that. He took another from the pack. It's what everyone says. They'll leave, but they'll come back, and when they do, everything will be fine. He took out a battered silver lighter. But where are they now? You want a light? No, I think I'll keep this. The last one. I'll give it back to you when we get to London. Ha, I see. You're of a metaphorical frame of mind. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. This garden is what humanity has been reduced to. Our Eden has become purgatory. A... James? It was Janine. She'd come from inside the house. It's Marco, she said. He's having nightmares again. Styles took a long look at the unlit cigarette, then put it away and stood up. I know my duty, he said. Look around and tell me you know yours. He went back into the house. Chester took a walk through the grounds, looking at the plants, then at the trees and the greenhouses. Most of those were sheets of glass propped against frames improvised from shelving units. From the uniformity of the brackets, he wondered whether they'd all come from one of those self-assembly furniture stores. Of course, it didn't matter. He picked a path between the beds until he reached the rear of the house and found the two coaches. After a brief examination, he decided both were drivable, though the tyres were tending towards flat. It was thirty miles to the coast in a straight line. Two gallons of diesel would be all they'd need. Call it forty miles and three gallons to be safe. He gave one of the tyres a kick. A drop of rain fell from the sky, then another. He took that as a sign and went to join Greta and Finnegan in the small building near the pool. Chapter 9 20th of September When morning came, Finnegan was still alive. Out of the three of them, he was the one who seemed most surprised. It should take a day to get back to London, Chester said, standing by the ladder leaning against the wall. So give me two, and another two to return. And if you're not back in four days, Greta asked. You'll have to use your best judgment, Chester said. There's a raft back on that beach, or maybe you could try to find fuel for those coaches. I don't think you can stay here. You feel that chill in the air? You saw the rain last night? The weather's changing, and it's going to get worse. If I don't make it, I can't imagine anyone else ever stumbling across this place. Don't worry about us, Finnegan said. We've got the easy job. Yeah, all right. He supposed he should talk to Greta alone, but Tack seemed out of place. It's been well over twelve hours. You should be fine. On the other hand, I thought Reese was going to be fine. Keep an eye on him, he added to Greta. Just in case, they both nodded. Right. So, if all goes well, he added, speaking quickly to brush over the awkward moment. Be ready to leave in four days. You'll be coming back by bike? Greta asked. Possibly. If I see a car somewhere by the Thames, then perhaps we'll drive. But, however we get here, we'll want to leave straight away, right? Any questions? No. He flexed his arms and then his legs. He taped thin strips of hard plastic taken from the window blinds in the solarium to the inside of his jacket. They made movement more difficult, but his mind was on the journey over the QE2 bridge. Well, good luck. He turned and climbed over the wall. He made no attempt to keep quiet as he set off. In fact, he did the opposite, walking slowly, whistling loudly, he wheeled the bike to the junction, and then waited, watching the undead. When the nearest was close enough that he could discern its lank strands of hair drifting with the wind, he pushed off. Occasionally, checking to make sure the undead were following, he rode away from the mansion. There were twenty-five of the creatures immediately behind him when he stopped on a rise a quarter of a mile from the walled house. His eyes tracked back to the mansion and he caught sight of the word help painted on the roof of the one-story extension. He not asked when Stiles had done that. He looked up. Didn't Anglesey have three satellites, 
two for monitoring the hoard, and one to survey the country. Or was it the other way round? It didn't matter. He'd seen signs like that before on more empty houses than he could remember. Even if the satellite was overhead, even if it saw that sign, no one would assume it meant there was life inside. He took one last look at the house. Does sort of look like a guitar, he murmured. How the other half did live. And he let gravity carry him down the hill. After a frustrating two hours of cutting through fields, he switched to a railway line, managing five miles in quick time before he found a huge pack of the undead clustered around a dozen stalled locomotives. There were hundreds of them, most motionless. From the trampled gardens, broken fences and battered doors, they'd milled through the town, trying to get to those trains. Perhaps someone had been chased there and taken refuge on top, or maybe they'd driven one of the trains, and that was the point at which they had stalled. Chester couldn't tell, except that it must have happened months before. He turned the bike around. Surely there couldn't be anyone still on a train's roof, starving, dehydrated, and just wishing for that slow death as an alternative to— Oi! he yelled. He yelled again. The zombies turned. He found he was laughing as he set off. The undead trailing after him. Ten miles later, and completely lost, he was cycling along a road parallel to a small river. He was nearly certain it wasn't the Medway, and was racking his memory trying to come up with the name of any other river in Kent, when a zombie toppled down on him from the roof of a parked van. Its open mouth clamped onto his arm. Chester, the bike, and the zombie fell in a tangled heap. He was trapped with one leg under the bike, and the squirming, thrashing weight of the creature still biting down on his arm, on top. Its jaw squeezed tighter and tighter, its clawed hands flailed and plucked at the bicycle spokes, and its dead eyes met his in a look vacant of thought or meaning. Chester pulled out the revolver and shot it at point-blank range. He pulled himself to his feet and tore off the ripped sleeve. Spots of blood pricked up from where the plastic had scored deep lines into his skin. He removed the spent cartridge and reloaded the revolver. Then he realized that he'd left the first aid kit back at the mansion. Fresh air is the best disinfectant, he muttered. Where did I read that? Probably not in a doctor's office. An hour later, and he was forced to take a road that led south. An hour after that, and he was heading west, then north, then south again, and then... The closer he got to London, the worse the roads got. The frequency of mudslides and field slips didn't change but the number of abandoned vehicles increased dramatically. Some were parked on the verge, others abandoned in the middle of the road. Around those ditched cars and lorries, occasional motorbikes, and anything else with wheels and engine. The undead frequently congregated. Chester couldn't summon the energy to fight his way through, so took to the fields and footpaths. As the day wore on, the persistent drizzle turned dirt into mud, and Chester soon found he was making little better progress than the zombies closely dogging his heels. Even where the living dead had left the vehicles to rust in peace, the roads were often blocked. Drifts of plastic, metal, and blood-stained scraps of clothing mixed with leaves and branches around the slowly deflating tires. Muddy, runoff, baked hard in the sun of earlier months, turned those drifts into shallow walls surrounding stagnant pools. And it would get worse, he thought, as he carried the bike over a long stretch of swampy quagmire. Year by year, the winter rains would spread the soil to further cover the concrete. Hedges would branch from their neat lines, set centuries before, and the only trace the roads had ever existed would be the rusting roofs of the cars. There would be no trips to Kent in years to come. The fields and orchards, where crops now grew wild, would only provide food for animals small or wily enough to evade the undead. More importantly, there was no way of getting a coach through, not on this route. He reached the end of the quagmire, mounted and set off, damp feet pushing against slick pedals. Barely five hundred yards further on, he braked hard. A river had burst its banks, the road was flooded. So were the fields next to it, 
and by the look of them, the pair of houses on the opposite bank. A zombie on the far side of the road saw him. It staggered into the flood water. Feet, then ankles, then knees were submerged. It slipped, fell, got up, stumbled forward until it was hip deep, fell again, stood, fell, stood again. Chester turned the bike around and headed back the way he'd come. His watch said it was twelve, but it had been saying that for at least the last two hours, ever since he'd backhanded a zombie trying to pull him off the bike. He was somewhere on the edge of the Kent Downs, and if the signpost on the roadside was to be believed, the Dartford Tunnel and QE2 Bridge were ten miles away. Judging by the sun, it was between late afternoon and early evening, and that was as specific as he was prepared to be. Ten miles, then the bridge, then twenty more miles after that, he murmured, glancing up. The drizzle had stopped, but the clouds kept piling into one another, suggesting the respite was temporary. Thirty miles. That should be no more than a couple of hours. It might have been if he knew which road led where. He'd lost the map a few miles after the watch had been broken. He'd had it propped on the handlebars as he'd pounded his way up a hill. His legs had burned with the effort, and screamed at his brain that he should stop. He'd pushed on, reaching the top to find the road on the other side of the hill was... empty. He'd been expecting it to be full of snarling, biting faces. When it wasn't, he'd kept pedalling and rocketed down the other side. The undead had been lurking around a bend a mile further on. He'd not had time to break or even slow, so he sped up, cycling straight through them, leaving the map and a few more inches of skin behind. He'd noticed that those zombies were clustered around a green four-by-four. He wondered whether he should ask Stiles whether that car had belonged to someone who had set out from the mansion. Perhaps not. The man might say yes. It was getting dark, though that might just have been the approaching storm and encroaching rooftops. There was a road sign ahead, advising drivers to get in the right lane for the Dartford Tunnel or the QE2 Bridge. If all went well, he'd be across the river in half an hour. He looked at his arm. The small cuts had scabbed over. Then he looked down at his leg. The undead had grown too numerous to avoid, and he'd been pulled from the bike twice as he'd left the countryside behind. Sometimes they were motionless, other times already moving, sometimes towards him, sometimes not, and he was now too tired to care what that meant. On the first occasion, he'd managed to kill the creature, get back on the bike, and get away before the rest of the pack surrounded him. The second time, he'd not been so lucky. The zombie hadn't so much pulled him off, as pushed him over. The bike had fallen on top, his pocketed revolver was out of reach, and he'd had to punch and kick his way free. He'd got to his feet, swinging the mace, but he'd been too hasty. The first blow had missed the creature's head, landing hard on its collarbone. He'd swung again, crushing its skull, but then he'd been surrounded. He'd cleaved and hacked, left and right, until an undead weight smashed into his back and the mace had gone flying. He'd grabbed the bike and used it to push the zombies back, giving him time to pull out the revolver and shoot a clear path through them. When he'd reached an empty stretch of road, he'd been surprised to find the bike still worked, and more surprised when he'd stopped to get his bearings and a sharp chill rose up his legs. He'd looked down to find his trousers ripped mid-calf, with a thin gash trickling blood down to a foot now missing a shoe. He flexed his hand. It was sore but he didn't think the bones were broken. He opened the revolver and let the spent cartridges fall to the ground. As they rolled across the pavement, tinkling to a halt in an overfull gutter, there was a corresponding and far louder crashing rattle from a nearby street. Chester fished a couple of rounds from a pocket that was now nearly empty. There was the hunting knife, but he didn't want to get that close to the undead. He needed another weapon. He needed another shoe. He needed a few hours of calm and quiet. The noise from the neighbouring road got louder, closer. The bike wobbled as he pushed off, his eyes on the houses around him, looking for one that would provide a sanctuary for the night. The rear wheel slipped. His foot went down and again was soaked. He dismounted, limping. He wheeled the bike away from the growing cacophony behind. 
Five minutes later, he spotted a promising-looking alley that ran between the back gardens of a pre-war row of houses and a post-war parade of shops. What attracted him was the wooden gate across the alley's mouth. He checked to make sure he was alone, then stuck the knife into the gap between lock and jam and levered the gate open. In under a minute, he was inside. The gate was closed and had a battered chest freezer propping it shut. An old familiar thrill swept over him, a memory of those times following a break-in gone right or short con gone wrong. When the danger was still high, but he knew he'd reached a brief and temporary safety. An old reflex had him raising a sleeve to wipe down the side of the freezer. A slow smile slid across his face. Don't need to worry about fingerprints now, he murmured. As he took a pace back, the mess of decaying leaves and sodden cardboard shifted beneath his socked foot. But I do need shoes. The rear doors to the shops were too sturdy to risk the knife on, and the windows were thickly reinforced with stout bars too closely spaced for him to climb through. There were no fire escapes that he could see, and any conveniently placed drain pipes had been removed in the last round of renovations. One of the houses, then. He picked one near the end of the alley, with no broken glass on the lawn or children's toys scattered about the garden. He wasn't in the mood to be confronted with the animated ghosts of a once happy family. The gate had a bolt at the top that was easily reached, and a padlock on the inside that wasn't. But the wood surrounding it was old and soft, and broke with barely more than a twist from the knife. He propped the door closed, crossed the garden, and listened at the rear door. He heard nothing. He forced the lock. A reassuring smell of damp pervaded the house. He relaxed when he realized he couldn't smell the necrotic odor of the undead. His sodden sock squelching uncomfortably, he limped through the narrow laundry room and into the kitchen. Flaking paint spoke of a property overdue for work long before the evacuation. He opened a cupboard. It was empty. He closed it and saw a rotor pinned to the outside. There wasn't enough light to read the details, but taken with everything else, he guessed the occupants had been students. He tried another cupboard, and another, but found nothing. Beyond the kitchen was a small dining area. Beyond that was a smaller lounge and a downstairs bedroom. He tried the door, locked. He rattled the handle, listened. There was nothing. He broke the lock. The room was empty. He went upstairs, and only when he was certain that he was truly alone did he begin his search for shoes. The closest to a fit that he found were a pair of trainers, two sizes too small. He ripped out the insoles and hacked at the heels until he had something that would, if not keep his feet dry, save them from being lacerated on broken glass and shards of metal. He used up nearly an entire roll of tape and two extra pairs of laces before he'd strapped them onto his feet in such a way he was reasonably sure they wouldn't fly off. A bottle of antibacterial spray found under the kitchen sink cleaned the wounds on his arms, legs, and a narrow gash on his forehead he didn't remember getting. A torn-up pillowcase did duty as bandages. He sat down on the sofa in the living room, with his half-empty water bottle on the table in front, the revolver in his hand, and the knife loose in his belt. He tried to sleep. 21st of September Chester woke surrounded by darkness. He didn't move, he just listened. There was a sound out in the street. There it was again. Was it something being blown by the wind? He listened until the noise faded into the distance. He turned his mind to the children in that mansion and how they might get them to the coast. Once they were on the lifeboat, they would be safe. It was the miles before then that were the problem. Except it wasn't really a problem. There were no alternatives to be chosen from. They would have to find bicycles and then split into teams, each carrying a few gallons of diesel, each team cycling a different zigzagging route south to the mansion. Whichever group arrived first, that would be the route the coach would take. When they arrived at the beach, the adults would have to hold off the undead and hope that there was someone left to take the news to Anglesey. No. There was no alternative, no subterfuge that could be played out, no point to finesse when dealing with the brutal mindlessness of the undead.
He closed his eyes again, willing himself to sleep. He couldn't. Images of those children's faces came back to him, replaced sometimes by Reese's, sometimes by others who died, and then by Canuck. He opened his eyes. What about that Inspector Styles? he whispered, trying to force his mind onto a different track. He didn't look like police, although these days who looked like anything but a heavily armed tramp? Nor did he act like one. He acted like a man defeated. Chester supposed he was. By a man's deeds ye shall judge him. That was something Chester's father had said to him. And wasn't that a dark night? His father had been enjoying one of his brief holidays from Her Majesty's pleasure, and had walked in on Chester bent over the kitchen sink, trying to scrub the bloodstains out of a shirt. Chester was sure he'd made no noise, but he'd turned around to see his old man there, wearing a sad but knowing expression on his face. They'd lit a fire, as his father had shown him how to make sure that every shred of cloth burned. It had all come pouring out. Canuck, the burglaries, the fight, the death. Looking back from the safety of years and with the wisdom of practice, it was shock that had made him tell his father the truth. He'd been in a state of it ever since that moment in the underpass, when he'd felt the knife cut deep into flesh. But you didn't hold it over me, Chester said. There was a clatter from outside, and he was brought back to the present. He let his fingers curl round the revolver, seeking reassurance in the familiar weight. No, his father hadn't held it over him. He'd never mentioned it again. When he talked about judgment and deeds, Chester had thought he was talking about Canuck. But then he remembered his father's deathbed, and that look of sorrowful disappointment in his eyes. He sighed. He'd often blamed his father for his own path in life. But now he saw that the old man had done the best he could. He just hadn't a clue about how to raise a child to succeed in any world other than the criminal one. The clatter came again from outside, but this time it was farther away. Again he closed his eyes and tried to sleep. To Chester there had always been something depressing about dawn. People always spoke of a new day with a new promise. It only ever reminded him of work left undone the day before. He kept his ears pricked, eyes alert, and muscles tensed as he pushed the bike towards the QE2 bridge. The shoes weren't great, despite his efforts with the tape, a spreading damp was already seeping into the shredded material. Nor had he found anything more dangerous than a broom back at the house. Britain wasn't a place where shotguns were stored under a bed, and Dartford was in the wrong social bracket for swords to be found hanging over the fireplace. There it was, a sign with directions to both the bridge and the tunnel, though he was resolute that he'd never go underground again. There was another sign on the post, one pointing to the Little Brook power station. He wasn't sure whether it would have been destroyed during the mutiny and war after the outbreak, but he thought he remembered seeing a pier jutting out into the river during his journey into London with Nilda. If there was a pier, and if it was undamaged, then they could berth the lifeboat there. Yes, they could drive the coach right up to the river's edge, using its bulk to protect the children as they climbed out. A narrow jetty would be easier to defend than some broad stretch of water, and a pier with deep water would negate the risk of beaching the craft on some stretch of stony shingle. He stared at the long road ahead, and then down at his knife in his belt. It was worth a ten-minute detour, and he might find a weapon, or at least a handy swingable length of metal. As he wheeled the bike towards the power plant, and to keep his mind off his increasingly sodden foot, he tried to recall the few scraps he'd ever known about Littlebrook. It was designed to operate from a black start. Should the entire country suffer from a national power outage, they could turn that station on and use the electricity it generated to restart the other power plants in the network. It had originally been a coal-burning facility, but had been converted to gas. Or was it oil? Weren't the buildings close to the river part of the old coal plant complex? He wasn't sure, but if they were, then wasn't there a chance the gas or oil plant would still be intact? Probably not, 
but a sudden flickering glimmer of hope sparked as he imagined the castle and tower bridge lit up once more. Electricity meant so much more than just light and heat, and would mean so much more could be done in London. There was a chance, a small one, he told himself, and he tried to believe it. When he reached the access road leading to the main gates, he saw there was nothing but craters and rubble, and heard nothing but that mournful wheeze of the undead. He climbed up a wide, hoarding, advertising, a regeneration project coming soon, and saw the jetty, and that it could be reached by a vehicle driving through the main gates. A three-foot-long section of pipe had been embedded into the poster two feet to the left. He tried to pull it free. It was stuck fast. He gave up, jumped down, and grabbed the bike. He was about to head straight for the bridge, when he saw a sign denoting the property to the south as the local council's road maintenance vehicle park. If weapons were tools, he thought, then tools were weapons. From his recent experience, they were often more practical than those designed for nothing more than hacking and hewing. He pushed the bike over to the gates. The padlock was still in place, but the chain-link fence surrounding it had been cut. Chester nudged the gate. It swung open. Arrayed before him were row upon row of vehicles. Those near the front gates were still neatly parked. The ones near the power station had been shoved into disarray by flying rubble and the twisted remains of what looked almost like an aeroplane turbine. Street sweepers, gritters, plows and flatbeds, vans and trucks of almost every size filled the space, and the first thing he noticed on each was that the caps had been removed from the fuel tanks. He walked over to the vehicle nearest the entrance, a truck with a plow at the front and a hopper at the back. When he pulled himself up, he found it was still half full of salt. He wandered down the ranks of vehicles until he spotted one with a score of wooden handles sticking out from under a tarpaulin. He grabbed a shovel. The blade was pitted, the edge coated with a thin layer of hard dirt. He gave it an experimental swing. It had a reassuring heft. As he was cutting a strip out of the tarp to use as a strap, he heard a clatter from the direction of the power station. He ripped the material free, tied the ends to the shovel, and slung it over his back. It would do. A heavy drop of rain fell on the back of his neck. He'd run out of time. The bridge loomed large in front, the far end invisible in the growing rain. It can't be more than five hundred metres. Yeah, that's all it is, five hundred metres, probably less. He repeated the word softly as he wheeled the bike up the sloping road on the southern side. He knew that didn't include the approach road he was on now, nor the one at the other side, but repeated the number anyway, until he was interrupted by a loud, banging scrape. He turned around. Twenty yards back down the road, a zombie stumbled against the side of a bright blue two-seater. He could just make out the ghoulish outlines of more staggering through the pouring rain, but it fell too heavily to count their numbers. Probably a good thing. Not that it matters. There's no going back now, he began pedalling. Five hundred metres. I can do it. As it had done so many times, his hand dropped to his pocket, checking again that the revolver was there. He only had twenty-three cartridges left, but it didn't matter. There wouldn't be time to reload. As he began to pick up speed, he stood up on the pedals to get a better view of the bridge ahead. Visibility wasn't great, and the angle was worse. It looked packed with cars, trucks, and vehicles of every type, some near the central reservation, others abandoned, precariously close to the edge. He sat down again, trying to find a balance between speed and the increasingly wet surface. He wished for lightning. He wished for thunder, not this gentle, persistent drizzle that was more like a mist. He wished he was somewhere warm and dry and safe, but he'd wished for that enough times in his life to know that wishes counted for nothing. There, behind the van, a zombie, no, two, heading towards him, but the road was wide. He swerved to the left, and then he was safely past. Four fifty, he hissed, hoping he was right. Another van, another zombie, another abrupt swerve, then a pack of cars parked in a semicircle and inside clawing and pouring and pushing the cars out of the way, a dozen undead. There was no room to dodge. 
He tried for speed. The lead zombie squeezed through an impossibly small gap between two bumpers, tearing the muscles from its leg. When it got through and out into the clear road, it toppled forward, and its outstretched arms flew out to smack down on the pavement. Chester lowered the hand he'd raised to fend off the creature, and turned his attention to the road. Four hundred, maybe less, must be less. And though he knew that was beyond optimistic, he found comfort in the lie. He unslung the shovel from his back, laying it across the handlebars, and found more comfort in having the weapon close at hand. Ahead was a post office lorry, skewed onto its side. The rear doors were open, and huge sacks had fallen out. Slowing to pick a path between the bags, and distracted by what they might contain, he almost cycled straight into the trio of undead lurking behind the vehicle. He barely had time to raise the shovel and swing. Two of the zombies fell with a near-comical ringing of metal as the flat of the tool hit their heads. The third lurched forward, tripped, its fingers tangled in the spokes. The bike toppled. Chester flew off, landing in a rolling heap, pulling himself up, running to the bike, kicking the zombie clear, pushing and running until he had the space to mount and start pedaling again. Three, fifty, he yelled and wished he hadn't. Ahead were more undead, lurching slowly through the mist. He dodged one, then another, and narrowly missed a third that clawed at his arm. It was like a burning dagger arcing across his skin as fresh cuts were added to old scars. Three hundred meters, he said, and found his voice absent of all reassurance. Despite his intentions, he found himself glancing up at the great cables above. No, two fifty, he said. He was halfway across, and halfway was almost there. Ahead, an ice cream van had crashed into a car. Remembering what had happened at the post office lorry, he slowed, swerving wide. The van had been roughly reinforced with metal sheets added to the windows. Had they used the van's musical siren to lure the undead from the south or north? He didn't have time to give it any more thought because he'd been right. There were undead hidden behind the crashed van. He pushed down. The chain caught against a gear. He glanced down and when he looked up, he didn't have time to swerve. The zombie staggered straight into him. The handlebars hit it in the chest. As Chester threw himself off to the side, he saw one of its legs go straight through the spokes of the front wheel. Chunks of flesh were torn off and the creature collapsed in a gory heap, but that was little comfort. Chester landed hard but managed to keep hold of the shovel. He came up swinging, knocking one down, another back, and he had space to walk. A low swiping hack at a zombie's knees, and there was a gap between the forest of grasping hands. He ran. They seemed to be everywhere. He kept swinging left and right, sometimes high, sometimes low, smashing shoulder and shovel, arm and sometimes head into the heaving mass of teeth and clawed hands. He realized he was limping. The tape holding his right shoe together was falling apart. Each blow had less strength than the last, and he was doing little more than pushing the creatures back. That meant that they were close behind. And his limping lope wasn't much faster than their lurching stagger. But he could see the end of the bridge. He was almost there. The shovel fell to his side, and he pushed it against the concrete like a crutch as he pulled the revolver from his pocket. He'd slowed to barely faster than a walk. A zombie toppled out of the mist in front of him. Before he had time to think, the revolver was raised, barking a quick shot at the creature. It hit. The zombie fell, another zombie, another shot. He wasn't going to make it. How many times had he fired? How many bullets did he have left? Would he have time to reload? He remembered the soldier, Derry, dead in the house near the mansion. A squall blew across the bridge, and he staggered sideways, his gaze tracked towards the bridge's sides, his mind to the quick death that a leap through the broken barrier would bring. No, that wasn't an option. He had to make it. Not for him, he realized in a sudden moment of clarity. Not out of redemption or an attempt to balance some mythical scales, but because there truly was no one else. Those children's lives depended on him. 
His life, his existence, came down to the simple truth that saving people was his life. All that had gone before wasn't prologue so much as prelude. Now forgotten and irrelevant to the future, save that it gave him the skills to ensure those children had won. He fired again and started to run, kicking down and shaking his foot with each upward stride until the tattered remains of the shoe fell away. He fired again, and again. There was one shot left. He raised the pistol, waving the barrel left and right. There was nothing left to shoot at, so he just kept running. He came to a stumbling halt thirty minutes later, though not because of the undead. As he cracked open the revolver and reloaded, he listened and looked. He could hear them, but there were none in sight. He raised the shovel and broke the glass, careful not to cut his foot on the broken shards. He stepped over the window display and into the shoe shop. Revolver raised, he peered into the gloom, expecting some creature to stumble out of the dark. But it was empty. It took nearly five minutes to find a pair of shoes his size. Trainers, in bright green, with lurid red stripes along the side. They fit and were wonderfully comfortable. When he went outside again, there were three zombies in the street. He didn't care. He picked up the shovel and started running west towards the Tower of London. Chapter 10 Part 4 Harvest 22nd of September Nilda continued her slow circuit of the battlements in the hope exercise would create an appetite for dinner. It was three days since she and Jay had left Chester at that beach, two days since she'd taken that larger group back to Kent and found the undead surrounding the lifeboat. She ran forward a dozen steps, stopped and looked at her leg. One of the scabs had reopened, but otherwise it seemed fine. The previous day she'd taken the boat out again, but this time with a larger group of twenty. They'd all been eager volunteers and the atmosphere had been one of joyous expectation. They'd returned early, almost empty-handed, and soaked from the rain. Worse than empty-handed, really, since the few dozen scrubby turnips they'd pulled out of an allotment on their last trip ashore did not make up for the fuel they'd expended. They'd not made it as far as the raft that time, and she saw no point in going back that way again. Chester would turn up, she was sure of that, it was just a matter of where and when. During the long, sleepless night, she'd imagined him bumping into an expedition from Anglesey out on their own quest to harvest fruit from the farms in Kent. She could see him sailing down the river at the head of a fleet of battered trawlers and giant ferries. It had been a pleasant delusion, but it was dangerous to place trust in wild hopes. Each day meant nearly a quarter of a million kilojoules consumed. They could reduce that number by eating the animals, but with no spare electricity to power the freezers, they had to eat the meat as soon as they were slaughtered. There had been talk of salting and smoking, but as yet that was just talk. She understood now why their meals had been so bland and unappetizing. Stuart had been stretching out every morsel. They would have to start on the stores soon, and that would be the end of her other hope, that Jay could have a future here, independent of Anglesey. She sighed and continued the walk around the walls. Food was only half of the problem. When they'd returned yesterday, she checked over the lifeboat's excuse for instruments and found they'd burned through twice as much fuel as she'd expected. Whether that was due to a leak or a problem with the engine, she didn't know. It left them with enough to make two fifty-mile round trips in the boat, probably. One hundred miles, and after that they'd be reliant on oars and tides. Not wanting to raise any further panic, she'd kept that news to herself, even after McKinnery had suggested they use the remaining diesel to drive to Anglesey. Insisted would be a better word, she thought, and she'd proposed that they go back to Westminster and try to get a couple of the armoured personnel carriers working. McKinnery's idea was that it would somehow be safer for a larger group of ten or twenty to try to make the trip to Wales. Nilda didn't agree, for all of Chester's talk of it being at worst. Perhaps three weeks before a boat could arrive? She couldn't help remember that it had taken Jay and Tuck nearly two months to get to London from Penrith. 
That was about the same distance to the Welsh island. There was little chance such a large number of people would find supplies out on the road, and so the only purpose in them, even attempting the expedition, was to reduce the strain on the supplies for those who stayed behind. As sure as she was of that, she was just as sure that someone had to leave for Anglesey, and do it soon. The obvious candidates were Tuck and Jay, as they had the most experience in travelling through the undead countryside. Since Nilda wasn't going to let Jay out of her sight again, that meant she'd have to go too. She stopped pacing. They'd run out of time. They'd run out of food. There were no good choices left. All that remained was a question of which was the lesser risk, starvation or the undead. The mood was changing with the weather. Despite Fogarty and his cheerful stories, Hannah and her incessant positivity and Stuart's insistence that everything would be okay. Each passing hour saw the fragile sense of community ebb away. Finally, and months too late, everyone seemed to grasp how tenuous their situation was. Rome wasn't sacked in a day, she murmured. That was something Sebastian had often said. Speaking the words aloud stiffened her resolve. There was no knowing how long it would take for a boat to reach them. The undead were a danger that could be escaped, but hunger and what it would bring were not. Thus, as far as she distrusted the intentions of those she met on that island, Jay would be safer on the road than here. She started pacing again. This idea of the tower, of a castle, the same one that she'd had all those months ago back in Penrith, would be over. Perhaps, if they had come here in March, rather than trying to cling on in Cumbria, it might have worked. But probably not. She would prefer to wait until the skies cleared, but no, there had been too much waiting. Perhaps it would be best to leave at night and not tell anyone else. Tonight, in fact. Then there would be no... be no... Was that a figure running towards the walls? She ran along the battlements until she reached the ropes hanging down the side, waving her arms to get the figure's attention. And then she saw it was Chester. She called and shouted, and by the time he reached the base of the outer wall, there were half a dozen people on the battlements. He grabbed a rope, and that seemed to be all that he had strength to do. They hauled him up. Chester! Nilda raised her arms, about to hug him, but stopped when she saw the state of his clothes. Yeah, not a pretty sight, he said, pulling off the ruined jacket and dropping it to the battlements. Nice shoes, Jay said. Nilda looked down at the lurid green and red trainers on Chester's feet. I've literally run from Dartford. I got over the bridge yesterday, but couldn't find a bike. Had to hide up most of yesterday afternoon. Fortunately, I, well, I could do with a drink and food. A bed would be welcome, but there isn't time for that. So let's start with a drink and see how we do he said, trailing mud behind him as he headed towards the dining hall. I'd put a wash and some new clothes at the top of that list, Jay called after him. Where are the others? Nilda asked. Chester stopped. Race is dead, he said. Got bitten. Thought he was immune. Lasted nearly ten hours. But he turned. And Greta and... Greta and Finnegan are fine, Chester said. Alive and well. Or they were the day before yesterday. They're still down in Kent. Why did you split up? Jay asked. We found more people, Chester said. A lot more. They stayed to protect them. Forty-three children. One adult. So that's it, Chester finished. He picked up the jug, poured another glass of water, downed it, and looked around the dining hall. Everyone was there, and all had listened quietly to his story. There are forty-three children. The youngest is five. The oldest is nine. They can't walk or cycle, and they certainly can't fight. And no coach is going to make it through the roads I went down. Tuck wants to know about the railway lines, Jay said. Didn't I say? Well, no, they're no good either. I tried following them for a bit, but I found them blocked. That's not to say a different route on different roads or other tracks won't work, just not the ones I followed. It's too great a risk, Graham said. We should go to Anglesey and ask them to send some of their soldiers. It's a day's drive, no more. It took me a day to get forty miles through Kent to the QE2 bridge, Chester said, and nearly two to get from Dartford to here. That was by bike and on foot, Graham said. 
Exactly my point. Even if you start by driving, you'll be on foot soon after. By bike, I think fifty miles in a day is as much as anyone's going to manage, and that's not all going to be travelled in the direction you want to go. Assuming you don't end up like I did yesterday, watching the sun track from overhead to the horizon as you hide from the undead. And assuming you don't walk straight into one of those hordes. That's something else we need to talk about. But one problem at a time. If someone manages to get there, it'll be at least a couple of weeks before they sail up the Thames, and then they'd still be sitting on a boat miles from where the children are. I don't think those kids have that kind of time. So I'm going back as soon as I've caught my breath. I'll go with him, Jay said. And what if we can't save them? Graham asked. What if we go down there and we're the ones who die? Then we die, Jay said. But we have to try because there's no one else, right, Mum? Nilda met her son's eyes, but before she could answer, Hannah spoke. She sat by the fire, her eyes fixed on the flames, and her voice seemed far away, as if she was speaking to her own distant memories. Yes, she said. We have to help one another. That was the point of Radio Free England. Perhaps if we'd had a way of broadcasting a stronger signal, they would have heard us. We could have made contact with them earlier. We could have done so much. All those people at the airport. We didn't know. And now this is our last chance to act. If we do not, then all those who died will have made that sacrifice in vain. We do this not for ourselves, but for those who sacrificed. For, she stammered, stopped. We do it so their deaths have meaning in the hope that when we die, ours won't be such a futile passing. Silence settled, though it wasn't one of agreement, just of politeness for a well-liked leader who had yet to realise she had become little more than a figurehead. Nilda thought of the airport and of those undead children. She remembered Sebastian and how he died trying to save two more on those railway tracks back in Penrith. She thought of her own quest to find Jay and how Tuck had protected him while she was still bent on revenge. What was humanity if not the acceptance of responsibility for a child not one's own? How do we do it? she asked. Well, I spent most of yesterday working that out, Jester said. We keep it simple, right? There's a pier, still standing outside the Little Brook power station. That's by the QE2 bridge. We leave the boat there, and it seems to me if we can't find a route that's clear, we need to make our own. There's a vehicle park near there full of trucks and lorries. We can take one of those, something heavy enough to clear a path along a road, and with wheels tall and thick enough to find traction in the mud. We drive down there with all the diesel we have left, load the kids into a coach, and drive them back to the boat. The biggest problem is going to be the batteries. I don't have a clue how you charge them. That's easy, Jay said. We worked out how to do that before we left Kirkman House. So. We have a plan. Who else is coming? They left an hour later. It would have been sooner, but Nilda insisted Chester wash. There was a slight delay after that when Chester went to retrieve his revolver from the jacket he discarded on the battlements. The revolver was gone. It must have fallen out as I was running back, he said. Nilda could see the loss in his eyes. She felt that way about the sword, or perhaps she felt completely differently. The sword was a connection to Sebastian, and a past that, as it faded to memory, seemed one of happiness and a missed opportunity more than it was of struggle. There were ten of them on the boat. Fogarty and Hannah were going to stay on board, ready for their return. Nilda, Chester, Tuck, Stuart, Kevin, Aisha, Zhao, and Jay would go ashore. Nilda wasn't happy about her son being with them. She had seen that he knew how to handle himself. He seemed to have grown another few inches in height, and at least the same in breadth over the last few days. Her problem was in how much depth he'd gained. She was pining for that stroppy teenager who hid away in his bedroom, oblivious to the world. 23rd of September By turning the engine on at Greenwich and not switching it off until they reached Raynham, they arrived at Littlebrook Power Station an hour before dawn, and that hour dragged. Not long now, Chester said. 
You should sleep, Nilda said. I've had a couple of hours. That's more than enough, Chester said. According to the map, it's only twenty-five miles from here to the farm. It seemed like a lot longer. He gave the fuel cans a thoughtful stare. Aisha, how many miles to the gallon did you say a coach could make? I said it depended on the coach and the roads. Fifteen would be a reasonable guess. Then we need two gallons for the coach, so let's call it three and four for a truck to get there and back, he said. So we've got more than three times what we need. And you're happy with the controls? Nilda asked Fogarty. I may be old, but I can manage this, he said. We'll stay close by the jetty and listen for sounds. Hannah nodded. Hand the gunfire, she said. If we hear it further up or down the coast, we'll move accordingly. They would have to be within a couple of miles to hear the shot. Hannah didn't seem to realise that. Fogarty did. And what about you? the old soldier asked. You happy with your part of the plan? Of course, Nilda lied. It's all straightforward. We go ashore, drive south, then come back. You remind me of a general I once knew, Fogarty said. He told me, well, he told us, that since no plan survives contact with the enemy, there wasn't much point to planning. Better just to rush it in blindly and hope for the best. And the moral of the story is in how he died? Nilda guessed. Hardly. Like I said, they promoted him all the way to general. Nilda forced a smile and looked over at Jay. He appeared neither scared nor excited, just eager to get a job done. She sighed and realised that if it was light enough to see his expression, there was enough light to go ashore. It's time, she said. You know what the worst part's going to be? Chester asked as he climbed up onto the deck. We're going to get to the mansion at about eight o'clock, and that means the journey back's going to be during rush hour. Chester led the way. Tuck followed close behind, the rifle slung on her back. The soldier presented an oddly comforting sight, though the reassurance wasn't in the weapon or in the martial way that she carried it. Nor was it in the familiar ease with which she darted forward, checking behind broken walls, occasionally hacking down to end a wheezing snarl. It was in the way that movement was copied by the others, though with a lesser degree of practised familiarity, except for Stuart. He stalked forward, shoulders braced, almost as if he was eager to fight. He'd spent the journey ominously muttering about keeping the children safe. Nilda had considered leaving him on the boat, but wasn't sure they'd be able to stop him from going ashore. She paused to kill one of the partially trapped undead. There was another behind it. She took a step and swung again, and then spotted a third. As she moved towards it, Jay grabbed her arm. There were too many, he hissed. There's no point. And no time. He was right on both counts. Yet she couldn't stop thinking of the undead as people trapped inside those decaying bodies. It didn't seem right to her that they should be left. However, they gave the answer to a question that had been bothering her since Hull. She'd wondered how so many zombies had become trapped in the ruins of the wind turbine factory. They hadn't. It was people that had been trapped in the rubble. As she stepped over broken masonry, Following Chester and Tuck towards the far end of the site, she also stepped over the remains of the many people who had died in the attack. It was hard not to think of those as the lucky ones whose deaths had been instantaneous. The others, those who had survived, had found their calls for help answered only by the undead. After the first half an hour of driving, Nilda found being behind the wheel almost not enjoyable. That wasn't the right word, nor was it satisfying to hit one or two or six of the undead with the plough and see them torn apart as they were caught between the hard asphalt and harder blade. She had always enjoyed driving, and once she'd overcome that unfamiliar familiarity as she searched for gears and overcompensated turns, she found it. Not relaxing, either. There was no chance of that when they were surrounded by a symphony of bone being crushed beneath the wheels and a screeching, sparking grind as abandoned cars were pushed out of the way. But there was no fear, either. Seeing an upper-story window break and a zombie topple out, but then driving past before it was able to stand, knowing that those necrotic arms couldn't reach them, nor the myriad debris of civilization's demise halt them was comforting, she decided, particularly after she'd changed the plan at the last minute. Now it was quite literally in motion, 
there was no way of changing it. Originally, she'd intended to take just two trucks down to the mansion in Kent, one for pushing a way through all the obstacles, the other in case the first broke down. Everyone else would stay at the power station and ensure that the path from there to the jetty remained clear of the undead. When Nilda had seen the rubble littering the vehicle park and the detritus strewn about the roads beyond, she changed her mind. She drove a snowplow at the front of a convoy with Tuck and Stuart and Kevin and Aisha driving a pair of high-sided trucks behind. Chester and Zhao brought up the rear in another plow. They were going to bring the children back on those trucks. They were double-tired, with a high clearance and higher sides that offered far more protection than a single coach, and had less chance of getting stuck. She'd not said that two vehicles meant twice the chance that at least half of the children would reach safety. She'd not had to. There had been a tense moment after they'd filled the tanks, loaded up the spare fuel, and turned the engines on. They'd neglected to secure the entrance to the vehicle park. The undead had heard them and pawed and clawed at the fence until they'd found the chain-link gate. It had pushed open, and they'd tumbled into the lot. It wasn't their numbers that had caused her to freeze halfway into the cab. It was the enormity of what they had to do, and how many lives rested on their success. Jay had called for her to hurry, and was shifting into the driving seat when there was a shot, then a second, a third, a fourth, and more. Tuck stood on the roof of a truck's cab, firing methodically into the undead, until all that were around the gate were dead. With the rifle raised and only the scarred side of her face visible, she appeared totally emotionless, an avenging angel that vanquished all their demons. And then Nilda looked at Jay, then over at Chester, and saw they wore that same expression. She climbed into the cab. She caught a glimpse of her own face, and saw it mirrored there too. She glanced down at the speedometer, the needle floated around the ten-mile-an-hour mark. Are you keeping track of the route? she asked Jay. She'd insisted he come with her. This time he hadn't protested. Since all Chester knew were the roads not to take, and those had been marked down on the map, she'd insisted on taking the lead. She didn't know Kent at all, and wasn't sure that being in front was actually safer, but it did mean that she could see danger coming. Yeah, I think so, Jay replied lazily. Jenna Drive, that's the name of the sign there on the left, she said. Did you mark that one down? Jenna Drive. I got it, Mum, he said, just as casually. But you've marked it off. You know where we are? Jay sighed. Okay, fine. Sorry, Nilda said. Jay leaned forward and rummaged in the glove box. What are you looking for? she asked. Music? Can't hurt, right? This is not the quietest. He was drowned out as Nilda swerved left, then right, angling the plough into a hatchback that blocked half the road. There was a grind as he changed gears, and another from the car as she pushed it out of the way. Like I said, Jay continued, it's not the quietest vehicle. Fine. Music. Yes, Nilda muttered. Check in your mirror first. Can you see Chester and Zhao? Um, no. Just tuck. We should have arranged a signal, she muttered. What? Jay asked. Nothing. The road ahead was clear for three hundred yards. She turned her attention to the fuel gauge and myelometer. How long has it been? She asked. Since we turned the engines on? Thirty minutes. And we've done nearly ten miles. On the map it's six, Jay said. But it'll get easier as we get further out into the countryside. Yes, of course it will, she said, knowing it wasn't true. As time wore on, her worst fears were realised. There were fewer undead, at least in front, and she dared not even think how many were now in relentless pursuit. But the roads got steadily worse, even with the plough gouging a path through the decaying mass of litter and vegetation, the thick tyres often lost traction. Don't go left here, Jay snapped. That's one of the roads Chester marked off. Fine. They were half a mile from a crossroads, and beyond it was an overturned flatbed. But we can't go straight on. So turn right, he said. There's nowhere to turn right into, she said. The field! Turn into the field! She saw the gate almost too late. 
She threw the steering wheel to the right, the plough's blade wrenched the gate from its hinges, and they drove up into the field. Bad idea, Nilda said, wrenching at the steering wheel. Too much mud. Not good. The hedge. That'll give us something to grip. She slammed the plough into the hedgerow. Branches and leaves flew up to cover the windscreen. The truck slowed, and she was terrified it was going to stall. But then she caught sight of the flatbed that had been blocking the way. She threw the wheel hard left and drove back onto the road. We need to stop, she said, after fifty reassuring yards of driving on almost unobstructed asphalt. Why? To check the others are still there. Slow down a bit, Jay said, as he wound down his window, and try to stick to the road. He'd climbed out before Nilda could protest, and was back down again before she could pull him in. There, there, I saw Chester. He waved, not with all his fingers, but it still counts. We should stop anyway, Nilda said. Why? Do we need to refuel? No, not yet. Probably not until we get to the mansion. Then, he said, slotting a CD into the dash. Don't. It's only another ten miles. The music began to play. After ten seconds, Nilda wound down her window, pressed eject, and tossed the disc outside. Mum, why did you do that? I never liked that song. They reached the mansion without having to stop, and with the fuel gauge a quarter full. Finnegan and Greta pulled the gate open as they arrived. Keep going, Greta called out. You can turn around, up by the house. Nilda did, cracking great chips out of the marble lining the drive, and barely slowed until she had the truck facing the gates. She saw Tuck jump out of her cab and run to the gate, standing sentry with the rifle as Finnegan pulled it closed. Greta came running up. You started to have us worried, she said. Nilda nodded, but there wasn't time for pleasantries. She looked at the plough, at the vehicle's dented sides and cracked windows, then at the other three vehicles. I think we're going to make it, she said as much to herself as to Greta. There was a sound of pattering feet behind her. Nilda turned and saw children running out of the house. There were so many that she wanted to weep. Not yet, she told herself, not until they were all safe. The children weren't empty-handed. Each carried a bag of one sort or another. We don't have room for their possessions, Nilda said to Greta. We'll find them clothes or... The bags are full of food, Greta said. Some of it's preserved, most is fresh. We've been picking everything we can, night and day, since Chester left. We still don't have room, Nilda said almost automatically. Then she looked at the other woman. Greta looked exhausted. Nilda turned her gaze to the children. There was a girl wearing a ragged dress, with a frayed blue bow perched on straggly hair, framing a face that was dirty and tired, yet the eyes were full of hope. The girl clutched a bag twice her own size, struggling under the weight as she dragged it towards the trucks. How much food have you packed? Nilda asked. More than you've got space for, Greta replied. Chester? Nilda called. Do we have enough diesel for the coaches as well? Both coaches and the four trucks? Theoretically, probably. That thin glimmer of hope, the one that there might be a future for her and her son outside of those people in Anglesey, was kindled once more. Fill the hoppers on the back of the two ploughs first. The rest of the food goes into the coaches. The children ride in the trucks. There was a shot from the front gates. Jay, find out how long we've got. We won't get all that food into the lifeboat, Chester said, and there won't be time to unload it at the jetty. We don't have to, Nilda said. We get the children into the boat and we'll drive the coaches over the bridge. We won't make it to the tower, he said. Not all the way. And we don't have to do that either. We just need to get as close as we can, but close to the river too. We leave the coaches and then go back for the food tomorrow or whenever. It could work, Chester, it really could. And the people driving them? The lifeboat can follow the sound of the engines. When we can't drive any further, we jump into the river. And swim. I think I'd rather run. But he didn't disagree, just dashed into the house and grabbed a quartet of bags. There were twenty minutes of frantic activity before the man, Stiles, ran up to her. This isn't safe, he said. We should leave. Yes, yes, you're right, she said. She wasn't sure how much food they had, but each seat in the two coaches now had a bag on it, with many more underneath and in the aisle between. They weren't full, but weight meant fuel, 
and it meant time for the undead to make their slow, lumbering way towards the mansion. As if to punctuate that thought, there was a sudden flurry of shots. You can drive a coach, Nilda asked Stiles. I drove one of them here, he said. Fine. We're going to... Mum! It was Jay. Tuck says it's time to leave. Into the trucks, Stiles yelled. The children dropped the bags they'd been carrying and ran to the vehicles. The smaller ones needed help. It was five minutes, each irregularly punctuated by Tuck and her rifle, before they were all on board. Greta, how do we get that gate open? I'll do it, Finnegan said. Give me thirty seconds. When you see me running, you start driving. She sat in the cab, eyes darting between her son, the mirror, and the curving drive. There was a shot, then a short burst, and ten seconds later, Tuck and Finnegan were running towards them. Nilda gritted her teeth, put her foot down, and drove the plough down the drive, and at the undead, crowding through the open gate. Chapter 11 24th of September Nilda leaned against the cold stone in the ancient doorway, looking out on the tower's courtyard. The rain that had started pounding down during their drive from the mansion had stopped though the densely packed clouds stubbornly refused to clear. Whether more rain came or not, the solar panels were useless. Fortunately, if you looked at it that way, with nearly a hundred of them now in the old castle, the only part left uneaten of a slaughtered pig would be the squeal, and you didn't need an electric freezer to store that. There was a shriek of delight, followed by a small boy belting out of an archway his hands over his head, holding an iron helmet in place. Four seconds later, eight more children pelted after him. Nilda smiled. It was only a momentary oasis in a world of peril, but she was happy to pretend it would last forever. She moved away from the arch and crossed the courtyard, nodding to the similarly happy groups she passed. Hannah was in her element, explaining about diet and lifespan, and a hundred other porcine facts to a group of children who, Nilda was sure, saw the pigs as nothing more than walking slabs of bacon. It didn't matter that they weren't really listening. They were happy, and so was Hannah. And so even was Constance, the mother who'd seen her own children die. She was systematically fussing over each child, drawing up a list of who needed new shoes or clothes or anything else. It all added up to a feeling of victory a genuine triumph when compared to everything that had gone before, when the most they wished for was that they would live to see another dawn. With hindsight, the return journey from the mansion to the river had been far easier than the outward-bound leg, partly because she was familiar with what the snowplow could do, but mostly out of the knowledge that every mile travelled meant one closer to safety. Twice they'd had to go off-road, and once a coach got stuck, they'd had to push it clear using the plough, and for a tense few seconds that seemed to stretch for an hour, she thought they'd have to abandon it. But they got it free, and there had been no real problems until they'd reached the old power station. Once again, they'd outpaced the undead, and Tuck had shot the handful that slouched towards them as the children were shepherded onto the boat. Nilda had pushed Jay on board as well and made sure that Fogarty had a hand clamped on her son's arm to stop him from following her. Then she'd gone back to the plough. It wouldn't start. They'd left it there, the bags of food still in its hopper. She'd driven one of the now empty high-sided trucks, with Chester driving his plough next to her. Together, the two of them cleared a path over the bridge. The coaches followed behind, and they and the plough had made it. Her truck hadn't. The engine had coughed and died. Gravity and the bridge's slight incline kept it moving while she jumped out. She'd drawn the sword, cutting a slashing path through the undead, and managed to leap into a coach's emergency exit just before the road leveled out and the vehicles sped up once more. She'd kept the sword drawn for the rest of the journey, but hadn't needed to use it until they'd reached the tower, or until they almost reached the tower. She stood leaning on the wall and stared at the barricade the government had built all those months before. That was the one thing she'd forgotten. The two coaches, 
the last snowplow and all the food therein were on the other side of it, about a kilometre away. But we're not going to starve. Tuck had taken the lifeboat out first thing that morning. Nilda hadn't been on it. She'd slept in and woken to find the soldier had led an expedition to the power station to collect the food that had been in the hopper at the back of the plough. What had surprised her was that Jay hadn't gone either. That food would probably last for more than a meal, but no more than two. The trip to Kent had proved that there was nowhere east of London that they could escape to. Confirmed was a better way of putting it. She supposed that each of them had held on to the hope that they might stumble across some utopian society eager and willing to help them. Instead, we've got Anglesey, she muttered. She caught sight of something green out of the corner of her eye. A parakeet had landed on the crenellated stone less than ten feet away. It hopped forward an inch and then took off. She turned to watch as it flew up to land on the top of a tower next to another bird. No, we won't starve, she said again. We'll find a way, birds and fish, and who knows what else. Her mind was flitting between possible recipes for parakeet pie when she heard footsteps behind her. It was Jay and Tuck. We think the food out in the coaches won't last more than a couple of days, he said. We? she asked, raising an eyebrow. Okay, so Tuck thinks. But that's about right, isn't it? Sealed up in those bags? Yes. So we're going to use the drone to get rid of the zombies around there. Tuck said that when she was flying it around Westminster, they all followed the sound of the rotors. That should work here. If we fly it out once tonight, and again in the morning, there shouldn't be many left tomorrow afternoon. What do you think? I think that's a brilliant plan, she said, smiling. OK, he said suspiciously. What's up? What do you mean? You seem... I don't know. Happy. I think I am. I really am. It's... It was easy to explain why, but she wasn't sure that she should share it with Jay. In rescuing the children and bringing them to the tower's relative safety, she had completed something she had failed to do so many months before. Something that she had even failed to do with her own son. We decided to do something, and we went out and did it, she said. Most importantly, we all came back. Nobody died. Tuck gave a wry smile. Her hands moved. Nilda looked to Jay. She said it really was a good day. Still riding that wave of stolen euphoria, she went looking for Chester. She found him sitting in the King's bedchamber in St. Thomas's Tower, a pile of maps at his feet, his attention on the view of South London, visible through his window. That was a good deed well done, she said. It was a small enough deed, another few people safe for another few days. But they're children, Chester. Children or adults, a life is a life, he said. Each one saved brings into sharp relief the number who died. We're losing a couple of people each month. And you know what I think? It's not like a war where even the defeated have the prospect of a future once it's over. This is life. This gradual attrition. A few here, a few there. This week, next month. Soon, we'll each die. Can't you just enjoy the moment? She asked, his mood finally killing her own. Honestly, when a day like today is the best we can hope for. I'm exhausted, Nilda. I truly am. There's only so many times you can tell yourself tomorrow will be better than today and still believe the lie. We rescued the children. No one died. There's the food in the coaches, and we'll have that inside by nightfall tomorrow. We've water. We've strong walls. We've... Reese died. I didn't know him very well, but then who among us really knows anyone that well? We're all strangers, who've no choice but to be in one another's company. That's called a family, Chester, and I'm not going to allow you to bring me down, not today. Fair enough. But there's something else you need to know. The lifeboat's fuel tank has a leak. We can't use the engine again. Oh? Well, that's for the best, she said. It is? Yes. Without the illusory hope of an escape route, 
with the knowledge that this here is it. People will have to work harder. Maybe, he said, although his tone suggested he disagreed. I'll drain the tank. Added to what we've got left, there's enough to get a car about a hundred miles. But I'm not banking on it getting me any further than the outskirts of London. I might reach Wales in a week. It might take a month. Have you decided what you'll do then? When the boat comes? I don't know. Do you think we can rely on them for food? Probably. There's an obvious advantage in not having all the human beings on the planet nestled up against a nuclear power plant. They had grain to spare, and they'll need a fairly decent-sized ship to take all those kids away. So there's not much point bringing it here empty. But what I meant was, well, do you think you'll stay in London? I think so, she said. They may have electricity, but otherwise not much else that we don't, or that we can't. And they have some ideas that I think we can do without. With a little work, and if we don't have to worry about every single meal, I think we can make something new here. Maybe something better, even if it looks a lot like something very old. You'd rather Jay be the penniless king of London than the rich peasant? No, I get that, I really do. Parents always want to give their kids the best possible chance in life, he sighed. And it's not my place to tell you whether you're right or wrong. Time will do that. They'll want to send people here, doctors, soldiers, the kind of people you need to make a place like this work. But they're also the kind more used to giving orders than taking them. You ready for that? If you pick them, make sure they're, well, the right kind of people. You know what I mean? Sure. And what about Mac? he asked. She'll leave, I'm certain of it. I'm surprised she hasn't volunteered to go with you. A journey through an undead land, that's not her kind of risk. But yeah, you're probably right. And Hannah? You think she'll mind you taking over? I think she'd probably be safer in Wales, Nilda said. I don't know if she'll stay. If she does, well, I haven't forgotten how this all came about. And if I've learned anything, it's my own limitations. Hannah, Tuck and myself will run the place together. The three of you? Yeah, I figured it'd be something like that. She knew instantly what he meant, but clamped her mouth down on a rushed amendment. Backtracking would make it worse. More than that, any comment would lead to a question, one that she wasn't sure how to answer. I suppose the radiation from those bombs in Kent must have been blown out to sea, she said instead. Maybe, he said, closing his eyes. Probably. But it's still odd, though, she said, speaking quickly to fill the now uncomfortable silence. I mean, it doesn't tally with what they said over the sat phone. No. Well, I've an idea about that. It's not really an idea. More a hypothesis, I suppose. But it's not important. Not now. When I get to Anglesey, they can get their satellites to prove it. Prove what? she asked. It doesn't matter. Telling you would just give you something else to worry over. Now. If I'm to leave tomorrow, I really need to sleep. Disconsolate, confused, almost wishing life was back to being as simple as worrying about whether they'd live through the next hour, Nilda left Chester and found herself wandering aimlessly through the courtyard. Nilda! Nilda! Constance, what's the matter? It's the children. They have so little and they need so much. Show me, Nilda said. Nilda took the proffered list. She turned the page, and another. It was extensive. They don't need half these things, Nilda raised a hand. They may want them, but they don't need them. Like I said yesterday, shoes, clothes, toothbrushes. We just need to know if we've got the essentials. Yes, there are enough clothes left by the warders' families, Constance said. And there are always those costumes they sold in the gift shops. Not that I like the idea of dressing them as princes and princesses, but that's not what I'm worried about. It's medicines. That's this page here. Nilda looked at the list. She recognized a few of the brand names and recognized a few others whose names the children had misremembered. This is an antidepressant, she said, pointing at one halfway down. Is it? Constance asked. Next to... Is that Simone or Simon? Simone, Constance said. She was very definite about it being important. She's survived the last eight months without it. I think she'll be fine. 
How old is she? Eight. And on antidepressants? What kind of school was that? Well, Constance stammered, defensive by proxy. What about these? And histamines? Do any of the kids seem like they have allergies? Not really. Then they're fine, Nilda said. When I mentioned it, I really meant things like insulin for diabetes. Did you ask Inspector Stiles? I did. He said they hadn't had access to anything stronger than aspirin since March. Well, take that list to Hannah. If she thinks any are important, then we'll see what we can do. But really, the children seem fine. And as for everything else, she added kindly, quickly detaching the rest of the list, we'll organise a looting expedition, just as soon as we brought that food in from the coaches. Okay. Mollified, Constance left. It would make a nice change going out looking for clothes and shoes, and yes, perhaps some toys for the children. Secure the food supply first, and then get people organised. Get them working in teams with specific tasks and set goals. There was certainly more than enough work to keep everyone occupied. What she needed was a pen and some paper. Actually, what she really wanted was something to eat. They had enough food now that some could be spared. She set off towards the dining hall. Stuart was there, scrubbing at tables. Got to keep it clean, he said as she entered. Can't have the kids getting sick. No, no, of course not, Nilda said. Are you here on your own? Constance was meant to be helping, but she's disappeared. Aisha, too, but she said she felt like she wanted to throw up. That's why I'm cleaning, in case there's a bug. She's... Nilda began, but stopped. It was Tuck who'd confirmed Aisha's pregnancy when they had got back from Kent. Nilda had suspected as much. But if Aisha wanted to keep it a secret, it wasn't her place to start telling everyone. I'll give you a hand, she offered. But I could do with something to eat. Is there anything left? From lunch? No. Those kids ate it all. They eat a lot, don't they, children? Always eating. There should be some biscuits in the storeroom. Enough to spare? she asked, her stomach growling eagerly. Oh, yeah. We're still a few days away from having to use any of the stores. They came from Liverpool Street, the train station, Stuart mumbled. Dev, he found him. One per person, in first class. There's a list. Nilda paused that until she'd deciphered the meaning. She went into the kitchen and found a clipboard hanging from the wall. It was a reassuringly long list. Some entries were short, containing little more than a name and a number, such as rice, 25 kilograms. Others gave mouth-wateringly precise detail, such as love it and baker, chocolate chip biscuits, two boxes times 100 packets, times two biscuits per pack. She looked around the kitchen. It was immaculate. The steel gleamed, the fresh fruit and vegetables were neatly arranged on the counter, and the packets on the shelves were well organised. Even the knives were neatly ordered, aligned perfectly with the well-scrubbed chopping boards they sat on. It was all very reassuring. Stuart came into the kitchen, the disinfectant spray dangling from his hand. You find them? he asked. I was looking at the list, and your kitchen. It's impressive. Oh, the list isn't mine. I just do the cooking, Stuart said. You don't look after the storeroom? Don't need to. Not yet. That's why they call it stores. Three more days. He looked slowly around the kitchen, his eyes falling on the fresh food. He picked up a carrot and moved it from one pile to another. Maybe two. Then we'll start on the stores. But there's the food outside. Not sure how much that is. The longer we leave it, the better. Make sure you cross those biscuits off when you take them. That's important. That much was written in bold red letters at the top of the list. She scanned down the page, turned to the next, then the third. Nothing's been crossed off, she said. Yeah, I don't think people hand in everything they find, you know, Stuart said. They go out, find something nice, and they keep it for themselves. Well, fair enough, I say. I mean, we've all been hungry. We know what hunger can do. Terrible, terrible things. So everyone keeps a bit aside. And what does it matter as long as everyone has enough? That's all that matters, right? As long as they cross off what they take. We don't want to be eating the stores, you see. Because when we do, it means people have run out of their own private supplies. That's when the trouble will start. When people will change. We can't run out of food. That'll be the end. Can't have that. Not now. Not ever. 
You know Chester's going to Anglesey tomorrow, Nilda said. He'll come back with food. If they're still there. They might not be. They might have nothing to spare. And then what? No. We can't rely on the kindness of strangers. Not unless they can rely on us. And they can't do that unless we know we can rely on ourselves. That's why the stores are important. Nilda nodded and smiled, but decided it was time to give up. Stuart seemed to have brief moments of lucidity, followed by periods of utter detachment. She took the flashlight from the hook, opened the door, and went to search for the biscuits. She was immediately struck by the size of the room and the sheer number of boxes. Since the dining hall had been barely half full with a hundred people in it that morning, she supposed the tower must have catered for thousands a day. As she ran the light down the rows of mostly brown cardboard mixed with the multicoloured packaging of the more expensive brands, she had a flashback to her previous life and smiled at the memory. She scanned the light along the shelves until she found the one containing the biscuits. It was empty. Disappointment mixed with irritation. Whoever had eaten them could, if not cross them off the list, at least have removed the empty box. She tracked the light left and right, looking for something else vaguely snackable. There was a label that read, Brazil Nuts. She checked the box. It, too, was empty. Don't panic, she told herself. Don't let dark thoughts turn fear into fact. She tried another box, and a third. It was only when she reached the sixth that she found one with something inside it, two small bags of rice. Slowly, methodically, she went through the room, checking each box against the list Stuart had given her. When she'd finished, she found there was enough food for one hundred meals, but only if you really stretched out that rice. Again, she told herself not to panic. It was bad stock management, nothing more. She repeated that, standing in the near dark, trying to convince herself that everything was okay. "'Tell me again how this works?' she asked Stuart back in the kitchen. "'What food do you use for cooking?' "'Fresh food. Anything that'll expire. That's all here,' he said. "'Anything we're keeping for the long term, that goes in the storeroom.' "'Right. So how often do you go in there?' she asked. "'I don't. I've got everything I need here. Two thousand calories a day. That's what we're on. I've got it marked down in the ledger over. Right, and this list?' she said, tapping the clipboard. Was this started back when you were all in Kirkman House? Oh, no. We started that when we were putting everything away. She opened the kitchen cupboards, hoping against hope that somehow the missing food would have found its way in there. There just weren't enough cupboards. A few did contain food, but not nearly enough. Is everything all right? Stuart asked. It's fine, she said. But it wasn't. After they'd eaten what was in the kitchen... They'd have to start on the stores, and it turned out they hadn't got any left. And how often do people come and help themselves? she asked. Well, check the list. They'll have crossed it off. But no one has crossed anything out, she said. Exactly, he said, as if that answered anything. Perhaps it did. What about Hannah and the food for the animals? she asked. Oh, no, that doesn't go in. We separated out all the food that would do as feed. No additives, that sort of thing. That's all in her store over in the keep. And how much time do you spend in here? She asked. Well, there's cooking, and then there's the cleaning up. Most of the time, I suppose. Except when there's other work to be done, I mean. Yes, yes, I know. She looked at him, and properly this time. The man was a shadow of whoever he'd formerly been. It was her fault. Or Hannah's or someone's for letting responsibility fall on his shoulders. I have to go, she said. You said you'd help with dinner. I'll send someone, she said, and almost immediately forgot as she went outside. She heard the buzzing of the drone as it flew overhead, followed by the sound of children yelling and running after it. She found no cheer in the sound. They needed the food outside the castle walls more than ever. But for now, it was safer where it was. She looked around. What should she do? What could she do? An idea came to her. Set a thief, she murmured, and went to find Chester.
He was where she'd left him, sitting in the chair, surrounded by maps, his eyes closed. Nilda, he asked, then opened an eye. Yep, thought it was you. You have this firm walk, as if you're determined to get somewhere, and the ground better play along or get out of the... We have a problem, she interrupted. Another one? A big one, she said. We're missing food from the storeroom. A lot of food. How much? Almost all of it. At best, there's three days left. More likely, it's two. This is a list of everything that's come in and meant to have gone into the stores. Most of it came from Kirkman House. You see here, at the end, that's what's actually there. There's a few bags of rice, a dozen tins, some sugar, not much else. He took the list and glanced at it. Well, it doesn't look good. But does it matter? We've got all that stuff from the... Chester, listen! I'm saying it's been stolen! He looked down the list again. Biscuits, ice and sugar, nuts. It's stuff people would have snacked on. Did anyone tell them not to? Two things. First, they left the empty boxes in there. I mean, surely you can't be saying that people got peckish, went in, found the place nearly empty, and didn't say anything. Well, perhaps it's... Second, she interrupted. Forgetting the fact that no one snacks on icing sugar, we're missing at least 25 kilos of rice. Who eats raw rice? Chester glanced at the list again. You can't eat raw rice, and you can't cook it without people knowing. Are you sure it was ever here? Stuart says the list was written when they arrived from Kirkman House. You see here, that's the entry for the rice. That's Hannah's handwriting. So it almost certainly was put in there. Could an empty box have been put in there and marked as full? No, he said, answering his own question before Nilda could. One box, sure. Two, maybe, but not all of them. All right, so someone took it. They couldn't have eaten it all, so it's been hidden. Not a bad idea, that, the empty boxes. I take it these entries at the bottom of the things found more recently. And that food was actually there, right? And it was all near the door? Yes, exactly, she said. So we're dealing with a professional. McKinnery? No, I don't think so, he said. She was about to ask how he could be so sure when he continued. She'd have added rocks to the empty boxes for that extra layer of authenticity. No, it's not her kind of crime. Where's the profit in it? Besides, she wouldn't have had the opportunity since she came back from the museum. Nor would Tuck, Jay, or the others. If not her, then who? Well, I suppose Stuart is the obvious suspect. I honestly can't believe he would. Not with his obsession about calories and people not going hungry. He's had the opportunity, and you've just given him motive. Perhaps he's been hiding it deliberately. No, I don't think so, she said. He hasn't got enough neurons firing in the right direction to manage something that subtle. Perhaps not, Chester said, unconvinced. OK, so not him. I'd say that leaves you as the prime suspect, squirrelling away food to keep your son from starving like you did back in Penrith. Except I know you've not had the time either. And that leaves pretty much everyone else. That doesn't help. But if they weren't eating it, why would anyone steal the supplies? Either they're doing it out of preemptive self-preservation, or so they can play the hero when we run out. Whichever it is, how much danger are you in? You mean that we've got the food from the mansion, and you'll soon be back with a boat laden with supplies, she said. What if it keeps happening? What if it all goes missing during the depths of winter, when no boat can reach us? What if you don't make it to Wales? What then? Yeah, OK. You know, there's someone else who we can be certain didn't do it. Styles, our very own detective inspector. This should be right up his alley. And this is what you call safety, is it? Styles snapped. A toxic river and no fresh food, except it turns out there's no food at all because you've got a thief in your midst. Do the people in Wales even exist? They do, Chester said. Frankly, I'll believe it when I'm standing on the deck of a boat, waving goodbye to this place. Look, Inspector, Chester growled. You can complain all you like, but the children are safer here than in Kent and it'll be easier to get them out by boat when it comes. And it won't until you leave, Stiles said, 
And when is that going to be? When we've got to the bottom of this, Nilda said. There's a thief here. I'm certain of it. Or, she added, perhaps it's someone spun mad by the outbreak now driven to hide and hoard food. It doesn't matter which. If we'd not gone down to that farm, if Chester had gone north to get help from Anglesey, we'd have starved before it arrived. Then go to Anglesey. See if they can bring some law and order to this place, Stiles snapped. We don't need to go quite that far, Chester said. Not when we've got you here, Detective Inspector. Right, Stiles breathed out. Yeah, OK. Who are the suspects? There's Stuart, Chester said. The cook, Stiles asked. If it was him, he doesn't know he is doing it, Nilda said. He's not, well, he's been pretty twisted by all that's happened since the outbreak. He could have done it, though. He's obsessed with food, making sure there's enough of it, Chester said. But everyone's obsessed with that, Nilda said. He's a cook. He has access, the inspector said. Right? Yes, Nilda allowed. There you are, then. He probably did it. Or possibly didn't, Nilda said. But how do we prove it? I don't see that as my problem, Stiles said. I'll take the children and our food, and we'll take over one wing of this place. We'll hand out the supplies one day at a time until you come back with that boat. Your food is still mostly outside the walls, Chester said. Even if it was inside, you can't stop us from taking it. I see. It's like that, is it? And this is why we need to catch that thief. Look at us. Here, now, Nilda sighed. OK. So how do we find out who actually did it? What about fingerprints? They put the boxes back, so whichever set is on every box has to be the thief's. Possibly, I suppose so. But we don't have a kit, Stiles said. Any fine powder will do, Chester said. You must have been at at least one crime scene where you ran out. I work special branch, not robbery, Stiles said. Special branch? With the Met? Chester asked. Out of Scotland Yard, Stiles said. For how long? Chester asked. For the last five years. I see. He stood up. You're not police. What do you mean? Nah, you see, I thought I didn't recognise you. On its own, it doesn't add up to much. But you're not like any Rosa I've ever met. And special branch? You must have got that from the telly. What do you mean? Nilda asked. They rebranded it as counter-terrorism at the beginning of the century, Chester said. So, who are you? Fine, Stiles said. I'm not police. I was underground with a bunch of screaming children while some battleship was bombarding us. Being a figure of authority was a comfort to them. How was I supposed to know that I'd end up stuck with them? The lie didn't matter. Of course it didn't. I mean, under what possible circumstances could it matter? And how does it matter now, since I'm clearly not your thief? Yeah, but out of all the professions you could have chosen, why police? Chester asked. After what they did. He's right, it doesn't matter, Nilda said. We're all entitled to reinvent ourselves. But since everyone else actually thinks you're a detective, we might as well let the lie stand. It could be useful, though it doesn't get us any closer to finding out who did it. DNA's out, so is CCTV, Stiles said, clearly eager to move the conversation along. I suppose you could do fingerprinting. I mean, how hard can it actually be? But you'd need to take everyone's prints, and I guess the best way of doing that is when you interrogate them. But have you thought about what will happen when you start doing that? As soon as you announce there's a thief here, people will pick out their own favourite suspect, and those suspicions will linger long after you find out who did it. The man's got a point, Chester said. We could say that this is a stock error, a miscalculation, and because of it, we're going to have to keep far tighter track of food from now on. Keep it under lock and key, and give fewer people access, and make sure those are people you know you can trust. No, Nilda said. If we can't find the thief, then I think I have a better long-term solution. But we shouldn't give up. Chester, how would you do it? Steal it, you mean? Well, getting it out of the stockroom isn't hard. The difficult part is moving it to somewhere 
it won't be found. How do you know that? Stiles asked. I've got a lot of experience with law enforcement, Chester said. So you think it'll be hidden in the castle? Nilda asked. I doubt it, Chester said. You have to assume that Fogarty knows every tunnel and secret passageway. There's too great a chance he'd stumble over it. If he did, then everything will be discovered. So, if I was hiding it inside, I'd have to kill the old soldier. Since he's still alive, I'd say the food was outside. Surely we'd have noticed someone going out with a full bag, Nilda said. Clearly not, Chester said. But if it was me, I'd move it at night. Tuck sleeps on that tower. She'd have seen. Only if she was awake, and only if our thief went over that section of wall. And why should they? You know, the more I think about it, the more that makes sense. Why is it that there are more undead around in the mornings than in the evenings? They must hear something at night. Well, where outside could they be stashing the food? Stiles asked. It could be anywhere, Chester said. A restaurant, an office, one of the churches, or any place, really. But wherever it is, it won't be far. Somewhere you can walk to from the castle, get inside, and then get back quickly. It will take a while to find, and we want this over with tonight. We'll have to lay a trap, and that'll be simple enough. But you're right. When people are told, they'll need proof. Something that will allow them to believe it's over. That the thief is caught, and it won't happen again. Fingerprinting might be a bit beyond us, but I think we can manage CCTV. First, they enlisted the help of Jay and Tuck. When they told them what had happened, Jay didn't want to believe it. Tuck didn't seem surprised. After the evening meal, Jay stood up to propose that due to their suddenly increased numbers, any personal stashes of food should be handed in to be added to the stores. He also suggested that as soon as they gathered the food from outside, they should conduct a more thorough inventory. Then they should bottle, pickle, or smoke as much as they could. When the ship from Anglesey arrived, they could then trade for supplies, even if it was only with a token gesture. The idea was met with almost universal enthusiasm. When Nilda saw this, and that most people did want to stay in the tower and try to create a functioning society, a small glimmer of trust was restored. After people had brought their few private supplies to the kitchen, and after Nilda had sent Stuart to get some sleep, they hid the drone with its camera facing the doorway. It couldn't be left in the storeroom itself, since there was no light in there. There was usually none in the kitchen at night, save that from the dying embers of the fire. They left a solitary lantern on an empty table that would, they hoped, give enough illumination to make the face of the thief visible on the recording. They then retreated up to the second story above the dining hall to wait. Jay sat with the laptop on his knees. Chester, Nilda and Stiles peered over his shoulder. Tuck looked relaxed, leaning against a wall, only the hand occasionally dropping to the hilt of her bayonet, betraying any tension. I think, Jay said, that the battery might last for another four hours. What do we do if no one comes? Whatever happens, I'm leaving with the morning tide, Chester said. If it wasn't for the children, I'd say you should all come with me. But the children are here. Styles said. And we can't leave them, Nilda added. If we don't catch someone, we'll say it was a stopkeeping error and keep the food under lock, key and guard. Tuck's hands moved. What's that? Styles asked. If no one comes tonight, then we find more cameras, Jay said. We keep watch every night because this won't just stop. After that, they sat quietly, watching the small screen. Chapter 12 25th of September It was nearly 2am when a shadow appeared. Nilda nudged Chester. I saw it, he whispered. Everyone remember their role. Then let's get this done. Make sure it keeps recording, Nilda whispered glad that the camera gave her son a task that would keep him away from what would happen next. She was equally grateful that the drone software didn't allow it to transmit sound. She was at the bottom of the stairs and at the rear of the small group when they saw a figure 
emerge from the kitchens. Nilda saw Tuck move, but Chester moved faster. He leaped over a table, one hand reaching out to grab the figure's throat, the other punching out in a low jab. The figure dropped, supported only by Chester's hand around their neck. It was then that the enormity of what they were doing and what would come next swept over Nilda. Before she could yell at Chester to let the figure go, he released his hand, and the suspected thief fell to the floor. A bit of light would be nice, Chester hissed. Nilda turned on the flashlight and shone it down. It was Graham. With Chester pinning the man to the floor, Tuck began a quick but thorough search of the man, checking for weapons. He didn't have any. Chester glanced up at Nilda. He was waiting for her to speak, but her mouth was dry and the words wouldn't come. You have any handcuffs on you, Inspector? Chester growled, pressing a knee further into Graham's back. Sorry, no, Stahl said. I left them back at the mansion. Not much call for them these past few months. Well, it doesn't matter, Chester continued after a glance at Nilda. He gave Graham's arm another twist. Talk about bad luck, mate. The one adult left in Kent turns out to be one of Scotland Yard's finest, and just when we discover we've a thief in our midst. It's more than luck, Stiles said, sticking to his part perfectly. It's serendipity. Fingerprints, that was your undoing. We lifted a set from everyone at dinner and compared them to the boxes. We knew it was you. They wanted to confront you in front of everyone. He knelt down next to the man, but I said wait because as a dog returneth to his vomit, a criminal always returns to the scene. Stiles glanced at Nilda. They talked about it earlier, planned what each was going to say and when, and in what order, so as best to elicit a confession. During those dying hours of daylight, it had seemed so simple. Now, as she looked down, it seemed so false, so fake, so far from anything that approached justice, that the very idea of the charade made her sick. Check that bag, Nilda said. Graham had come out of the storeroom, carrying a small holdall. Tuck picked it up and slowly emptied it onto the table. It was a mix of items that had gone into the store that afternoon. What struck Nilda, however, was how small a selection it was. Chester and Stiles were waiting, she knew. The line she was meant to use, the one Chester had said would work, but which she had thought sounded trite even then, now seemed nothing but perverse. Do you have anything to say? she asked instead. Graham gasped something. Let him up, Nilda said, pulling out a chair. Let him sit down. Chester pulled the man to his feet and pushed him into the chair. Well, what about it? You were caught literally stealing from the mouths of children, he said, extemporizing on the theme Nilda was meant to have followed. What have you got to say for yourself? Graham raised a hand to rub at his neck. He looked around and finally met Nilda's eyes. There was no fear in the gaze. Is this it? he asked. This is how it's going to be. You accuse me and that counts as justice. What about a trial and a jury of my peers? What would be the point? Stiles asked. We've caught you red-handed. Do you have anything you want to say in your defence? Defence? Graham snapped. What the hell is this? You haven't told me what I've done. Nilda had been meant to. That had been one of her lines. Lines, she thought, as if this was some kind of play. But if it was, they should have given more thought to how this act was going to end. But yeah, okay, Graham continued. I've got something I want to say. I want to know what everyone else thinks about this. What about Hannah? I see she's not here. She doesn't need to be. Chester said. No, Nilda said. He's right. We should get her. I'll send Jay. She turned around and saw her son standing by the staircase. In that moment, she knew that it was the right decision, and possibly the first correct one she'd made since discovering the theft. When Jay returned, Hannah was with him. So was McKinnery. Evening, Mac, Chester said. Couldn't sleep. Who can sleep on nights like these? She replied. Jay told me that Graham was stealing food, Hannah said, and that you caught him in the act. Is that true? Nilda wasn't sure to whom the question was addressed, but when Graham didn't reply, decided that she should. We have video of him entering the storeroom and filling that bag there, she said. It's not the first time he's done it. 
The stores are mostly empty, gone, stolen. The boxes left, their contents taken. Well, that's... Hannah stumbled, clearly uncertain what to say. Gone. We've enough for two days, maybe three. No more, Nilda said. I see. Well, Graham, what do you have to say? Hannah asked. That food belongs to everyone, Graham said. I was just taking my share. What? All the food we had? You think that's your fair share? Chester asked. No, but that bag there is, Graham said calmly. Too calmly, Nilda thought. Why? Hannah asked. Because I'm leaving. That's enough to keep me going for a week, and I reckon that will be long enough. You're leaving? To go where? Hannah asked. Away from here, Graham said. I was going to leave months ago. I should have. Now, with all those kids, and all this talk of Anglesey, well, it's nothing but talk, isn't it? But you have proof that the stores were taken by him, Hannah asked. Before Nilda could reply, Stiles answered. We've got fingerprints, he said. Ah, Hannah brightened. Of course, yes, Detective Inspector Stiles. Fingerprints. That's good. That's proof. And I'd like to see them, too, Graham replied. Nilda wondered if there was a trace of a smile lurking under that angry facade. If you're going to accuse me, then I want a trial in front of everyone. Present your evidence. Let everyone judge me. Nilda could feel the house of cards shaking and understood what Chester had meant when he'd said that it had to be dealt with quickly and quietly. That's a bad idea, McKinnery said. Nilda looked at her and then back at Graham. McKinnery's expression was as unreadable as ever. Then, tomorrow morning I... Hannah began. I think we need to talk, Nilda cut in. Leaving Tuck and Jay to stand guard over Graham, they went into the kitchen. A trial would be best, Hannah said. We present the evidence and let everyone see that justice is done. And then what? McKinnery asked. If you stand up and say that this man was caught stealing food, and then present the evidence and ask for people to decide on his innocence, you know that they will find him guilty. Then what do you do? Lock him up? That would mean he was fed, but didn't have to work. That's hardly the precedent you want to set. Or would you sentence him to hard labour? Except isn't that what we're all doing every day? Or would you prefer something more permanent? There's an executioner's axe in one of the exhibits in the keep. Should I fetch it? Crime should be dealt with in the light of day, Hannah said, not swept away under cover of darkness. We present the proof and do so trusting in the sound judgment of our fellows. We can't prove it, Nilda said. That fingerprints thing was a ruse. All we've got on him is that he came out of the storeroom with a bag. And that isn't a crime. McKinnery said. He did it, Chester stated. I can tell. He's guilty as sin. As Mac says, a trial's pointless. Declaring suspicion is as good as a statement of guilt. So why don't you all go back to bed and I'll take care of this? Tomorrow, we'll say that he stole the food and ran away. We chased him and he was ripped apart by the undead. Once word of that gets around, there won't be any more thefts, whether someone else was involved or not. You mean... You're going to kill him? Hannah asked, shocked. He's a person, Chester, not one of the undead. And what if he's telling the truth? What if he's innocent? No, I forbid it. At the very least, we should have a trial. We should be open and honest with one another, especially when it comes to matters of dishonesty such as this. Nilda wanted to yell at the woman for her naivety, but she couldn't, because in her heart she wasn't convinced Hannah was wrong. Then... Exile him, Nilda said. He said he was leaving, so let him go. Right now, tonight. We can tell everyone that he ran, but we won't kill him. He gets what he wants, and we've dealt with a thief. The matter will end. And what about the food he squirreled away somewhere outside? Chester asked. There's a limit to how much he can carry, Nilda said. We'll look for it tomorrow. We'll find it. There can't be many places it's hidden. Are you all agreed on that? Chester asked. I see. This is a mistake, but it's your mistake. And if I'm leaving tomorrow, you're the ones who'll have to deal with it. Good night. He left. I agree, Stiles said. It is a mistake, one I hope I don't regret you making. If you'll excuse me, I'll go and check on the children. 
Nilda pulled the last of the bolts and opened the thick wooden gate. Go, and if you value your life, go far, she said. Graham ignored her and pushed past. Nilda slammed the door closed, perhaps a little louder than she needed to. That's over, she said. It's over, she said again, looking this time at McKinnery. Is it? McKinnery asked. I hope so. Why would he want to come back? Hannah asked. Revenge is a strange beast. More potent than fear, McKinnery said. But that wasn't what I meant. When we tell everyone what he did, there will be a shift in attitudes. Some may want to go after him. Others will just want to leave. But there's a risk that many will never want to leave here again. Do we have to tell them? Hannah asked. That he did it, I mean? Tuck nodded. Her hands moved. She says that the truth of his guilt is now immaterial, McKinnery translated. It is better that people have someone to blame. I agree. The matter is over. We need to draw a line under it. And we'll tell everyone tomorrow morning, and that will be that, Hannah said. Yes, it was a grim business, but there's more than enough to worry about without fretting over the past. Indeed, McKinnery said. And so here we are, the soldier, the mother, the idealist, and the... other. It is poetic, don't you think? I think it's late, Nilda said. Good night. Nilda woke to the sound of rain beating against the window. When she opened her eyes, there was so little light she assumed it was still night. She closed them again and tried to escape back into that half-dreamed fantasy of being back in Penrith, where Jay would soon need to be prodded out of bed for school. There was a sound of small feet splashing through a puddle, followed by a high-pitched yelp and a child laughing. She sighed and pulled the covers up higher. There was a cold chill emanating from the old stones that promised a hard winter to come. It reminded her of those months when she couldn't afford to turn the boiler on and had to rely on the second-hand heat from their neighbours to keep the pipes from freezing. Those had been hard times, tough times, harder on her than on Jay, as he'd not known of her secret shame at being glad the teenager's aversion to water meant he skipped a few showers. There was another laugh from outside, louder this time, and quickly followed by an even louder shh. Reluctant to let the fantasy fade, she darted a hand out from under the covers, rummaging around for the old pine chair she used as a night table. She found the watch though it was ornate enough to be classified as jewellery and heavy enough to be called a paperweight. She wrenched her hand back into the relative warmth, dropping the watch onto the mattress a safe distance from her body. How long did it take gold to warm up? It was a good conductor, wasn't it? The watch was one of many that had come from a jeweller's near monument. There was no price tag, and the name wasn't the one brand that she recognised, but Jester had assured her that it was worth something in the five-figure range. That reminded her that he was leaving today. She sighed, reached down, picked up the still-cold metal, and raised it to her face. It was almost eight, according to their local time. She pulled herself out of bed with genuine regret. As she dressed, she wondered what time it was on Anglesey, and whether they might adopt some new or old standard when communication was established. Fogarty was the only one who'd managed to keep a clock going almost since before the outbreak. For everyone else, they were objects easily broken in a life of violent labour. The old warder's clock had been carved out of a solid oak timber that the tide had brought floating up to the traitor's gate almost a century before. A prisoner had carved a series of scenes into the wood. If interpreted clockwise, they showed a sequence of crime, punishment and repentance. If you read the scenes counterclockwise, they told the story of a man unfairly punished. At least, that's what Nilda thought, and she wondered if that had been the secret intent of this now forgotten prisoner. The carving was inexpert, and the mechanism matched. It needed winding once every twenty-three hours, and Fogarty had freely admitted he'd forgotten on more than one occasion. When it had to be reset, he'd use the overhead sun as an indication of noon. Daylight savings was finally a thing of the past. They could switch to tower meantime. It made as much sense as Greenwich had. 
thinking of the images carved on that clock, reminded her of what had transpired the previous night. She gave one last deeper sigh and left the room, knowing that the real work of the day would be in ensuring that the tower's fragile community was not destroyed by the news of the theft. The announcement, made by Hannah, was met with far less drama than Nilda had expected. In fact, it was met almost with silence. That was doubly unsettling. Not just because it suggested that the real reaction would come later, but also because she was nearly convinced Graham hadn't acted alone. She watched everyone closely, ready to pounce on the merest hint of suspicious behaviour. She only stopped when she asked herself exactly what kind of behaviour she was expecting anyone to exhibit, and what precisely she'd do if she spotted it. It was wishful thinking, she supposed, that a confession from someone else would mean McKinnery wasn't involved. Why she would want to take their supplies, Nilda couldn't fathom. But then, she could see no reason why anyone would, beyond the obvious. Chester was absent from the dining hall, half expecting that he'd already left, and uncertain whether she would prefer that. She went looking for him. She found him standing in the doorway to the keep, his eyes fixed on the courtyard and its growing puddles. "'You can't go today,' she said. "'Not yet, but maybe later. A storm like this will blow itself out,' he said. "'Give it an hour or so.' "'Sure,' she said, and tried to think of something to say. "'What about Styles? "'What do you think he used to do?' "'Maybe he was an actor,' Chester said. "'Or just someone who liked watching crime shows a bit too much. "'It doesn't matter.' "'I talked to Jay. "'He said that when he went to fetch Hannah, "'McKinnery was wandering around the castle,' Nilda said. "'What's odd about that?' "'Well, nothing, I suppose. "'But she would have known the detectives at Scotland Yard, "'wouldn't she?' "'Possibly.' Chester said. But probably not all of them. But she'd have guessed that he wasn't really police as quickly as you did, Nilda said. And told Graham, you mean? So the man knew he had nothing to fear from fingerprinting or anything else? Who knows? But, he added, I think the most important thing for you to do now is ensure that nothing like that happens again. I was thinking better stock control and having rotors so the oversight was shared out over everyone but it doesn't answer my question. No, because I don't think there is an answer to it. McKinnery's probably up to something, but only because she always was. Some habits are impossible to break, and if we sat here long enough, we could come up with a plausible theory, or three, as to why she might want to get rid of all that food. But it would just be theories. She'd never admit it, and unless she did, you're still going to suspect her. In fact, if she did admit it, You'd suspect she'd only done so to hide something even bigger. No, there's no way of proving anything now. But as I say, that doesn't matter, not now. When I said you don't want a repeat of it, I didn't mean the thefts. Those won't happen again. I meant last night. You've got to sort out who's in charge here, what the rules are, and what you'll do if they're broken. Leadership by committee isn't going to work. Nilda agreed. There just wasn't much she could do about it. She searched around for a change in subject and realised that Chester's eyes were glued on a point in the courtyard. What are you looking at? she asked. He pointed at one of the deeper puddles. It's one of the dosimeters we took from the airport. Is there a problem? she asked, feeling that old fear there had been with her since the Isle of Scara resurfacing. I don't know. Let's see. He dashed out into the rain, grabbed the small device, and darted back into the lee of the doorway. It's okay. I mean, it's high. Higher than we got down in Kent, but it's still well below dangerous. I think the rain's washing down radioactive particles caught up in the stratosphere. The stratosphere? she asked, failing to keep the smile from her lips. What? A man can't read a book? There was one on nuclear war? No, he admitted. It was just a physics textbook. I was actually looking up radio signals. I was thinking about the gear they used back in Kirkman House and the stuff I drove down to Crystal Palace. I was thinking, well, how hard could it be to make one? A radio transmitter? Well, yeah. I mean, two-way communication is going to be difficult. But just sending out a radio signal on a wide frequency, that should be possible. And is it? 
I've no idea. I gave up around the time I got to wavelengths. That's when I started looking up radiation. Ah. Oh. She stared at the rain and considered what he'd said. You were looking for a way not to go to Wales? she asked. No, a backup plan, in case I don't make it. Oh, she said, and tried to work out what to say next. But I'll leave as soon as the rain stops. I'm all packed. He gestured at a pair of bags. The rifle was leaning next to them. I'll use the lifeboat to drift downriver and go ashore somewhere east of the airport. I'll find a car and a bicycle and be ready to set off tomorrow at dawn. Yes, OK. She wasn't sure what else to say. If you want, I can get rid of McKinnery before I leave. You mean... You know what I mean, Chester said. I don't think you could do it, not in cold blood. Tuck could, but I don't know if she would. No one will know. Except you and me, she said. Why haven't you already done it? Because I don't think she was involved. She's not a nice person, not deep down. In fact, she's the old world's definition of a bad one. But she wasn't here to steal that food. She was in the British Museum. So, if you want her gone, I'll do it. But not on my own account. It's not easy taking her life. Graham, well, we'll never know what he was up to. But he was dangerous. We all saw that. And you didn't want him killed. McKinnery's dangerous too, Nilda said. Right, but not to us. I think her sights are set on Anglesey and the prize there. This place is never going to be big enough for her now. You're not sure? I'm not sure about much these days, he said. But like I said, you need to sort out who's running this place. And if it's going to be you, then you've got to take the hard choices. If you think everyone will be safer without her, then you've got to make the call. You've got to say the word. I... I don't know, she said. Nilda wished Chester had just acted, that she'd woken to find McKinnery missing. Someone stole some food, she said. That's all. Graham's taken the blame and he's gone. We should leave it. Move on. Fair enough, Chester said, and she couldn't tell whether he thought that was the right decision or not. After an awkward few minutes of silence, Nilda went to find Jay. She found that he, too, was lurking in a doorway, watching the rain pound down on old stone, as restless as she was. The drone was at his feet. Tuck was by his side, sharpening an axe. Kevin, Aisha, Greta and Finnegan loitered nearby. "'What's going on?' she asked. "'As soon as the rain stops, I'm sending up the drone,' Jay said. "'If it's clear, we're going to get the food.' "'Just the six of you?' she asked. We'll get more when the time comes, Jay said. I didn't want to tell everyone in advance. Didn't want them worrying while they were waiting. She wasn't sure if they would follow him outside when he did, but the five people there didn't seem to mind obeying his instructions. One more parental string was cut. Feeling increasingly useless, she went to the kitchens and spent a satisfying hour chopping vegetables. Around 2 p.m., the storm slackened. Nilda helped Chester carry the bags and fuel down to the lifeboat, then began another awkward few hours of near silence as they waited for the tide to turn. Before it did, the clouds exploded, this time accompanied by wind and lightning. They were forced off the boat and into the relative shelter of the gatehouse. Afternoon wore into evening, and the storm raged on, showing no sign of ceasing as night fell. Even Tuck was forced to eschew her bivouac and find shelter indoors. Tomorrow I'll leave, Chester said, around midnight. Tomorrow, Nilda said, and again wished she could have found something, anything else to say. 26th of September Chester woke and didn't need to look at a clock to know the time. A beam of daylight had crept around the edge of the imitation tapestry he'd hung over the window and speared down on his face. He pulled himself out of the rough nest. Electric lights, he muttered. If all went well, he wouldn't spend more than an hour on Anglesey, but he was going to spend as much of that time as he could staring at a light bulb. He kicked the sheets into a pile by the wall 
the people who'd arrived from Kirkman House had claimed the small, grace and favour cottages that had been the homes of the warders and their families. Those who had arrived from the British Museum had their choice from the scores of offices, ancient chambers, gift shops, and exhibition rooms. There had been some movement, so that the children could sleep in the warmer, more habitable parts of the castle, but none of them had wanted Chester's room. People had relocated voluntarily, and it was good to know that generosity could be shown when needed. It gave him hope that the tower might not self-destruct in his absence. He picked up the jacket from the bed. That had been volunteered as well. There had been offers of all kinds of assistance that stopped short of accompanying him to Wales. Part of that was just an excuse to talk with him and confirm he really was leaving, but part was a genuine desire to help. He hoped. No, he said. I think it was. They're good people for the most part, and no worse than anyone else. He stretched and found himself looking down at the fake bed. Fit for a king, he muttered. Says it all. The room in St. Thomas's Tower, and the chambers leading from it, had originally been built for the monarch, though Chester couldn't remember which one. When he and Nilda had arrived, it had been unoccupied, partly because he knew his stay was going to be temporary, partly because he'd always been fascinated by how the other half lived, but mostly because there was a bed in the middle of the room he'd claimed it. The bed was a fake, a mock-up based on the historical record. The wood in the grate was real, but the chimney had been sealed, so his attempt at lighting a fire to keep out the interminable chill from the old stone resulted in filling the room with more smoke than heat. He'd taken to sleeping on the floor, but he'd slept in worse places these last few months, and probably would again. Not after I get back from Wales, he said. That time's over. No more wandering. He'd resisted finding better lodgings, because he knew he'd be leaving, and he'd not been sure he would come back. Now he was certain that he would try to return. The question that remained was whether he'd be able to. He reached down to pick up the revolver, and remembered it was gone. Well, that was good in a way. It was his last connection with Cannock, now forever lost. He pulled back the curtain and looked outside. The storm had passed. The sky was clear, bright blue as far as he could see. What was that line? he murmured to himself as he strapped on the belt. The one that was in Bill Wright's diary. If a job's to be done, then it's best done quickly. Something like that. He pulled on the trainers. They were an odd colour, and the last thing he'd have been seen wearing a year ago, but he could run in them, and he would need speed. He left the room, and he didn't look back. I made you breakfast, Nilda said. It's the last of the bacon, at least until we kill another pig. I think we'll try not to do that for a while. Perhaps not until Christmas. We need to keep what little electricity we generate for making hot water. Hot water? Don't we have enough? Chester asked, taking a bite. You don't have much experience with children, do you? No matter what you tell them, they will not stay clean. And it's not like we can get them to wash in bleach. You can't? Okay, no. What about feed? Is there going to be enough? More than enough. I checked. Hannah's actually been a bit sneaky. She had enough to keep the animals alive until the end of November, and since we could eat that too, that's another four weeks of supplies. Clever girl. She's got unplumbed depth, that one. Yes, well, it won't last as long now our numbers have doubled, she said, but it'll keep us going until you get back. We've got to find a way of planting things here. Pots and greenhouses, I suppose, with animal manure as fertiliser. Well, I'm glad that's your problem, he said. Yes, for now, but... She paused, and Chester thought she was going to ask whether he was coming back. She didn't. But I'm coming with you this morning, she said. Chester swallowed. To Anglesey, he asked, and almost told her that she couldn't. I meant down river, she said. We need toothbrushes, clothes and shoes, and a few board games would be good, and toilet paper. We always need more of that. Crayons and pencils, too. Things that will keep the children busy, that won't involve running through puddles and traipsing mud everywhere. When you go ashore, we'll help you find the bike and car, and load up the lifeboat with whatever we can. 
You'll have to use the tide, he said. I mean, I could leave you some of the diesel. No, it would only put off the inevitable, Nilda said. We've got those rafts now, and we need to see what kind of properties line the banks of the river, and how safe it would be to go ashore and empty them. With that leak, the diesel would be gone in one trip. It's time we started getting used to a different pace of life. It'll be good. That business with Graham can't be allowed to overshadow things. We need a new start, all of us. If that means everything we do is focused on those children, then so be it. We'll be thinking about the future, and if we do that, we might start thinking we'll have one. What about the food on the coaches? he asked. Jay seems to have organised that. I suspect with Tuck's help, but I'm leaving him to it. There's too much danger here, Chester. If I spend my time worrying about Jay, he might outlive everyone, but the rest will die far sooner. I've got to... I suppose I have to accept that he managed quite well without me. I have to trust him, and everyone else, if it comes to that. Fair enough, Chester stood. Then let's get this over with. There were six people going with Nilda. Chester considered them as cautiously diligent. They were the people who'd hurriedly volunteered to take care of the pigs, boil the water, or do any of the other laborious tasks that, crucially, didn't require going outside. This would be good practice for them. It wasn't safe relying on the same people to do all the most dangerous chores. Checking that the area outside the tower was clear of the undead was not a task he'd delegate to anyone else. He climbed up the stairs, his mind already on the route he'd take, the safe houses he'd aim for, and what he'd do if he couldn't reach them. The problem was going to be the car, or maximising its use. Wherever he stopped, he couldn't eat the food or drink the water. He'd learned that much from the chapters on radiation in the textbook. Perhaps the train line would be better than a road. In his journal, hadn't Bill Wright written that he'd use the train lines to get out of London? Chester thought so, but had a vague memory that the man had become trapped somewhere by a horde. He stopped abruptly, one foot raised. He wished, not for the first time, that he'd not burn that copy of the journal back in Cumbria. He searched his mind, trying to remember what the man had written. If Bill Wright and all those people with him had survived the passage of a horde, then didn't that mean that his worst fears were wrong? Didn't it mean that it wasn't the undead spreading radiation through the countryside? That was the conclusion he'd reached based on the readings he'd taken in London, and again in Kent. But what did he know about radiation and fallout? Only what he'd guessed at and tried to interpret from books he barely understood. He ran through the routes he'd marked out on the maps in his room. Had the man taken one of those? Were those roads and rail lines actually safe? He'd crossed them out based on guesswork and half-remembered stories from Bran and the others. Perhaps this changed things, or perhaps it didn't. All that mattered was getting to Wales, and he'd already decided that radiation or no, he'd head in as straight a line as possible. Whether he got a lethal dose or not, he would keep going until, and the thought died as he realised what was in front of him, or rather, wasn't. The lifeboat was gone. Out of my way, he yelled, barrelling back down the stairs past the confused group. What? What is it? Nilda called after him. He ignored her. She caught up with him as he was pulling the barrier away from the gatehouse door. What is it, Chester? The boat, he said but he didn't say any more. He had the door open and ran outside, across to the railed gate, and looked down at the river, lapping at the worn steps. He climbed up onto the wall and looked east and west. There was no sign of the boat. Was it dragged away by the storm? Nilda asked. Chester bent and pulled on the rope, still attached to the black painted ring. He held up an end. It's been cut. It was Graham. McKinnery stormed, incandescent with rage. It had to be. She stood, paced a step, sat down, stood again. Yes, I think you're right, Chester said. He'd seen McKinnery in a fury before, but always a quiet one, as if the energy was being reserved for the act of vengeance itself, and so was not to be wasted on mere words. This was something else. He's betrayed us, McKinnery fumed. Yes, yes, Hannah said. We all know that, but 
worse, McKinnery interrupted. He's condemned us. It's not as bad as that, is it? Hannah asked. Well, he's got the lifeboat, Chester said. And that had the rifle, the ammo, the last of the fuel, and a bit of food. He probably had the revolver, too. Chester had assumed the pistol and the four loose rounds had fallen out of his jacket during his journey back from the mansion, but only because there had been no other logical explanation. Now he wasn't so sure. He has a rifle, and we don't even have slings or arrows, McKinnery snapped. He could be waiting in any building, sitting on any rooftop, ready to shoot the first person who leaves. Nah, he won't hang around here, Chester said. He needed the boat so he could transport all that food he stole. Why else would he have risked lingering nearby? He'd have turned the engine on as soon as he dared. About an hour after that, he'd have realised there was something wrong with the fuel tank. There was? Hannah asked. It leaked, Nilda said. We didn't say because we all had enough to worry about, but Chester's right. He'll be out of fuel and at the whims of the tide. If he's lucky, he'll end up on a beach down river. If he's not... He'll be adrift at sea. Well, good, I suppose, Hannah said. But where does that leave us? It doesn't change anything, not really, Chester said. It'll take a little longer to get to Wales, that's all. You said there was a bike shop near to Embankment Tube, Tuck nodded. Well, that's as good a place to start my journey as any other, Chester said. We'll go to, McKinnery said. Find some more rifles and collect the ammunition from that hotel. Do we really need it? Hannah asked. Chester can't row a life raft all the way to Westminster on his own, McKinnery said. And if Graham's coming back, then it's better that we're armed. She has a point, Chester said, and saw Nilda's look of puzzlement. About rowing to Westminster. Better to send one large group and make just one trip. It's like you were saying, Nilda about how we need to accept that things have to be done differently. Those bicycles could be useful, but forget the hotel, Mac. There's nothing there we need. They weren't short of volunteers. Whatever fear and suspicion had gripped them since the revelation of the theft had been replaced with justified anger. The factor determining how many could go was space. They had to leave room on the rafts for any bicycles and other supplies they brought back. Chester had already volunteered Tuck, and he wasn't surprised to see Nilda step forward at the same time as Jay. I... Nilda began. Bring your drone, Jay, Chester interrupted. We can use it to lure the zombies away from the embankment. Right, and the boy ran off before his mother could formulate an objection. McKinnery insisted on going, and Chester didn't bother arguing. Nor did he try to stop Stuart. Out of all of them, he seemed most affected by the theft whether that was due to his fear of starvation or from that personal enmity that existed between him and graham chester didn't know he saw stuart as a man who'd been twisted so far he was going to break so better that happened outside where they could make use of it finnegan and greta brought their numbers to eight kevin and aisha made ten no that's too many chester said looking down at the raft bobbing gently on the river there's going to be space for eight on the way back, no more. Not if you want to bring back a few bikes. I'm so sorry, Hannah said, but I won't allow Aisha to come. Won't allow it, Aisha said, her face flushing with anger. No, I won't, Hannah stated. You might think me old-fashioned, but it's too much of a risk for someone who's pregnant. I'm sorry. There was a tense moment when Chester thought Aisha would explode, but it was diffused by the murmur from those in the group, mostly the men, Chester included, who'd not realised. Congratulations, Chester said. But there's space for one more, in the raft. Kevin? No, I'll go, Hannah said. I may not be much good in a fight, but if I can lift a sick pig, I can carry a full pack. We're not going that far from the river. How dangerous can it be? Chester looked over at Nilda to see if she'd insist Hannah stay behind. Nilda just gave a shrug. Then get in the boat, he said, not happy at all that the vet was coming with them. It took a long, fraught hour to get to Westminster. Chester would have preferred it if he'd been able to row, but no one would allow it. They said he'd need his strength for the journey ahead. He sat in the middle of the raft as the others slowly paddled their way up the newly swollen river.
The storms they'd witnessed must have been the tail end of a far larger deluge, and they had no trouble passing over the rubble around the collapsed bridges. The difficulty was caused by the soup of partially dissolved cardboard, shredded cloth, plastic, rubber, and items Chester couldn't guess at, mixing with the white foamed scum bubbling on the surface. You should keep an eye on this, Chester said, addressing everyone. It might be better to drink rainwater for the next few weeks. That'd save on, Nilda began, paused, stroked. Filtering. Stroke. It'd still have to be... Stroke. Boiled. But give it another couple of storms and the river should be cleaner than before, Chester added. The... Stroke. See... Stroke. Won't... Stroke. Be. Let me take over, Chester offered. No, stroke. Chester didn't stop asking if he could take a turn at the oars. No one would let him, and he felt like giving them a lecture in the futility of stubbornness, but decided against it. He'd only get one on hypocrisy in return. Nevertheless, by the time they reached the stone steps leading up to Cleopatra's Needle, a short distance from Embankment Tube and Whitehall beyond, they all looked exhausted. Everyone snatched a moment of wary-eyed rest as Jay set up the drone. With Chester directing, Jay flew it up and towards the old heart of the dead city. That's the hotel, McKinry said. It's five minutes' walk. No more. But too far for such a small prize, Chester said. Turn it left a bit, Jay. There, that's the edge of horse guards. Now, fly it along the boundary of the park for a couple of minutes. Then point it towards the eye and bring it back. Everyone else, let's go. No, hang on, Jay said. If you wait twenty minutes, I'll come with you. Sorry, lad. There's no more time to waste, Chester replied. Nilda mouthed a quiet thank you as the eight of them climbed out onto the bank. There was a solitary zombie on the embankment. Its right foot dragged behind, giving it a twisting limp as it staggered towards them. Its right arm rose in a half-hearted swipe, while its left hung loose at its side. As Nilda walked briskly towards it, the fingers on its right hand clawed out towards her. She drew her sword, batted the arm away, and stabbed out, spearing the blade through its gaping mouth. A twist of the blade and it collapsed. She began to kneel. "'There's no time for that,' Chester said, knowing she was going to look for the creature's name." He grabbed her elbow and hustled her towards the tube, and the tunnel behind with its cafes and the bicycle shop. Chester went inside, grabbed the first bike he saw, and took it out into the light. Someone, start pumping the tires, he said. Tuck was standing guard. Looking back towards the river, Hannah and McKinnery were watching the Westminster side of the tunnel. Nilda grabbed the pump as Chester went back to get another bike. Take it back to the boat he said, thrusting the bicycle into Stuart's arms. He gave Finnegan the second, Greta the third. On the fourth trip, he turned his attention to the repair kits, water bottles, and lights on a display behind the counter. He stuffed them into a pair of mouldering pillion bags and went back outside. Where's McKinnery? he asked. Nilda looked up. Finnegan looked around. Stuart just looked vacant. She went that way, Hannah said, pointing towards the hotel. Chester almost smiled with relief. Do we leave her? Nilda asked, looking first to Chester and then to Tuck. We can't, Hannah said. We have to wait. There's no time to wait, Chester said. The zombies will come back. There's the food in the coaches, and I'm wasting daylight standing here. You go, Chester. We'll be fine, Hannah said. She had the sword in her hands, gripping it firmly. Her eyes, however, were not on the road she should have been watching. It was clear of the undead, but Chester could hear rustling and snapping coming from not too far away. No, he said. I want my last sight of you lot to be on that raft, heading down river. I don't need any extra worries on this trip. We can't leave her, Stuart said. Can't leave anyone. Got to stick together, work together, keep everyone alive. He's right, Greta said. Fine, come on, Chester said, not bothering to keep the irritation from his voice and moved quickly towards the tunnels far side and the roads beyond. The streets of Westminster were in a far worse state than they'd appeared on the pictures taken by the drone, 
The wind had blown the contents of upper-story rooms out of broken windows to join the leaves and litter on the street. Rain had pooled in the rubble and around blocked storm drains, rehydrating dust and dirt and other dry detritus into noisome decay. At least the drone got rid of the undead, Chester murmured, as he clambered up a pile of masonry. They'd passed a couple of dead creatures, but none of the still animate kind since the one by the river. As he jumped down the other side of the heap of rubble, he realized he'd spoken too soon. Ahead, turning right down a side road, he saw McKinnery, her axe swinging as she smashed into the head of a zombie invisible from his vantage point. But there were plenty more behind her. These were the broken, crippled creatures missing legs or feet, crawling a slithering path through the muddy debris. They'd tried to follow the drone, and now they were following McKinnery. Chester started to run, smashing the mace's spiked head down on the skull of a zombie, missing both legs above the knee. He glanced over his shoulder. The others were close behind, but each was staying a cleaving weapon's length apart. Sometimes dodging a grasping hand as he ran through that carpet of the immobile undead, other times swinging the mace with a brutal finality, he reached the turning McKinnery had taken. She'd stopped, partially hidden in an alley on the left-hand side, fifty meters ahead. He couldn't believe she was waiting, but then she waved them over. He ran to her. Mac, what the hell are you? He began. The hotel is the next block over, she interrupted. One trip, yes? One trip to gather all we need, and we need weapons and ammunition. We can run in, grab the ammunition, get out through the lobby and grab a few more of those rifles. Five minutes, that's all it'll take. Five minutes? If that's all, then it's worth the risk, Hannah said, with uncharacteristic decisiveness. All Chester wanted was to know that Nilda was back on that boat, but if McKinnery went to the hotel, Hannah seemed likely to follow. Greta and Finnegan would follow her. He could hardly leave them all, and he wasn't sure Nilda would either. Mac, you keep an eye on Hannah. Stuart, you too, he said, and once again he led the way. A zombie stumbled out of a pub's broken doorway. Chester swung the mace. It fell. Another yard and Tuck overtook him, skipping a step and bringing the axe around and up, hitting a zombie in the chin with such force that it split the creature's head right open. The axe kept going, and the soldier spun with it, twisting her grip to bring the blade down on a zombie half-crawling along the rubble-strewn road. Chester saw the hotel and a closed door almost immediately in front of them. For a glorious few seconds, he thought they were free and clear. It was only when Tuck ran ahead, angling to the left, that he realized something was wrong. There was an alley almost too narrow to be called that, and down it in a jostling single file came the living dead. Tuck waved a hand towards the hotel as she raised her weapon and ran towards this new and imminent threat. Chester reached the closed door. There was no handle. He pushed. It didn't move. Nilda reached his side and tried to twist her sword into the thin gap by the lock. No, we need an axe. Greta, Eamon, Chester barked. Greta and Finnegan stepped forward. One blow, two, three. The door splintered. Chester pulled it open. Nilda ran in first, the others quickly following. Chester looked around. Tuck stood in the mouth of the alley, her feet braced, the axe cutting up and down in a smooth rhythm. Oi! Tuck! he yelled, but of course it had no effect. He darted across the road and grabbed her arm. Come on, soldier girl, move! They ran back to the hotel and inside. Nilda stood by the door, sword raised. Go! Chester barked, pushing the shattered door back into place. He looked around for something to barricade it with. He turned at a sound. It was Tuck and Nilda dragging a table out of the conference room. They propped it in front of the door. That'll buy us a couple of minutes, Chester said, and hoped he wasn't being optimistic. He followed Tuck and Nilda down the corridor. Tuck paused at the bodies of two dead soldiers, bent down, and picked up a rifle. Any good? Chester asked, hopefully. Tuck shook her head and dropped the gun. At the next turn, they saw McKinnery peering into a conference room. The barroom's that way, she said, waving her hand as she crossed the corridor to look in the room opposite. What are you after? Chester asked. What's here, Mac? What? Rifles, of course, 
she said, and Chester knew she was lying. There's no time. He grabbed her arm and half pushed, half dragged her along. They followed the signs along another curved corridor and reached the ballroom. Chester pushed the door closed and looked around. Stuart, Finnegan and Greta were grabbing ammunition from the boxes. McKinnery stood looking slowly around. Chester decided he didn't have time to worry about her. Tuck, he saw, was moving between the crates, not stopping until she'd reached the back of the room. He ignored her. Out of all of them, he suspected she was the only one who knew what she was doing. Forget the ammunition, he snapped. Without rifles, it's useless. Chester's right, Nilda said. That's more than enough bullets. Are there any guns in here at all? There weren't. The door they'd just come through shook, and from behind it Chester could hear that gruff, wheezing grunt of air being expelled from decaying lungs. Mac, we're going. You can come with us or stay here and keep looking for whatever it is. It's gone, she said. What? What's gone? What are you looking for? I don't know, she said. That was the point. I thought this was some kind of fallback point. I thought those soldiers in the lobby had died protecting something. I was wrong. And you were right. It's time to leave. Chester was going to ask her exactly what she meant, but before he could, the door shook again. There was no more time. He hustled them towards the third and last door in the ballroom, the one marked as an emergency exit. He was halfway there when Tuck grabbed his arm. She'd pulled a thick, stubby tube of metal from her bag. Is that a grenade launcher? Chester asked. She thrust a small drawstring bag into his hands. Ten, she mouthed, and then took one of the grenades and loaded it carefully, slowly. Thanks, Chester said, and he found he was grinning. Without the frame of the rifle, the recoil would be vicious, and a shot would make enough noise to make its use suicidal. But he felt better knowing that if it came to it, he could do more than just curse the darkness. The door shook again. A skeletal hand reached into the gap. Finnegan and Greta were through the emergency exit, Stuart, Hannah, and McKinnery behind. Chester took one last look over his shoulder and saw the doors break. It was like a wall of living death, a great necrotic wave washing over the doorway, crashing down on the floor as the creatures at the front of the pack were knocked over by those at the back. The room filled with the cracking of bone and a spray of brown-black ooze as more undead came through the door, trampling the prone creatures. Following Tuck and Nilda, Chester ran from the ballroom. The corridors were narrow and got narrower with each turn, but were empty of the dead and undead alike. They weren't heading towards the front entrance, he realized, but towards a fire escape. He couldn't tell on what side of the building they would come out, but it wasn't going to be near the lobby. That meant no rifles, but that, he decided, wasn't his problem. The corridor branched one last time, and there at the end was the exit. Greta and Finnegan stood by the closed door, shoulders tense, their breathing shallow in expectation of the hard fight waiting for them on the other side. The temptation to shout was strong. Not knowing what was on the other side, Chester kept silent. So did everyone else, as Greta pushed the emergency lock bar and the door swung outwards. It led to a narrow, single-lane road, filled with shadows from the buildings towering either side. Nilda slammed the door closed. Greta and Finnegan moved a couple of bins in front of it. It won't hold for long, Nilda said, but it will hold for long enough. Which way's the river? It took a moment for Chester to orientate himself. He pointed. Tuck nodded her agreement. Slowly, quietly, they moved down the road. The grenade launcher felt heavy in his hands, not due to its weight, but out of the sheer destructive force it represented. He was more than tempted to unload it, but knew that was folly. As they neared the junction at the end of the road, they saw the undead moving across it, and the zombies saw them. Chester's hand twitched with the temptation of firing a grenade, but before he could give in to it, Hannah ran at the creatures. McKinnery followed, and less than a heartbeat later, they were all charging towards the living dead. Their blades didn't glisten, and no one bellowed a war cry, but to Chester it was still a mad sight, out of time, yet somehow eternal. There were five zombies, 
and they were all dead before Chester reached them. Hannah's long bayonet was stained dark brown, her face a study in exaltation. Don't stop, Chester said, grabbing and pushing her around. Mac, Stuart, keep her moving. McKinnery put an arm on the young vet's pack, pushing her along. Chester looked back towards the hotel. Tug was bringing up the rear, a dozen paces behind, and the nearest of the undead was thirty behind her. It was limping, and even though it was so close, it clearly couldn't hear or see them. Chester grinned. For each bad piece of luck they had, there was always a gleaming piece of good. That had to be a sign that the undead were succumbing to decay. Slowly, sure, but perhaps if they could hold on until the new year, perhaps not even that long, the nightmare might be over. It made no difference to the task immediately ahead of them, but it was the first true glimmer of hope they'd had since the outbreak began. Hannah, Mac, he called softly, now only three feet behind them. The young vet half turned her head. She was still smiling. Look at the zombies, Chester continued. I don't think, and Hannah was still smiling when her head exploded. The sound of the shot registered a second later as Chester reached out to catch the young woman's body. He didn't hear the second shot. There was a feeling of a great weight hitting his head. Then brightness. Then nothing. Man down. Nilda saw Hannah fall. She saw Chester dive forward and saw him spin in the air as he was hit by that second shot. Time didn't slow, but everything around her sped up, and she couldn't reach him before he landed in an untidy heap on the ground. As she raised a hand to his bloody face, there was a third shot. Then Tuck was at her side, grabbing Chester, pulling him up. Nilda found herself on his other side, and they were running, and all she could feel was the warm blood dripping down his back onto her hand, pulsing slower and slower. Tug stopped them in the lobby of a ruined building fifty yards to the south. The soldier pulled out a bandage and wrapped it roughly round Chester's head. She grabbed a bag hanging over his shoulder and gripped Nilda's arm hard, squeezing until Nilda blinked, focusing properly on the soldier. Tuck pointed towards the river. Go! she rasped. Stuart lifted Chester up, and Nilda felt a hand under her own arm. She shook it off and grabbed Chester. They ran. She didn't remember the journey back to the raft, and it was only after Finnegan had cut the rope and they were frantically paddling down river that Nilda realized Tuck wasn't with them. Chapter 13 Epilogue The Country of the Blind 28th of September You're awake, a voice said. Chester knew that voice. It took a moment for his brain to sort through his recent memories until he found the name that matched it. Nilda. He tried to speak, but only managed a gruff croak. Here, water. There was something hard at his lips. A cup. He sipped. Water. It felt good. And then he realized he couldn't see. He raised his right arm and found a bandage on the side of his head. That was as much movement as he could manage. He let his hand fall to his chest. He could feel it rise up and down, heaving with the exertion. Just relax. You're alive. That's... that's all that matters right now. There was an edge to the voice. Fear? Tiredness? Chester wasn't sure, and he fell asleep again before he'd worked it out. You were shot, Nilda said the next time he woke. Shot? he managed. It was two days ago. Do you remember? she asked. A series of images came back to him, vague and indistinct. Hannah? he asked. She died there on the street. I'm sorry. There was a cough that might have been a wry laugh. I don't know why I'm apologizing. I can't seem to stop. You should have seen her room. There were ledgers and books everywhere. I don't think she ever slept. She was agonizing over everything. I think... She stopped. It doesn't matter. You'll see for yourself. Graham, Chester managed. What? Yes, 
Well, we think it was him who shot you both. I can't imagine it was anyone else. Tuck went after him, but she's not back. I... There was a catch in her voice, then a slow, shuddering sigh. I did what I could. I had to use the books. It wasn't easy, and in the end we didn't do much more than stop the bleeding. The bullets skim the side of your head. You've lost most of your ear. And, well, it might have done some damage to your hearing. Chester nodded, or tried to, but couldn't tell if he'd moved his head or not. It explained why Nilda's voice sounded odd. So what if he'd lost the hearing in an ear? That still left him with one, and Tuck got by well enough with none. Does it hurt much? Nilda asked. The only painkillers we had are the kind Hannah used to tranquilize the animals. I had to guess at the dose, but I figured you weighed about the same as a pig. We're almost out, I'm afraid, though I don't suppose it matters. I mean, if the animals get sick, all we can do now is eat them. There was another half-caught wry laugh. What? Chester began, then forgot what he was going to ask. We got the food from the coaches, Nilda went on. Jay organized that. He wanted to help me, you see. He said that he'd had to operate on Stuart back when they found him. I wouldn't let him. I thought you were going to... And again she stopped. So, when I'd finished doing what little I could, I went outside and found that he'd gone out to get the food. Not just him, nearly everyone. The way that Fogarty tells it, it's turning into a saga. You know, one more tale of life in the old Tower of London. She gave a short, brief laugh that almost turned into a sob. She took a deep breath. And now you're awake. It'll have a happy ending. Huh? He tried to speak. He found he couldn't. Rest, she said. You'll need your strength. I'll get you some food. We've got lots. And this time he heard the bitterness in her voice. His head felt light, disconnected. He tried to line up all those things he needed to ask her. But when she returned, the scent of freshly cooked vegetables suppressed all other thoughts. We've got more than enough food now, Nilda said as she spooned broth into his mouth. At least we've enough to last us until Finnegan gets back. Finnegan? Chester asked. Speaking was getting easier. Thinking wasn't. He's gone to Anglesey. He disappeared when everyone went to get that food from the coaches. He didn't even tell Greta that he was going. Just left her a note. She was furious. He might have reached Anglesey by now, or tomorrow, maybe. Chester tried to shake his head. This time he managed it. I know, it might take him longer, Nilda said. But I think he'll make it. He took all of those maps of yours. You know, the ones you'd left in your room with the routes marked out. Chester tried to shake his head again. It just made him dizzy. He passed out. Nilda, he asked when he woke. I'm here. Finnegan. The maps. Yes, he took them, she said. He's gone to Anglesey. No, the maps. They were the routes not to take. They were... His mouth was dry. Water, he choked. Here, sip, slowly. What do you mean? The horde. Those are the places the hordes had been through. Does that matter? The radiation, I worked it out. It wasn't the wind. The zombies... They go through the fallout zones, the... But the effort of speaking was too much. He took a breath. It hurt. He took another, this time shallower, and tried again. In the books, on radiation, the impact site. See, uh, see, he tried to remember how to say cesium. He gave up. Heavy isotopes. Last for decades. Zombies walk through it, spread it, destroy land, contaminate everything. There was a long silence. Are you sure? she asked. He had been. He knew that. But there was something about people and a tunnel which meant he might be wrong, though he couldn't remember why. No, he admitted. Which books? Chester wasn't sure. Textbooks? The physics ones? Hang on. He felt a weight lift from the bed. A few seconds later the door opened and then closed. It seemed like an age before it opened again. Okay, I've got them, Nilda said. Which one is it? Don't remember. This one? she asked. Take off the bandage. Can't see. What? And this time there was fear in her voice. Chester? 
Can you see me? Not with a bandage. It's only over your right eye, she said. He'd never known fear like it. His hands went up to his face. The right side was bandaged, the left wasn't. Blind, was all he was able to say. Fine, fine, Nilda said almost robotically. There was a the sound of books being dropped to the floor, of footsteps across the room, then of pages being turned. Another book being discarded, then more pages being turned. It's temporary. Here, it says it. Cortical blindness. It's quite common and will... Right, hang on. Don't move. Why, what are you doing? Chester asked. He could sense her moving closer, standing over him. Shining a light into your eye. It says if your pupil responds to light, then it's temporary. Yes, there. The pupil is constricting. That's proof. Your sight will come back. We just have to be patient. He would have found it easier to believe if there wasn't so much desperation in her voice. 29th of September There were no more tranquilizers. Without them, the pain was worse. But thinking was easier. What's the mood like? he asked when the door opened. It's okay. It was Jay, not Nilda. Everyone's still waiting for Tuck. I thought she'd be back last night. It's morning, Chester asked. By a few hours. I brought you breakfast. Oh, right. Thanks. Do you... Do you need a hand with it? Jay asked. It's on a tray? Then just put it in front of me. Where's the spoon? Right. He felt for the bowl. Listen, while you're here, you can do me a favour. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, is it... Jay stammered, clearly realising what kind of favour a bedridden man might ask. Nah, I just want you to read something for me. In those medical textbooks, does it say the blindness might be permanent? Uh, um, he stammered again. You already know, but your mum told you not to tell me, Chester guessed. Kinda, yeah. Which is as good as saying my eyesight may never come back. I just needed to know. False hope's never a good idea. I'm sorry, Chester, Jay said. Don't be. It's not your fault. It's mine. I should have killed Graham when I had the chance. It might not be him, Jay said. Fogarty says you'd have to be really good to get a headshot with a rifle like that. He'd have to be military. And who's to say he wasn't? Do you know what he did before? Well, no. Not really, Jay said. And who else could it have been? Chester asked. When we found Stuart, he'd been shot, Jay said. It could have been the same people. And Mum says that Stuart was standing right next to Hannah, so maybe they were shooting at him. Chester thought back. That last image of Hannah, half turned to face him, her head exploding with the impact, was seared into his memory. Stuart had been standing close by. So had McKinnery. Or Graham was shooting at Mac, he said. What's she been like over the last couple of days? Quiet, Jay said. Sort of embarrassed, maybe. Ashamed? She's been going out to find supplies. She has? Bandages and things. For you? Oh. Didn't she try to take over? No, Jay said. Mum's sort of organising things, and Styles has been... Well, everyone's helping. McKinnery's just been doing what she's been asked, I suppose. She's sort of on automatic. It's, well, it's weird. I was reading those books, he added. The ones about radiation? The radiation? Yeah. Did I tell your mum that I thought the zombies were spreading it? I think I did, but it's hard to know what's memory and what's a dream. Yeah, you did. And I was talking to her about those people on the island. You know, the abbot and the people from Scotland. I think Finnegan will be fine as long as he doesn't eat anything or drink the water. But even if he does and gets a lethal dose, it won't kill him immediately. He'll live long enough to get to Anglesey. Greta was upset when I told her that. You told her? I told everyone, Jay said. I don't think secrets are a good idea, not any more. I don't mean I told the children, he added. I waited until the end of the meeting. 
after Constance went off to try to get them all into bed. I suppose I should have asked Greta to help her. By the sound of it, you're the one trying to take over here, Chester said. I don't think we need leaders, not really. If everyone just does all they can, all the time, we'll get through it, you know? Yeah, kid, you might be right. A boat will come, and then you can get taken to that hospital. You'll get proper treatment. It'll be okay. Of course it will. He wasn't going to hang any hopes on that prospect. I better go, Jay said. We need to finish emptying the office block. Then there's firewood to chop. Will you be all right on your own? Of course. But there's not much point me laying here. Help me up, and I'll give you a hand. I don't need to see where a log is to split it. Are you sure? Mum says you should be resting. There'll be plenty of time for that when I'm dead. And I'm not that yet. 3rd of October You won't guess what I found, Jay said. No, you're probably right, I won't, Chester said. But do me a favour and hold up that piece of card. Why? Jay asked. So I can see if I can read it. Hold it up, go on. OK. Can you see what it says? No. Step closer. A bit closer? Closer, Chester sighed. All right, put it down. Oh, well, maybe it'll improve. Probably. I mean, you couldn't see at all a couple of days ago. True, Chester said, though he didn't believe it. Now, what was it you came to tell me? Oh, right. Well, you know how we're building those greenhouses? Jay began, and we... He stopped. Did you hear that? What? Hang on. Jay went to the door. It's Tuck, he said. She's back! The End The story continues in Book 7, Home. This has been Surviving the Evacuation, Book 6, Harvest. Written by Frank Tail. Narrated by Fiona Hardingham. Copyright 2016 by Frank Tail. Production Copyright 2016 by Frank Tail. All rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.